All right, good morning, everyone. It's eight o'clock in the morning. We have a lot of work to get done uh, today. This is uh, presumably our last uh, full day of this November council meeting. Um, although it remains to be seen uh, if things might get pushed to tomorrow. Before we get started with our agenda today, I'll turn to our executive directors to see if there are any announcements. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, do have a couple things to mention. Uh, just in terms of the agenda today, we are going to start with our administrative items uh, and then move on to ground fish. Uh, as you recall, we uh, delayed action on uh, E6, the non trawl uh, RCA range of alternatives, until today. So we will take that up um, after we get through our administrative items. Then we've got in-season adjustments and uh, uh, scheduled action on the uh, biennial management measures. Uh, so that's the agenda for today. Um, um, I did want to uh, to mention one uh, thing, just sort of as a matter of general interest here. Um, so uh, there's um, going to be some meetings uh, scheduled to. Uh, for the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Uh, and the meetings are to develop mitigation measures to address potential use conflicts between commercial wind energy and uh, commercial fishermen, uh, at least on the Atlantic coast. Um, so uh, those may be of interest to folks. Uh, there's also some, uh, looks like there's some workshops here, including uh, some on the West Coast um, those uh, uh, occur between December 1st and uh, December 15th. So um, I guess uh, look for that, um, look for an announcement on that. We will, we will, or I don't know if we might already have a um, informational report uh, on that. So um, just be aware that those are, uh, those are in the, uh, in the coming up in the near future if those interest you. Um, I think that's all I've got for this morning. Um, back to you, Mr. Chair. All right, thanks for that, Chuck. All right, we'll get started with our administrative matters this morning. Agenda item uh, C5, fiscal matters. Um, and I think what I'll do here is I'll turn to the chair of our budget committee, uh, Pete Hassemer. Pete. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, to stick with our protocol, I guess, to, um, we want to cover the situation summary, and a, a little, there's a little deviation from our typical reports. Rather than one budget re committee report, there are two. So, Mr. Chair, if you approve what I'd like to have, uh, the way I would like to proceed with this is have Patricia um, read the, the situation summary, our standard protocol of going through that. And then if there's no questions, have her move directly into the budget committee report and follow that up then immediately with the second report that uh, one of the executive directors would read into the record and then finally get to our uh, discussion of those reports and recommendations. So um, if that meets your approval, I suggest that order. All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Patricia Kraus. Good morning, Chair Gorelnik and council members. For the budget committee, we have the, the three attachments. We have the budget committee agenda, attachment one, the executive director's report to the budget committee, attachment two, and attachment three is what Pete was um, discussing, um, is a staff report on pr projects for the 2022 budget consideration. So with that, I can go ahead and read that into the record if you're willing. Uh, yes, why don't you go ahead and do that? Thank you. This is agenda item C5A, Supplemental Bu Budget Committee Report 1, November 2021. The Pacific Fishery Management Council Budget Committee met via webinar on Monday, November 15th, 2021, to receive an update on the 2020-2024 Cooperative Agreement, funding and expenditures through September 30th. 
the status of remaining funds from the 2015-2019 grant and to consider the 2022 provisional budget. Our members present was Chair Hassemer, Vice Chair Mr. Niles, Mr. Mark Gorelnik, Mr. Pettinger, Ms. Yuremko, and Dr. Hansen. Mr. Wolf was not in attendance. Non-members present, Mr. Tracy, Mr. Merrick Burden, Mr. Mike Berner, myself, Ms. Ames, Ms. Corey Writings, Ms. Michelle Robinson, and Mr. Chris Kleinschmidt for IT support. National Marine Fisheries Service, West Coast Region Sustainable Fisheries Division Budget Update. Ms. Kelly Ames provided the information on the federal budget timeline for fiscal year 2022 which is delayed with a continue, current continuing resolution that expires on December 3rd. The fiscal year 2022 president's budget was released in April and both the House and Senate markups were released this fall. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration released its fiscal year 2022 blue book, which describes additional justification and the priorities of the administration. Some of the other priorities identified include climate change, blue economy build back better, science, offshore wind energy, and social and environmental justice. Ms. Ames discussed the fiscal year 2022 presidents and House and House and Senate mark NOAA budgets, which all show an increase over fiscal year 21 enacted budgets. The House mark contains funding for community project grants, which are mostly not for profits and agencies in 2022. Projects currently identified include whale entanglement risk reduction research, habitat friendly shoreline structures, and Columbia River pinniped removal. The process of reconciling the House and Senate marks to support the final fiscal year 22 appropriations is ongoing. Ms. Ames also discussed NIMS headquarters Magnuson Stevens Act and CAT shares requests for proposals that are open through the end of November. There is a priority for projects that directly relate to Executive Order 13589 for underserved communities and environmental justice and fisheries. She asked the committee to direct comments to herself and Mr. Wolf and noted that NIMS staff will be looking at priorities identified by the council through the meeting this week. Ms. Ames further discussed the National Academy of Public Administration report and recommendations that were released in July 2021 with regards to the NOAA budgeting process. Executive Director's Report. Mr. Tracy presented the status of funds on the 2015-2019 grant and the 2020-24 grant. The amounts presented are unchanged from September's meeting and reminded the Budget Committee that the 2015-2019 extension funds would need to be spent by the end of 2021. The remaining funds from 2020-2021 can be utilized through the remainder of the five-year grant period. 2021 actual combined no cost extension and current grant expenditures through September and expected spending through the remainder of this year are estimated at 91% and remain on target for this time of the year. Expenditures for extension funds are tracking slightly higher at 94% and 2021 funds are at 90%. Because the extension spend plan slightly exceeds the remainder of the funds left in the 15 to 19 grant, those funds will be fully expended by year end. The calendar year 2022 staff proposed budget comes in at approximately 5.85 million and assumes funding for five in-person council meetings with in-person advisory body attendance. Staff benefit costs were reduced to fully funded leave account. The state liaison contracts were scaled back to the grant request amount because extension funds will not be available. And the independent contractors are reduced as extension projects have larger been completed. The budget allows for continued contractors for a data analyst, economic analyst, GIS mapping analyst, marine resource education program, legislative analyst, support for the regional fishery management organization representatives, website updates, and the continued or the council coordinating committee legislation, legislative liaison. Mr. Tracy discussed potential funding for 2022. New appropriations are likely to be slightly less than the 4.9 received in 2021 from Pacific Council. About half of the expected funding has already been received and the remainder is anticipated by March 2022. The delayed spending account for 2020 to 2021 is expected to be 3.7 million for use in the remainder of our five year grant. Public comment. Ms. Writings asked staff what the intention for the funds left over from 2020 2021 and what that meant for future projects or if investments could be made now for the council's future. 
Mr. Tracy noted that some of the future needs are being developed in consulta consultation with the new executive director. Budget committee discussion. The BC discussed the future use of the delayed spending account funds in conjunction with the council budget priorities for 2022 and the remainder of the 2020-2024 grant. Ms. Yarnko recommended the provisional budget restore the state liaison contract funding to the 2020-2024 level as a means of further offsetting state staffing expenses and associated with council activities and spending down the delayed spending account. Mr. Tracy noted that additional funding in 2020 and 2021, about 250,000, came from no-cost extension funding of the 2015-19 grant, which is no longer available, and the staff proposed budget was about 1 million over the anticipated 2020 award, which would significantly reduce the delayed spending account. He also noted that staff proposed state liaison contract funding level was set at the level recommended by the council and approved in the five-year grant budget and represented a 31% increase from the 2019 base level. The BC requested staff to pr provide the council with a list of potential uses of the delayed spending account funds that would address council priorities and help reduce the balance in an appropriate amount in 2022 with the objective of achieving a manageable balance by the end of the five-year grant in 2024. They also recommended the council consider provisional budget of six million fifty-six thousand twenty-eight dollars, which would restore the state liaison, liaison account funding to the 2021 levels, and would represent an increase of, of about two hundred eight thousand over the staff proposed provisional budget. The BC discussed future meetings and identified a tentative meeting in conjunction with the April Council meeting, pending an update under the March Executive Director's report on any changes of anticipated funding due to the no-cost extension request, fiscal year 2022 appropriations. And the NIMPS 2022 spend plan, such at the time, was appropriate to move forward with adopting the 2022 Council operational budget. Budget Committee recommendations. Council to consider a calendar year 2022 provisional budget of $6,056,028 for you starting in January. Consider the list of potential projects developed by staff for impl implementation in 2022. Recommend an April or June budget committee meeting to discuss fiscal year 2022 appropriations and a 2022 operational budget as appropriate. That completes the report. Thank you very much, Patricia, for uh, the budget committee report. Uh, let me see if there are any questions uh, from council members on the budget committee report. I'm not seeing any hands. Thank you very much, Patricia. So we'll go to the uh, supplemental attachment three council staff report. I think Merrick, you've got that. Yes, good morning, Mr. Chairman, council members. Um, I'll be reading from agenda item C5, the supplemental attachment three, just titled Council Staff Report on Potential Projects for 2022 Budget Consideration. On Monday, November 15, the Budget Committee, BC or Committee, met to discuss the status and outlook of the Council's budget. The COVID pandemic has restricted travel for much of 2020 and 2021, and as a result, the Council has accumulated savings. These savings could be used to help advance high priority and or strategic issues of interest to the council or could be used for infrastructure to support council operations. The budget committee requested that council staff develop a list of possible initiatives of interest to the council that could be advanced via one-time use of council funds. The list below includes several possible projects that were not included in the staff proposed provisional budget shown in C5 supplemental attachment two. These projects would be funded within the current grant period, which ends December 2024. Should the Council express interest in any of the projects below or others, staff would bring back information on costs and impacts on the Council's budget for consideration by one, the Budget Committee and the Council in March, and two, as part of the adoption of the Council's operating budget in April or June. Council Infrastructure. Infrastructure to support hybrid style council and advisory body meetings. This entails the purchase of electronic infrastructure that would allow advisory body meetings to occur in a hybrid format outside of the council office. Equipment includes microphones, central communication equipment, and speakers. Costs are approximately 10,000 to support one advisory body or up to 100,000 to support several concurrent meetings. 
alternative to FTP site. There is interest among several technical staff, council and management technical teams, in having a location to store and update data and other analytical materials. The council had previously utilized an FTP site for housing these types of materials. However, FTP technology is effectively out of date. Therefore, a replacement may be necessary, such as GitHub or similar. The cost of this type of software to the council is not immediately known. Strategic high priority initiatives. Contractor to support, contractor support for trawl individual quota program review. This would entail the use of available funding to have a third party contractor evaluate the trawl IQ program at the start of our five year review process, tentatively scheduled for March, 2022. This would serve as the analytical basis for considering modifications to the rationalization program. The cost of this approach could vary, but may range from 150 to 250,000 over a one and a half year period. Support for climate change strategy and fishery management planning. This contract would be used to help identify how climate change could be dealt with in the council through changes in the fishery ecosystem plan, fishery man management plans, and ongoing council processes. The cost of this concept is not known. Electronic monitoring and trawl program cost reduction. This concept would entail a contractual approach to help explore ways to cut cost of the trawl IQ program to help ensure the cost of e the EM program could be covered by cost recovery. Cost of this work is not immediately clear. Strategic planning. This concept is in response to some apparent interest regarding council workload prioritization and council strategy. A strategic planning effort could be focused on groundfish or it could take a broader view. The Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council recently developed a strategic plan for roughly 52,000. Salmon Essential Fish Habitat Review. This review is due in 2022. During the last salmon EFH review, a contractor was used to conduct a literature review for roughly 25,000. And that concludes that report, Mr. Chairman. I'd be happy to take any questions. All right, uh, thanks for that. Um, Merrick, are there any questions from around the table on the supplemental staff report? Marcy Remco. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Merrick, for the report. Um, I see uh, the council staff's list of strategic and high priority uh, initiatives. And um, at least with regard to ground fish items, um, it looks like you flagged contractor support for the trawl IQ program review um, and the EM and trawl program cost uh, reduction um, item, um, and then also uh, as well the potential for uh, groundfish strategic planning. Um, we've had a number of discussions over the past uh, few council meetings with regard to the workload involved in the groundfish specifications and management measures um, and um, have kind of generally discussed um, the, the need for additional staff capacity um, to assist us with the analytical lifts of um, getting over the hump on, on some of the elements. Um, We've talked about, um, or we've seen um, just kind of more recently, um, uh, some, you know, added staff assistance, a um, little bit of uh, involvement now with uh, Jesse Dorpinghouse, um, as well as continued staff support um, from the other folks that have been uh, staffing the ground fish specs and stock assessments. Um, but we've also heard from from NIMFS, um, how challenging um, it is becoming each biennium to get the work done um, in uh, a manner that meets um, their uh, review needs. Um, there's a lot more to it than just um, wrapping up the, the council's reports and, and transmitting them um, that comes on their end. Um, and we've we've heard quite a bit about that and and why and that that's you know one of the big reasons why we've been needing to keep our uh, biennial um, specs and management measures actions uh, streamlined and and without um, a lot of you know additional 
actions within the specs that um, we all view as as priorities and as directly related uh, to the the implementation of the specs um, each biennium. So I'm just wondering um, if the council staff gave um, the concept of additional contractual support uh, for groundfish specifications any thought. Um, I realize that um, your discussions probably um, were focused on some of the, you know, the, the mentions in the budget committee, um, but this is a topic that has been repeatedly, um, you know, discussed as a priority need, um, both from NIMS um, and from the council. So um, anyway, just wondering if, if that was um, included in your thinking at all. Yes, thank you, um, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Uremko. Um, we, uh, we, we have certainly uh, thought of, of that very pressing topic, especially as the specifications have been winding their way through this council meeting. Um, so what you have in front of you here from, from the staff um, reflects, I would describe as our taking a step back and thinking longer term. Um, I do think there is reason to um, focus on some of the the issues that are we're becoming acutely, acutely aware of uh, in this current specifications process, and um, our resources and um, tackling them. So that's a maybe a long way of saying that this is certainly not an exhaustive list. Um, this is a, our initial stab at uh, some of the ways that we can use um, this this nice position that we find ourselves in for um, some strategic positioning. If there is a, a, a way to, to use that and to help us over this hump of the specifications process, I think it's definitely within um, the appropriate realm of discussion, if you will. All right, Chuck, you have your hand up. Did you want to respond to Marcy? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Yeah, just, just to um, add a little bit to the discussion here, I, I guess I, I would point out that uh, uh, as you are all aware, we have hired Jesse Dorpinghaus as, a, as a, an additional staff officer. So we will have her services available for us. Um, the budget, uh, however, uh, and we did have a, a staff officer, uh, full-time staff officer budget budgeted uh, in the staff um, provisional budget proposal. Uh, but we also had uh, Jesse's existing contract uh, money included, so to the tune of about a hundred, a little over a hundred thousand dollars, I think, uh, to uh, work on um, the project she's been working on, which are uh, numerous. Um, so that 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 money is also in the budget, but at this point we do not have, you know, somebody identified to do that. But but the money is there. So so some of those uh, things that uh, that Marcy that you mentioned in terms of uh, looking at the uh, groundfish specifications, uh, as well as some of the other projects like non troll RCA and uh, gear switching and uh, um, whiting utilization uh, are, uh, there, there is some money in the budget uh, that we had planned to spend to, uh, to assist with those workload uh, challenges uh, from a contractual standpoint. All right, thank you, Chuck. Uh, Karin's got her hand up. Marcia, do you want to respond to Chuck on your question? Uh, yes, I would. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Merrick, and thank you, Chuck, uh, for the response. I, I just want to make sure I'm clear on what um, Chuck is saying. It, it, are you suggesting that there will be additional savings from the contract arrangement that previously uh, the council had with Jesse, so uh, roughly a um, hundred thousand in in savings that would return to the council because that that contractual relationship um, with her is now um, no longer uh, in place now that she's come on permanently. I, I think that's what I'm hearing, but I just want to make sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Yurimko. So. Uh, it would be savings if we didn't spend it, but uh, but again, we have 
we have that in the budget with a plan to spend uh, for that purpose. So it'll the challenge will be a matter of finding uh, the right person to to help out with that. But but uh, but that was uh, that was our intent. Got it. Thank you so much. Aaron, thank you for your patience. Yeah, and thanks for the the previous discussion. I think that was some of the some of the issues that I wanted to to hear more about, and uh, just want to um, lend uh, Oregon's support to spending that contractual uh, line item in the budget to get additional support um, for some of the pressing workload issues. Um, I. I do have a, a different um, higher level workload issue that I wanted to ask uh, about, um, and it is related to the infrastructure line items per particularly. Um, over many uh, council meetings, we have uh, spoken as a council around the table about um, our ability or inability sometimes to get work done and the the need for or a desire to have some strategic discussions off the council floor. You know, the council floor is not a great uh, venue for having kind of philosophical strategic discussions. That's more about getting business done. Um, and, and trying to have those strategic discussions to think about the way that the council does business, the way that we might be able to introduce improvements to that, to the benefit of um, stakeholders, to the council, to council staff, and to NIMPS. And so I'm seeing, you know, that strategic planning line item, um, and I don't know whether that's the right solution for the problem, but I wanted to, to talk about that or hear a little bit more about what that um, potential project uh, might include and how it might serve some of the council's struggles in um, you know, getting through the list of, of work that we really wanna tackle. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ms. Bravey. Um, th that is a, a, a excellent question. Um, Let's see, when I look at this this particular line item that you're pointing out, the strategic planning line item, um, as, as as Chuck and I were discussing that one, um, we wanted to, to think about whether there was a specific example that we could start from that a, a, a council has undergone. And so what we were able to flag was the, uh, the Mid-Atlantic Council's um, recent experience in putting together a strategic plan, which I think is a, a it looks to me like a very nice document. It looks like it was done in a very nice uh, process. I think that's probably a little bit different from what you are getting at. Um, and when I hear um, the concerns that, that you're raising, what I start to think about are not only a strategic plan, but also, I guess I would call it an operations plan. How do we go about our day-to-day -day operations in a way that um, helps create effective decision-making um, helps to enable good stakeholder in, input and things of that nature and, and helps improve our processes. I think that's a little bit bigger than what the Mid-Atlantic Council went through. That's my impression. So I, I do think it's, you know, it doesn't completely um, negate that, that Mid-Atlantic Council um, experience as a, as a good benchmark for us, but I do think it's a, it's a slightly different process and I think it would probably take a bit more than what they had done. Um, so that, that's where my head is at, but I would invite Mr. Tracy to um, add comments too, if he has any. Uh, thanks, Merrick, for that. Um, I, yeah, so I, I guess I would just add in, yeah, so the, the Mid-Atlantic uh, plan was is sort of a uh, process to establish an annual um, prioritization process and, and workload management. Uh, process so uh, th that's what that was um, the uh, the person that did the contract uh, I know I know her uh, fairly well through the CCC she's very competent I think she's working on a similar sort of plan for the Caribbean Council right now so 
Um, she's, she's got some experience, uh, a lot of experience with council processes. Um, so, um, again, uh, as Merrick mentioned, this is, we just kind of wanted to provide one example and, and of, uh, of what sort of things are out there and what the costs are. Um, but as, as, as far as tailoring it to what the Pacific Council needs, um, yeah, I think, I think we would want to, you know, uh, take a look at that. Uh, the council's obviously expressed some interest in uh, ground fish strategic planning. We've got that on our year at a glance. Uh, I've been talk had that on there for a couple of years now, I believe. Um, but I think the, you know, the need for some greater strategic planning, particularly uh, with what we're seeing in terms of, you know, uh, new issues coming up like, um, uh, like climate change, like marine planning, uh, some of the administrative administration's priorities um, as well. Uh, I, I think uh, um, this was probably broader. I, I guess I would also note that uh, the uh, uh, budget structure uh, plan that uh, recommendations that came out of the National Academy of Public Service uh, recommend, recommended that NIMFS, uh, one, of, one of the recommendation, recommendations there was that NIMFS require strategic, strategic plans from all councils. Uh, so I'm not sure, uh, you know, what the scope of that is. Obviously, the report was in regard to uh, budget structures um, for National Marine Fisheries Service. But, uh, but that's, again, sort of another potential administration priority that, uh, that may require some strategic planning on part of the council. Did that answer your question? Uh, thank you. Uh, that that did answer my question, and I I think my um, reflecting on on what Merrick and and Chuck shared is that um, I, as a council member, have interest in in the line item in um, in the report, but also in that higher order operations discussion. Um, and and think that we really need not just a prioritization, but we need a, a different pipeline. We need a we need a pipeline that works better, as well as prioritization of the items we put into the pipeline. At least that's my opinion, and it's an opinion I've heard expressed um, by other council members. Um, and then, if it pleases the chair, I have a an unrelated question. Please, this is the time for questions. We'll come to a discussion later. Yeah, so the other question I have is around the um, the hybrid meeting concept. And um, in that, I see the costs associated with physical infrastructure, microphones, and, and so on, um, and wonder whether there is a need for a replacement of that uh, of travel budget. Or, sorry, I'm wondering whether the travel savings would cover infrastructure costs, or whether that is needed in addition to travel savings associated with hybrid meetings. Thanks. Uh, I'll take that one, Mr. Chair. Um, so uh, the. Uh, you know, obviously, we've we've had quite a bit of savings over the last two years, and uh, and so that uh, that uh, delayed spending account money is available. Uh, we didn't put uh, we didn't put a hundred thousand dollars in the budget uh, in the staff proposed budget uh, that you see in front of you uh, to uh, to cover that. Uh, we did just coincidentally we talked about this. Uh, uh, Monday morning, right before the budget committee meeting with uh, with Chris Kleinschmidt and uh, Merrick and I and Mike, um, you know, to kind of explore some options. Obviously, we've we're uh, still uh, uncertain what the future is going to look like in terms of council meetings, um, but uh, you know, we we feel that there's a pretty strong likelihood that uh, that it's not going to go back to the way it was uh, pre-COVID in terms of uh, you know. 100% in person for both council and advisory bodies. So, um, so we're looking at ways to accommodate some, um, 
something besides what we've been doing, which is 100% virtual since COVID. And, uh, and the, the real challenge is uh, while, while we're able to do it uh, for the council meeting, we've been doing it all week here, um, doing it for, uh, for up to 10 advisory bodies that meet simultaneously or in the close uh, order is uh, the equipment necessary is, um, you know, it, it's pretty substantial to, to make that work well, where you have a number of people in the room and a number of people not in the room. So, um, so uh, again, we we did, we've, we did include some increases in uh, in uh, infrastructure uh, equipment, technology equipment for the, the budget. We didn't um, we didn't put a hundred thousand dollars in there to cover um, what's in this uh, attachment three here. Um, so, uh, you know, the, I think. Over the course of the uh, um, over the course of the grant, I think that can be accommodated in there. And again, you know, we don't we don't know any what's coming in 2022. We budgeted for five in-person meetings. The staff budget includes five in-person meetings and all advisory body meetings in person. So that's a that's a uh, that's a high and uh, and uh, I. I doubt seriously that we're going to meet that. I mean, frankly, we um, often don't, uh, we usually don't hit our travel budget um, back in the old days just because meetings are short. Some people don't come. Um, it seems like there's always uh, a little bit of sh shortfall in expending those uh, those travel estimates. So, um, but to the extent that there's savings this year from uh, further virtual or hybrid meetings, um, that money would be available to um, fund purchases such as this. All right, further questions? Uh, Phil Anderson. I'm trying to decide. I, I think mine is more of a comment. So it's probably best that I wait till council discussion. So sorry. Okay, great. All right, Corey, you have a question? Uh, yeah, I think so, uh, Mr. Chair. I think uh, it would help with some thoughts for council discussion. Um, so first, uh, thank you. I, as a member of the budget committee, I think Chuck offered and we took took him up on it to do some additional thinking and writing and I appreciate, appreciate that. Um, this is helpful. But on that, um, I guess it's the second paragraph, no, third paragraph of the uh, attachment three, uh, so I'm just want to make clear on on what count what staff is is saying recommending the budget committee has made a recommendation on a way to to um, spend some of the savings. Um, but yeah, if if Chuck or Merrick on on are you asking what are you asking the council today in 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 the context of that budget committee recommendation? Um, and if you could put it in the context of this being the provisional budget and and the process of what the council's recommendation has, what effect it has on that. Uh, I just want to be clear on, on what you all are saying here. You, you're asking the council to, to, to decide some things in March um, or what, what decide things today. And if, if that's better for council discussion, happy to wait. But yeah, I'm just trying to seek some clarity on what, what, what staff is saying here. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Niles. Um, so um, I'm glad you, that you pointed out that that third paragraph, um, Corey, because I, I do think that's where we start to get to the root of a process that we would go through for making what I view as essentially two different decisions, um, but that are both related to the budget, of course. The first one is the provisional budget um, that the budget committee discussed um, a week ago. And then the second question is, should we go above that um, and spend some additional funding in a strategic or um, pressing way that helps us get a bit ahead of the curve, perhaps. And so we can think of those in two different parts um, moving forward here today with a provisional budget and then coming back in the spring to talk about whether we want to add anything on top of that. That's a process that we've discussed, and that's what um, that paragraph three is essentially suggesting.
All right, any uh, further questions? Okay, thank you very much uh, for that supplemental report. And uh, that completes all the reports. Uh, I don't see any public comment. So um, we'll now uh, have council action, which is consider the reports and recommendations of the budget committee. There were some specific ones laid out in the budget committee report. And we also have some further things to discuss that were in the supplemental staff report. So, Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just had a few, I guess, comments about the um, um, funds to build infrastructure to support hybrid style council and advisory body meetings and during the the discussion here um, there were perspectives put forward about what the future holds for us um, and i don't know about all of you but my, my crystal ball on what the future holds relative to our ability to have in-person meetings is pretty fuzzy. Um, I, I um, you know, we there there have we have we have learned some things as we've gone through the last well, coming up on two years of having meetings utilizing virtual platforms, <clears throat> and I suspect that we all could probably identify some places where utilizing virtual platforms in the future uh, can, can be a good idea. Um, I think we have, um, one of the things that stands out to me is that um, the public's ability to participate and offer comments uh, has been improved, uh, I, would, I guess I would argue. Uh, with having the ability to uh, engage and provide comments to the council without needing to be in person or present at the meeting. Uh, but I, you know, my, my perspective is that it, it, um, while there are some aspects of, um, and, and, and potential benefits in the future that we could, um, make to the, Council system. Um, I, I, my my general perspective is that getting back to in-person meetings, both for the council and our APs, committees, so forth, is highly desirable uh, and and highly beneficial uh, to our process. Um, and, and I'm hopeful um, that we will get back to that point some, at some point in time. Um, and I, you know, I think um, the longer the pandemic goes on, um, you know, the more that we're seeing changes in, in behavior. Um, so I, I, the, the purpose of this comment is to say that I would I would first like to have the discussion about what what do we think as a council is ideal uh, uh, in the future for for our meetings as it re, as it relates to being held virtually or in person um, and if there are aspects of that 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 uh, of holding meetings in a virtual in a virtual way that we see benefits to our, to improving the council process that we think about incorporating those into the future. But at this point, to make a judgment that um, the future of this council does not include um, meeting face to face in, in, in the broader context, uh, meaning council. Our advisory panels and committees 
if if there's if there's a conclusion or a feeling that we're not going back there, then um, making some some investments in this category of infrastructure to support hybrid style council meetings and advisory body meetings becomes really important. If, however, we're thinking about that the future um, includes perhaps including some of the elements that we have seen as being beneficial to improving our process, but not to the point where at least I'm not, I'm not in the place where I think it would be a good thing, for example, to have our advisory bodies meeting virtually and, and the council meeting in person. That is not an ideal. That's not the future I'm hopeful for for the council. So all of this is to say that before lending support to a substantial investment in looking at infrastructure support for hybrid style council meetings, I would want to have a discussion about where is it that we want to go and to the extent that we can judge whether or not our desire is, is uh, likely to occur um, is a conversation that needs to be had before deciding how much to invest uh, in, in infrastructure to support virtual platforms. Thank you, Phil. Um, and I'll, I'm going to just take the liberty of adding that uh, I agree with Phil that I think the what the future holds is rather speculative. Um, and we'll know much more uh, in the coming year. Um, but we're not, uh, as I understand the staff report, we're not expected to make a decision on any spending until March or April. So. We, we might just wait to see what March and April uh, bring in terms of advisory body participation. Uh, and we'll be in, in a much better place there then rather to, uh, to make such a decision. But I agree that it's a bit speculative right now. Further discussion, we, we have uh, to provide some guidance here. Marcy Uremko. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just wanted to get back to some of the content in the budget committee report uh, that discusses a recommendation uh, that I brought to the committee about the uh, restoration of funding to the state liaison contracts. Um, you might recall that um, in calendar year um, 2020 and 2021, um, the council um, graciously <laughs> um, augmented the state liaison contracts um, to um, add um, roughly 250A per year um, to um, fund uh, our ongoing uh, support um, uh, by the states uh, to the council process uh, with the understanding that these were one-time um, allocations or, or augmentations um, partially in acknowledgement of the fact that there was some surplus um, and acknowledging that um, the states have significant um, funding needs um, for council activities. Um, the reason that I brought this proposal forward to the budget committee here uh, in the November discussion. Um, first, it became um, apparent that, uh, in fact, we would still have um, additional surplus in um, in the current year or in the current five-year grant um, based on savings um, that were estimated um, in. 2020 and 2021, um, which uh, the budget committee references there on the a report references um, at the about the middle of page two, um, the delayed spending account of 2020 2021 funding is expected to be 3.7 million 
for use in the remainder of our five-year grant. So that is what prompted me to um, consider, um, again, another one-year augmentation in 2022 uh, to the states of about 250,000 of those funds. Um, further, the, the need um, is still there. And in fact, I'd argue in uh, 2022 is likely to increase. Um, there's a new state staffing obligation that the council has, um, has supported um, with the establishment of the Marine Planning Committee uh, that began operating this year. Um, we've all appointed uh, state staff to participate in, in those activities. Um, 2022, uh, we expect that workload to continue. I um, think we've discussed thoroughly the, the pressing um, groundfish issues on the plate for 2022 and the need for um, ongoing uh, staff support from the states to um, to uphold the workload in the GMT room um, and to uh, assist us in analyzing um, all of um, our management measures and specifications um, to the aid council staff with getting um, as complete of work done uh, as, as possible. Um, the, the analytical lifts continue to um, increase and um, we're now, at least in California, um, drawing on staff beyond just our GMT staff to assist. There's just no other way to get it all done. Um, then I know uh, the discussion we had in the budget committee, which isn't reflected here, um, but we did talk a little bit about um, the work in 2021 kind of wrapping up um, and that that work would be funded um, largely by the last um, no cost extension. So, um, you know, as we burn down those funds, um, what we'd be talking about for, you know, augmentation uh, in 2022 would in fact come out of the current five-year grant and that five, uh, that 3.7 million um, I'm going to call it surplus um, that might be available. Um, it's true that the the work on the Sant Coho work group um, has uh, concluded, um, but I wouldn't say that the state obligations um, as a result of that uh, council action will be diminished. Um, the work group work may uh, likely be replaced with um, new activities that will be needed in support of the expected um, new constraint coming in the ITS that uh, will require annual coordination between um, the co-managing agencies on the sharing of sunk impacts uh, with a new total exploitation rate that um, will affect a number of our state and tribal agencies. So um, I don't see the costs diminishing. I see them um, continuing to increase. And while um, I fully uh, appreciate that um, the states um, should not expect um, continued augmentation to the liaison contracts um, from council funds, um, what I do see uh, looking at the budget landscape for the council in the sense of this current five-year grant is um, this would be a proposal to spend um, about 250,000 of that surplus now. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an ongoing arrangement. Um, the, yes, the, um, you know, and, and included already in the provisional budget, budget, it would just be an augmentation. Um, I really appreciate the discussion that we've had here today on um, priorities and um, needs and thoughts about how to spend some of the extra surplus. And it looks like we'll 
uh, continue to give thought to those ideas um, as we proceed in our discussions. Um, but at least for purposes of the state liaison contracts, it's kind of an established line item already. Um, and in my view, um, this one year uh, additional augmentation would be uh, tremendously helpful. Um, I do also want to speak to uh, the list of needs. Um, I brought up in my uh, exchange earlier with uh, Merrick and, and Chuck about the um, need for um, additional assistance on the specifications and um, just want to echo support uh, for Chuck's thinking that um, the contract money that's available um, that, that we certainly um, move uh, expeditiously to do our best to um, find a contractor with the uh, sufficient skill set to aid council staff in um, completing the necessary uh, analysis and documents. Um, I, I know how big a lift that is. Um, and even with um, the contributions across a number of permanent council staff from Brett to Todd to John DeVore to Jesse, um, they, <laughs> the needs keep growing and um, the needs on the NIMF side keep growing too. And, you know, um, our specifications are um, the absolute um, core of, of what we do uh, in the council process in support of the Magnuson Act. So, um, you know, I, 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 I just want to lend support for the need to fill that contractor role that, that Jesse's been filling um, with additional capacity. And that concludes my remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marcy. Um, Corin Braby followed by, well, Chuck, did you want to respond to Marcy or can I let Karin go first? Uh, you, you can uh, go ahead and let uh, Karin go first. I'll All right, All right Karin, thank you. Yeah, I'm in the interest of time, I'm going to keep uh, my remarks short, uh, but I, I very much appreciate uh, Marcy's comments um, and support a continued consideration both for um, use of that contractor fund uh, line item in the provisional budget for the spec cycle um, support, um, but also thinking about um, additional use of, of the surplus for uh, additional ways that can support kind of the additional workload that that is um, continuing to put pressure on the states, on council staff, and on NIMS. Um, I agree that the restoration of funding to the states for a single year uh, would be gratefully received, understanding that that is not um, an ongoing promise or expectation, but I, I think that we as states have expertise and responsibility um, in, to offer to these workload issues, and um, I would I would love to to see the states compensated at a time when we are digging deep uh, into our staff ranks to really um, bring uh, capacity to the table uh, across the board. And then I I also just want to I already tipped my hat, so to speak, tipped my hand um, on strategic planning, but I really would like uh, additional thinking um, on how we can spend some of the surplus on strategic planning, both for operations as well as uh, workload prioritization. And I'll stop there, thanks. Thank you, Karin. Chuck? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, in regards to the uh, state liaison contract funding, uh, I, I must say that I'm, I'm adamantly opposed to increasing that contract funding beyond what was presented in the staff proposed budget. Um, 
it represents about a $208,000 increase. It's not 250 because there's some of that money is already included in the state travel funds for a couple of the states, but it's a, it's 208,000 above what the staff proposed level is. Um, and um, just uh, as, as background, uh, the liaison contract funding level <clears throat> proposed by staff is consistent with the five-year grant proposal endorsed by this council and approved by NIMS. Uh, the current grant recognizes the relatively flat funding of state liaison contracts between 2012 and 2019, and it's sought to address it by providing for a 5% increase annually in each year's budget within the grant period. So for 2022, that represents a 31% increase in state liaison contracting over the 2019 level. The amounts provided in 2020 and 2021 above the five-year grant level came from the no-cost extension funding from the previous five-year grant. These were also approved in grant requests. Those funds have now been exhausted and most of the projects they were intended to fund excuse me, intended to fund have been completed. This was brought to the budget committee's attention and explained in September and again at this meeting last week. While a council budget does have a substantial surplus at this time, mostly due to virtual meetings associated with the pandemic, the staff budget is de designed to reduce that surplus to a manageable amount by the end of the grant period. The staff proposed budget is approximately one million more than the expected grant funding in 2022. And 2022 grant funding is expected to be similarly similar or perhaps slightly less than the 2021 level. However, my greatest concern is not the amount of the funding being considered, but the rationale given to increase the state liaison contracts. The rationale was essentially that the council budget surplus was large enough to cover the increase and that it was getting more expensive to participate in the council process for the states. This rationale does not provide uh, any benefit to the council in terms of addressing its priorities or achieving its objectives. I believe the budget committee members and the council have a fiduciary responsibility to use council funds for the benefit of the council and the diverting funds above those authorized offset state agency expenses is inappropriate. Surplus funding offers the council an opportunity to address key council initiatives, which we, some of which we have identified here or potentially. And the staff proposed budget includes sufficient flexibility to accommodate at least some of those already. It's worth noting that this is only the provisional budget and that the final operational budget will be adopted later in 2022. However, the provisional budget is important in that staff will begin executing the provisional budget on January 1, and therefore will be making commitments based on those provisions and expectations. That concludes my remarks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, Karen Braby. Thanks, and Chuck, thanks for your comments on that. I, um, I, I want to take exception to uh, your characterization of the rationale. The rationale for um, thinking about supplementation of state staffing is not just that there's extra funding, so let's spend it on the states. If that was a misinterpretation of your comment, please correct me. But the rationale is that the states bring to the table and bring to the council process far in excess of the funds that we receive. And those demands have increased so that we are bringing even more capacity than we have. And the funds that are available now that would help us bring that additional capacity capacity to the council is not for state function. It is for the council function and to achieve outcomes in council priorities. So it is in order to further the council objectives, MSA implementation, 
and supportive council staff and NIMP staff in pursuit of our shared objectives. Thank you, Karen. Further discussion? Krista Svensson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, um, I just want to lend a little bit of support um, to, and I am going to pivot away from the topic we've just had, um, to strategic planning. I think that that would really help us moving forward um, in identifying areas to work on, but also to help us, you know, if, if something comes along that isn't within, have an easier time of saying we can't take that up at this time. Um, I also agree with Phil and I believe yourself um, about needing to have the bigger conversation around infrastructure supporting hybrid style council meetings. Um, but I, I do really appreciate the ability for the public to call in and provide testimony um, and, and, and definitely in favor of moving that forward. So if that needs to be broken out separately as we move down this path, if, if we decide not to have a hybrid style meeting, then I would be in favor of that. Um, and I was hopeful to have a little bit of conversation, um, at least I'm supportive of an alternative to the FTP site. Um, I think data and other analytical materials, um, access to that, particularly in um, ways that people are currently using the information in terms of getting access uh, is very helpful um, for anybody that's using that, whether that's council members, members of the public, et cetera. So um, I, I would be supportive of um, that upgrade if there is the resources available for it. All right, thank you, Krista. Well, let's let's try to refocus on mm -hmm. budget committee uh, recommendations here. Um, there were three of them uh, to consider the provisional budget, to consider the list of potential projects, which of course we have a supplemental report on, and to recommend an April or June budget uh, committee meeting. Um, so we have uh, we've been provided with the provisional budget. There has been uh, some suggestions. Um, from uh, at least uh, California and Oregon about how some additional funding could be provided. Um, Pete Hossamer. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I don't know if a motion is required here, but because uh, a very weighty topic, uh, I suspect it would be in order, so not to shorten any discussion here, but uh, I'd be willing to take a shot at a motion when you are ready. Well, Pete, I think that would be appropriate. Nothing focuses discussion than addressing words uh, that have been fixed on the screen. So please go ahead when you're ready. All right, thanks. Um, I'll try to speak slowly here because I wasn't able to provide anything. So I move the council and I'll wait till the typing gets caught up here. I move that the council adopt the budget committee recommendations as outlined in agenda item C5A, supplemental budget committee report, November, 2021. And after that, add a and And excuse me as I look back at my other documents here and further develop and refine a list of initiatives that could be advanced via one time use. of council funds and bring back information on costs and impacts on the council's budget for consideration 
by the budget committee and the council at its March 2022 meeting. All right, to, uh, take a look at that language and uh, see if you want any tweaks or whether it's accurate and complete. Just pause for a moment to take a look. I am reading it over. Yes, that looks accurate. All right, uh, thank you very much, uh, Pete, for the motion. We'll uh, look for a second. Seconded by Krista Svensson. Uh, please speak to your motion, Pete. Thank you. Well, certainly there's been a lot of discussion on this topic and um, we recognize there's a lot of work to do and there's, there's some money available to do various parts of that. What I hope to capture in this motion where we're number one, the two parts identified that by executive Director uh, Burton, um, we cover the provisional budget and it further some discussion about these, excuse me, high priority projects that we have with regards to the provisional budget. I fully respect the uh, comments provided by Executive Director Tracy. Um, this was the recommendation of the budget committee and there was testimony to the importance of it um, to the, the state staffs in advancing some of the work of the council. So um, I, I'm supporting that amount in there um, as, as again, I think was identified a one time increase also in that provisional budget, uh, it does retain money for a contractor to address um, and some of the things that were discussed were the specs process, the gear switching um, initiative we're undergoing and the mothership utilization item also. So that money remains in there, recognizing that additional staff was hired, but there's still money in the budget to provide support to those items. Um, looking at my list here, on the second part of that, uh, then the um, we had a lot of discussion, and the we can't we haven't settled on any priorities at this point my expectation would be that the staff would work with the list of projects and recognizing the discussion that was had here on some of the various topics, the infrastructure, there are some timing considerations and importance of investing in that, um, the, maybe the breadth of the strategic planning discussions um, including both operations, council operations and workload prioritization. And so to think more about that list and incorporate some of the, what I would call guidance now that was heard during our discussions on this topic. And also note that we're not finished with uh, this meeting and there might be other priorities that are identified by the end of the meeting. Some of those could be identified during workload planning, I suspect, but that this list is not all inclusive that we saw this time. And in and this motion would require then the budget committee meeting in March to get a look at that list and have a discussion about that. Um, before it comes back to the council for its consideration and discussion and, and potential prioritization at the March meeting, recognizing then that um, those items could be further developed for inclusion in an operational budget that would be discussed either in April and June. So thank you, Mr. Chair. That concludes my comments on that. All right, thank you very much, Pete. Are there uh, 
questions for Pete or discussions on the motion? Karen Braby. A clarifying question for Pete. I assume that, uh, thank you very much for the motion. I assume that the um, line item for contractor could be uh, uh, in your motion could be spent uh, initially on supporting the specs process, which requires analysis immediately and decision making um, March or April. Uh, is, is that true? Is that consistent with the intent of your uh, motion? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thanks, Karen, for that question. Um, by approving it in the provisional budget, I think as uh, Executive Director Tracy mentioned, the the staff would start implementing the provisional budget in January. So maybe the best case scenario is January 1, someone could be on board um, to start that work. Chuck Tracy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, just another question of clarification. So, well, maybe two. So uh, the line item you're referring to is uh, the data analyst contractor that uh, Jesse is currently uh, filling, but uh, we would need to find somebody to replace. So that, that's my first question. Um, yes, that was the contractor position I was referring to was the uh, data analyst um, that was vacated when Jesse was hired on full time. Thank you. And, the, and then the second question then, so the, so the proposal is for a budget of uh, $6.056 million uh, to include the uh, increased state liaison contracting? Yes, that's correct. Uh, increased state liaison funding is identified in the report, which was $208,000. Um, well, I will, I will again voice my opposition to that, um, to that increase. Uh, you know, when this came up last year, we, we, had, we had planned for this in 2020. When this came up last year, it was, it was just a one-time extra thing. Well, now it's another one-time extra thing. And frankly, I don't think it's appropriate for the states to be proposing um, augmenting their own budget uh, with council funds. Um, so I'll leave it at that. And oh, well, and I will say that again, we have planned a, an increase in the state liaison contract to the tune of a 31% increase over 2019 this year. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. All right, thank you, Chuck. Brad Pettinger. Yeah, thank you, Chair Grelnick. Um, think of more long-term here. Um, the council uh, had a proposed budget. They sit the National Fishery Service. Um, they review it, they approve it. Um, and um, with the, uh, we acknowledge that we had a five hundred thousand dollars to use it or lose it. So it was appropriate to for the states to get them more money the last couple of years. I'm really curious to see or hear from um, Ryan what uh, maybe the agency's take on this is. And I'm just thinking for for down the road when the council would um, ask for funds. Um, and then not follow the budget they've been presented to them, um, what their take on that is, because I would hate to endanger um, the prospects down the road, um, especially when the council may ask for additional funds for special projects beyond what we have some, uh, have asked for, um, endangering that avenue. So I'd like to hear from Ryan if it's possible at some point in time in this process. Thank you. All right, well, um, Ryan's hand is up. So Ryan, do you want to respond to Brad? Um, Brad, I'm not sure 100% to understand your question. I'll say, you know, from NIMP's perspective, it's not our necessarily role to um, be 
could be focused on telling the council how it should manage its funds. We can help guide the discussion as needed here. And if you're looking for our perspective, at least on the issue that was just being discussed uh, regarding the potential um, increase for state funding, I mean, I think it's really up to the council to decide whether it feels that's the best use of the funds um, to meet the overall council mission. Um, we heard a number of perspectives of other uh, potential uses for funds, and that's, I think, uh, related to other council priorities, which is part of some of the information you're asking them to bring back here. Um, so I would, think I would put that more uh, at the discretion of this discussion. Um, as far as if you were talking about some technical aspects of being able to move funds between tasks at some point once a grant is done, yeah, that's technically possible, but um, we'd have to see what ends up change in between the provisional budget here and the final operating budget. I'm good. Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I have a question for Mr. Tracy relative to the, um, well, I can't remember what we're calling it, the analytical position, contractor position, data analyst that um, Ms. Dorfinghouse has been fulfilling. Uh, did you have a, with, with, the, with bringing, uh, with the creation of the new staff officer position that um, Ms. Dorfinghouse successfully competed for, I'm wondering whether you had a plan or a dis or thought that there was a need to refill this contractor position. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair, Mr. Anderson. Uh, well, this is all uh, developed rather quickly in terms of uh, you know our uh, filling the filling the position with Jesse. Um, we're thrilled to have her, uh, but. Uh, um, we haven't, I guess, uh, finalized any plans uh, on how, how to uh, um, utilize the funds that we had uh, programmed for her uh, data analyst position. We've had some internal discussions. I think there's obviously some interest in, uh, in uh, being able to, uh, you know, increase our staff capacity uh, through a contract, uh, whether that's you know, uh, specifically the tasks that Jesse had been working on, or you know, whether it's groundfish or uh, or some other um, some other capacity. Uh, I think that's still um, subject of internal discussion and obviously discussion with the council here. And, and it depends a little bit on um, what what our workload looks like and and what the prospects are to um, to find people to. Uh, I, to augment those needs that the, that the council identifies. Um, if there was another Jesse, uh, there's probably a pretty strong likelihood that we would uh, we would want to uh, uh, use those funds toward towards that. But um, but again, depending on what the uh, what the council priorities are um, and uh, what the availability of people to um, contribute to those are will dictate exactly how those funds are spent. But so the, I, I guess the bottom line is there's some flexibility there. Could I follow up, Mr. Chairman? Of course. So I'm just uh, trying to understand, Chuck. Um, my, my understanding is that the, what's put on the table here in this motion that it 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 can it contains a budget uh, allowance or provision for the executive director to make a decision to to hire a contractor to do things perhaps similar to what Jesse has done in the past or uh, but it but uh, I guess my it, so number one, I think I think I have that correct in looking at the the language here in the report. 
but from a from a um and both for you and, and Mr. Burden and being this motion were to pass, do you feel that it's your 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 obligation to fill that position, that contractor position? Or do you believe that you have that you retain um the flexibility to make such a decision based on your assessment of what the needs are from a council staffing perspective. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Anderson. Um, I, I think it's more the latter. Uh, I think I think we uh, we don't feel obligated to um, add uh, you know that contract position as a data analyst to focus on groundfish. We've hired Jesse. She's going to be on staff. She's going to be doing a lot of that stuff as a staff member as opposed to a contractor. Therefore, I would uh, want to reserve the flexibility to um, fill that position uh, based, on, uh, based on the needs that we view to achieve the council's objectives. Uh, whatever those may be. Thanks, Chuck. And Mr. Chairman, I have one more for yeah. Mr. Tracy. Of course. So, Chuck, um, you, I mean, I, I've obviously had the opportunity to, to uh, spend a lot of time with you, um, uh, particularly during the time period when when I was either vice chair or chair. And um, uh, I, I can say without hesitation that uh, you have held in high regard the contribution that the states make to the council process. And uh, I have witnessed you uh, really time and time again when developing budgets to look for ways to augment uh, the council, the state plays on contracts, um, and uh, and with, without, you know, without, you know, being pressured to do so or asked to do so, uh, because I think you you uh, you you've demonstrated, as I said over and over, that your your um, recognition and the value that the states play and the state staff play in, in our council process. So I'm, I am, um, I, I, and, and I think you frankly demonstrated that again in the, in the budget that the staff brought forward for, for the budget committee and council's, uh, consideration. Um, I, I, um, I am somewhat taken by su surprise. Um, uh, I didn't, I, uh, this will lesson learned, I should be attending budget committee meetings so that I'm not surprised when I see things. Um, but um, is, there an, a, is there a need to make this decision relative to the provisional budget and the 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 state contracts um, uh, as we is there a need to do that today uh, does it preclude us from considering that as we consider the other items that have been put forward during this week during the council or during the budget committee's deliberations is there, uh, do we lose the ability to consider this proposal that was made, brought to us by the budget committee to increase those state liaison contracts in a manner that's, that is uh, represented in this motion? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Anderson, um, so this is a provisional budget. It's not the operational budget, so it's not final yet. So I think there's uh, there still is um, you know, an opportunity to um, change what the council uh, would direct its funds toward. Um, 
we're not sure when we'll get to that operational budget um, decision, probably April or June, which is typical. Um, if, uh, if, it, if the council wanted to retain some flexibility to change those contract amounts, uh, we would, uh, well, we, we could either delay uh, letting the contracts or amend the contracts um, based on the council's decision uh, at another time. I would say that <clears throat> it, it's, uh, you know, it, we, we kind of need to know where the money's going, I guess, in order to bring a proposed operational budget to the council at some point. So, uh, you know, putting in a budget amount um, is one thing. Um, but uh, I think having some guidance at some point along the road, and perhaps that's March, when um, if there's an opportunity to come back and consider some of these uh, projects that, uh, that have been identified and some other council priorities that uh, no doubt will um, be identified here uh, over the course of this meeting. Um, you know, maybe, maybe that's the time to provide that guidance uh, in terms of where where that, uh, you know, if you're considering adopting the budget committee uh, dollar amount of 6.056 million, um, how that, you know, where that, uh, where that increase would, uh, would appear in the operational budget. Um, so yeah, there, there's some flexibility, but again, uh, you know, if, if, you know, that's a couple hundred thousand dollars more than, uh, than what's in the staff proposed budget, which is got all the line items filled out. So, um, well, while we could, you know, operate on that or provisionally operate on that $6 million figure, um, there would still be some unknowns in terms of, uh, where we should uh, apply that come time to adopt a, an operational budget. Thank you, Chuck. All right, any uh, further discussion on the motion put forward by Pete, Has Pete Hasimer? And I'm not seeing any hands, so I will call the question. All those in favor of this motion say aye. 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 Opposed, no. 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 Uh, who are the no's, please? Uh, Phil Anderson. And Brad, I think? Yep. Okay. Uh, any uh, abstentions? Ryan Wolf abstains. Ryan abstains. All right. Uh, the motion does pass with those... Uh, uh, no votes and the abstention recorded. Um, further motions on this uh, agenda item or further discussion on this agenda item. Okay, I will turn back to uh, Patricia Krause and see if we are done with this item. Chair and council members, it looks like you have completed your action for this agenda item and we will be starting the year with a provisional budget and coming back for the March meeting. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Patricia, for all your work on this. All right. Uh, we've been at this for over an hour and a half, so we are going to take a break now until 945 and we will come back and deal with uh, the balance of our administrative items and then uh and then move into ground fish so we'll see you back at 9 45. good
Okay, welcome back. It's 9.45. Uh, we've had our morning break and we will get started on the next item, which is legislative matters. And I'll first go to Chuck Tracy for an overview and then we'll get the legislative committee report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so the legislative committee met on November 15th uh, to review bills proposed in the 117th Congress. Um, and to consider proposed uh, consensus statements developed for the Council Coordination Committee's working paper on uh, regional council's positions on Magnuson-Stevens Act reauthorization issues. Uh, those consensus statements are in agenda item C1, <clears throat> attachment five, supplemental attachment five, for your reference. Um, Representative Jared Huffman introduced the bill to reauthorize the Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act, um, it's uh, HR 4690. Representative Young also introduced the reauthorization bill, uh, HR 59. Uh, representatives uh, Huffman, Case, and Young attended the CCC meeting in October and answered questions about their bills. A summary of the questions and answers is available in the meeting report, which is the agenda item, the CCC meeting report, which is the Agenda item C1, attachment three. Um, the Pacific Council responded to a re request for comments on HR 4690 from representatives Huffman and Case. Uh, we sent that um, after the, in, in September. That's uh, attachment two for this agenda item. And uh, this, again, the CCC has uh, also drafted a response to uh, Huff, representatives Huffman and Case, uh, which has been finalized and is available uh, in the CCC agenda item uh, C1 attach, supplemental attachment four. So uh, the action under this is to uh, consider the legislative committee reports and recommendations. Um, we, well, we have, uh, I guess I'll wait and uh, see if there's any questions on that overview, uh, if not, um, we can proceed to the legislative committee report. All right, thank you. Let's see if there are any hands. And I'm not seeing any, so we'll have the legislative committee report. Uh, Dave Hansen. If it pleases the council, uh, I'd be happy to read that report into the- All right, why don't you uh, go ahead and read that report into the record? Okay, thanks. Uh, so the legislative committee met on Monday, November 15th. Uh, they first heard a staff review of federal legislation, which is uh, agenda item um, C, I think that's C6 attachment one. The legislative committee then received an overview of the proposed council coordination committee consensus statements on Magnuson Act reauthorization uh, associated primarily with HR 4690. Those consensus statements are again uh, in agenda item C1 attachment five. The legislative committee did not have any objections to the consensus statements and recommends the council approve the statements for incorporation into the CCC's working paper on regional fishery management council positions on Magnuson Stevens Act reauthorization issues. Um, the uh, legislative committee recommends that uh, the executive director determine if the legislative committee should meet in, in March or April based on legislative act activity uh, early in the new year. Uh, so that concludes the legislative committee report. All right, thank you very much, Chuck. Uh, Dave Hansen. Yes, sorry, Mr. Chairman, I had trouble unmuting myself. Uh, really nothing to add other than we will have time uh, before the March meeting to make a decision. And if there's requests uh, of the council, we can go ahead and schedule the meeting. Otherwise, uh, we will not meet. All right, thank you very much, Dave. So are there questions on uh, the legislative, legislative committee report? And if there are no questions, um, then we will go to public comment. I don't, we have no other reports, and I don't believe we have any public comment, at least not the last time I looked. 
That's correct. All right, so we have no public comment. So we will go to council discussion and action. And uh, we have a recommendation with regard to the consensus statement and a recommendation with regard to how we should handle any future legislative committee uh, meeting. So I'll look for some hands. Dave, your hand is up. I don't know if you have a comment now or it's just from before, a vestigial hand. All right, well, you've muted yourself. Okay, uh, Bob Dooley, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I'd, I'd just make a comment on the legislative committee and, and legislative actions that we've it followed. It's been a, a long trail, and the CCC has done considerable work, and the council has done considerable work to make comments on 4690 and previous versions of that as well to develop a, con, a consensus statement. And there were more actions at the latest uh, the CCC meeting and before that through the committee that, had, that have been developed. And I think they're uh, overall done a really good job. There's been a lot of, a lot of effort put into that. I would uh, um, definitely support the actions of the committee and, and the recommendations and, and also of the CCC. So I, if whenever is appropriate, if it's needed, I would, I have a motion. All right, thank you, Bob. Let me just see if there are any other hands pop up. And if no other hands pop up, I'll go right back to you for the motion. And I'm not seeing any other hands, Bob, so why don't you proceed with your motion? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Sandra, I believe you have the, the motion, if you could put it up. Here we go. Thank you. I move the council approve the CCC consensus statements on Magnus and Act reauthorization as in agenda item C1, supplemental attachment five. All right, thank you. And that language on the screen is accurate and complete? Yes, it is. And I'll look for a second, seconded by Butch Smith. So uh, please speak your motion as necessary. Oh, I think I've probably said enough prior to this. Um, I'm very supportive of this, and I believe there's a lot of good work been done by the committee and, and by the staff, so I appreciate it. All right, are there any uh, questions of the maker of the motion or any discussion on the motion? Uh, not seeing any, I will call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. No. Any opposition? Abstentions? Ryan Wolf abstains. Oh, Ryan Wolf abstains. Um, and so the motion passes uh, unanimously, however, with one abstention by Ryan Wolf. Um, thank you for the motion, Bob. I think that the remaining uh, matter here has to do with uh, the potential scheduling of a future legislative committee meeting and the recommendation of the legislative committee was to essentially play it by ear to see if we get any requests for comment or if there's any legislative activity. And um, it, it, I wanna see if that's okay with folks around the table. If that's not okay, please raise your hand. So I think we have a plan there. Uh, let me see if there's any other uh, action here, uh, comments on the report or any further motions. Okay, uh, Chuck, uh, do we have more business here or are we done? I no, think Mr. Chair, I believe that concludes this agenda item. All right. Thank you very much, Chuck. So we'll now go on to the longest agenda item of the day, the approval of the council meeting record. Uh, those are attachments uh, one and two under, under this agenda item, the September and October meeting records. And um, 
I'll look to see first if there are any uh, corrections or additions. Indicate so by raising your hand. And if not, I'll look for a motion. Not all at once. Phil Anderson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I would, um, I'm waiting for my motion to come up on the screen from my niece. Thank you, Sandra. I move the council approve the September 2021 and October 2021 council meeting records as shown in agenda item C7, attachment one, draft council meeting record 260. First session of the Pacific Picture Management Council, September 8 through 11 and 13 through 15, 2021, and agenda item C7, attachment two, draft council meeting record 262nd session of the Pacific Picture Management Council, October 12, 2021. All right, uh, Phil, is the language on the screen accurate and complete? Absolutely. All right, and look for a second. Seconded by Pete Hassemer. Please speak to your motion as necessary. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I would read into the record the entirety of both, but I'm going to not do that. Uh, very well done by staff of keeping our records uh, in good stead. And uh, that's all I have. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Phil, for the motion. Uh, let's see if there uh, are any questions or comments or discussion. And barring that, uh, I will call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Phil, for the motion. And I, I believe that concludes this agenda item C7. And we'll take us uh, to C8. And for that, I will hand the gavel to our Vice Chair, Brad Pettinger. All right. Thank you, Chair Grolnick. And um, I will turn to, um, to Brett to uh, kick us off. Brett? Good morning, Council Members. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. All right. Thank you. So we're under Agenda Item C8, Standardized Bycatch Reporting Methodology, Final Action. Uh, the situation summary, I'll just give that a quick overview there. Uh, we've been working on this uh, consistency review for quite some time, back since November 2020. Um, we've looked at this with the management teams and advisory bodies in general, uh, and have developed some, some recommendations for moving forward. Uh, I do note that in attachment one, it contains some FMP amendment language that we'd like you to take one last look at and possibly adopt uh, for final action uh, to amend the CPS, HMS, and, and um, SAM and FMPs. And I do note that uh, we decided uh, a while back that we didn't need to amend the groundfish FMP and that consistency review seems to be uh, clear and follows the final rule. So there is no amendment language being proposed in attachment one. Um, so at this meeting, you're scheduled to, you know, finalize that, adopt and the FMP language to bring those uh, FMPs into compliance with the SBRM final rule that NIMS put out. And um, I just want to say I appreciate all the work that's gone into the review here. The, the management teams really did step up and line out their, their concerns, the things that they think need to change. Uh, they've also provided some rationale in past meetings, uh, and I note basically in September uh, and and here as well in November, they have their rationale out there in their management team reports, and so that supports the language that's in attachment one. Uh, we would like then to um, finalize this here, this consistency review, and as I note in the situation summary, um, after this meeting, council staff will transmit one consistency review package to National Marine Fisheries Service with one transmittal letter and all the uh, supporting documentation from the management teams, uh, any amendment language that's finalized here, 
and put that together and transmit that to National Marine Fisheries Service for their uh, final review. And uh, hopefully they will put this to bed, put this to bed and, and we'll have those FMPs amended uh, by the February 2022 deadline. So again, the council action here is identify compliant fishery management plans and adopt final preferred alternatives for the FMP amendments as necessary. Yeah. So what you so I think that completes my overview. If there's questions on the process here, I'm happy to take them. Otherwise, we could turn to the management team reports that are uh, suggesting finalization of uh, of their FMP amendment language. All right, thank you, uh, Brett. Questions for Brett on his overview? Okay, seeing no hands, uh, we'll go to the STT and uh, Michael Farrell. Mike. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I'll be referring to agenda item CAA supplemental STT report on standard, standardized bycatch reporting methodology final action. Um, I guess before I start reading, I had planned to uh, just to give a brief synopsis of parts of this um, and not read it in its entirety, entirety. And I wonder if that is appropriate uh, today. I look for guidance on that. Um, I think that would be uh, wonderful. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Okay, um, the SAMA technical team was first briefed at their November 2020 online meeting by Council Staff Officer Brett Leadoff on the National Marine Fisheries Service rule requiring all fishery management plans to establish standardized bycatch reporting methodology to assess the amount of anti of bycatch occurring in its fisheries. Since that meeting, the STT was briefed at the June 2021 meeting met to discuss this topic in August of 2021 and briefed again at the September council meeting where the STT provided a report and a recommendation to amend the SAM and FMP. After additional discussion, the STT is providing this report for council consideration, which is a revision of the uh, 2021, September 2021 STT report and includes some more detail and clarification. Um, SBRM is used to estimate bycatch as is defined in the Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act. Bycatch includes fish which are harvested in the fishery, but which are not sold or kept for personal use, and includes economic discards and regulatory discards. Our review of the salmon FMP focused on characterizing bycatch occurring in the salmon fisheries, uh, the feasibility of implementing the SRBM, uncertainty in the data, and how the data will be used to assess the type and amount of bycatch occurring in the fishery. Through this review, the STT recommends adding new descriptions to procedures used to collect, record, report, and assess salmon bycatch in preseason report three and amending the FMP to meet the purpose of SBRM. In the report, uh, we describe monitoring programs that generate bycatch estimates for commercial and recreational ocean salmon fisheries uh, and describe SBRM requirements, how they are met, and propose new draft language for the salmon FMP that would provide further details on SBRM for salmon fisheries. Um, in the next two sections, uh, the first section we provide descriptions of salmon bycatch estimation from ocean salmon fisheries. Um, and we do this for um, the tree troll fishery uh, and uh, Washington, Oregon, California fisheries. And so these are, um, I think uh, virtually unchanged from what you saw in September, and they're just descriptions of how a uh, bycatch of, of salmon is estimated. And then, so I'll scroll down here. And, and then following that, uh, those descriptions, we have descriptions of ground fish bycatch estimation um, in ocean salmon fisheries. Again, that's um, provided for the Treaty Troll Fishery and uh, uh, Washington, Oregon, and California fisheries. Moving down to the bottom of page five of the uh, statement, and I'll read this STT assessment of current and commercial troll salmon fishery ground fish bycatch. After a review of the commercial troll, tribal and non-tribal, and recreational ocean salmon fisheries, it was discovered that the bycatch of ground fish in the salmon-directed commercial fisheries was not being reported in either salmon or ground fish documents. Ground fish bycatch in the salmon troll fishery appears to have been the last assessed when developing the 2006 environmental assessment, which reads, bycatch of fish other than salmon and salmon fisheries is generally very limited. 
Only hook and line gear is allowed in ocean salmon fisheries and regulations allow for retention of most ground fish species and limited numbers of Pacific halibut that are caught incidentally while salmon fishing. Several factors contributed to this finding. As the 2006 EA indicated, the level, levels of salmon catch fluctuate from year to year and the amount of ground fish take as, an incident, as incidental catch remains very low every year. So changes in the salmon fishery do not substantially alter the projections for harvest-related mortality in the ground fish fishery. And these are projections that are made as part of the development of the ground fish annual specs. In 2006, eight species of ground fish were considered overfished. However, half of these species were unlikely to be caught because they occur in habitats outside where salmon trolling occurs. The 2006 EA listed the optimal yields for the reported overfished species, which were in encountered as bycatch in the salmon fishery. At the time, the available data indicated that estimated ground fish bycatch represents at the highest 3.4% of a given ground fish species OI, but generally represents on average 0.3% of a given ground, fishes, ground fish species OY. Based on these estimates, the 2006 EA indicated that it did not appear likely that a substantial increase in ground fish catch would be expected with any increases in salmon harvest. Because this remained consistent in the analysis, assuming incidental catch, ground fish encountered, including those retained or discarded in the salmon fishery is low, regardless of salmon abundance, is still reasonable. However, bycatch is also a function of salmon fishing effort, so the FTT evaluated observed changes in fishery participation to determine if salmon fishing activity had increased since 2006, which would alter the continued assumption that ground fish encounters and discards are still low. The FTT examined the number of active permits and, and the number of vessels landing salmon in California, Oregon, and Washington, which showed fishery participation has decreased or stayed stable since at least 2003 a reference uh, figure um, in this report. The commercial salmon troll fishery has not had notable changes in gear type, structural changes in fishery regulations, or major expansion of open fishing areas. While some ground fish stocks have now rebuilt to higher biomass levels than in, 20, uh, in 2006, it is possible that ground fish encounters in the salmon fishery could have increased. However, the rate of ground fish encounters as a proportion of stock abundance is likely to have increased given the stability or decrease in commercial salmon fishery participation. Furthermore, all non-salmon species except halibut, highly migratory species, must be released when fishing in the federal rockfish conservation area unless a vessel is equipped with VMS. Vessels with VMS may retain a limited quantity of some ground fish. However, the proportion of salmon vessels equipped with VMS is thought to be relatively small. Thus, after its examination of the information available, the STT has concluded that the 2006 EA, uh, that the 2006 EA statement that regulations allow for retention of most ground fish species is no longer accurate since retention of most ground fish stocks is prohibited in the federal RCA for much of the salmon fleet. You know, to the 2006 EA, statement that bycatch of fish other than salmon and salmon fisheries is generally very limited, likely holds true today. As far as uh, meeting uh, SBRM requirements, we are planning to add an appendix to preseason report three. Uh, salmon bycatch uh, projections for the upcoming salmon season and postseason salmon bycatch estimates from the previous seasons are presented in table six of preseason report three. Footnotes to uh, Table 6 describe aspects of the bycatch enumeration methodology, but do not fully describe the methods used. To, be more, to more comprehensively describe the methods used to make preseason and postseason estimates of bycatch, the SCT will develop an appendix to future versions of Pre-3. The appendix will describe the data and methods used to generate by, bycatch projections and estimates, and how the methods differ for commercial and recreational fisheries and along the coast. Uh, the SDT recommends an FMP amendment. Uh, the current FMP contains a section of bycatch on bycatch, section 3.5, that includes the definition of bycatch and management intent, the occurrence of bycatch, and a description of standard reporting methodology. These sections reflect the intent of SBRM and meet the general requirement of addressing bycatch in SBRM, but could be updated and augmented to better document how SBRM requirements are met identify where descriptions of bycatch estima estimation methodologies can be found, and document sources of bycatch estimates, and, and describe the uncertainty inherent in bycatch estimates. 
As such, the STT recommends that a new uh, that new language be inserted in table ins inserted into section 3.5 of the FMP. And you can see agenda item C8 attachment one for that. Changes to the current FMP language are also intended to provide consistency across FMPs in addressing uh, SBRM. And that concludes the uh, STT statement. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Mike. Uh, questions for Mike on the STT report? Okay, seeing none. Thanks, Mike. Next up is um, Lorna Wargo in the CPS management team. Lorna. Thank you. Good morning, um, Vice Chair Pettinger. I will be reading from the Coastal Pelagic Species Management Team Report on Standardized Bycatch Reporting Methodology. At this meeting, the Coastal Pelagic Species Management Team was tasked with reviewing the draft language to amend the CPS Fishery Management Plan under Agenda Item C8, Attachment 1, to make the FMP consistent with NOAA Fisheries Final Rule on Standard that is by catch reporting methodology or SVRM. The CPSMT has reviewed the draft language and finds it accurately reflects the text presented in September 2021 for incorporation into the FMP. Under agenda item E5A supplemental CPSMT report one, September 2021. Previous CPSMT analysis found that the FMP conformed with the final rule. However, in September, the CPSMT proposed adding language to the FMP and to the stock assessment and fishery evaluation document to improve clarity and provide more detailed information. The draft language contained in agenda item C8, attachment one accomplishes those objectives and changes and the changes now provide clear guidance on static SBRM requirements in the FMP. In addition, the CPSMT is incorporating more detailed information related to SBRM into the 2021 SAFE document and will maintain and update this information in future SAFE reports. The CPSMT notes a minor typographical error carried forward with the text from September. On page one of agenda item C8, attachment one, the word described should be changed to describes in the last sentence of paragraph one under the CPS draft language heading. In conclusion, the CPSMT supports the draft language as proposed with the minor correction and recommends the council approve it for inclusion in the CPS FMP, as well as using the analysis in the September 2021 CPSMT report as justification. And thank you, Vice Chair. That concludes the management team statement. Hey, thank you, Lorna. Um, questions for the uh, CPS management team? Okay, thanks, Lorna. Next up thank is uh, next up is Jessica Watson in the um, HMS management team report. Jessica. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair and Council Members. My name is Jessica Watson, and I will be reading the Highly Migratory Species Management Team Report on Standardized Bycatch Reporting Methodology. Uh, so Jessica, could, could you speak a little louder and get closer to your mic? How is that, Mr. Vice Chair? Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Um, so the Highly Migratory Species Management Team discussed the proposed language for an HMS Fishery Management Plan Amendment intended to meet the requirements of a standardized bycatch reporting methodology and associated descriptions in the HMS FMP. The team reviewed what was submitted in C8 Attachment 1 and does not have any additional suggestions at this time. Thank you. That concludes our report, and I'll take any questions. Okay, thanks, Jessica. Um, questions for uh, the management team? Okay. Thanks, Jessica. Seeing the, no hands. Um, next up will be public comment. And I believe we have a couple of speakers. And that would be um, okay. Elliot uh, Headley, followed by Andrew LePage. Elliot. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the council. My name is Elliot Headley, and I represent myself in my support for the adoption of the draft amendments to the Coastal Pelagic Species Fishery Management Plan, 
in compliance with the Magnuson Stevenson Act. I'm a graduate student at Scripps Institution of Oceanography in La Jolla, California, and my interest in the management practices of the Pacific Fisheries Management Council has grown along with understanding of the Magnuson Stevens Act. After reviewing the draft language in the present amendments to the fishery management plan, I believe the current language well involves the importance of adopting standardized bycatch reporting methodologies in the fishery management plan, as well as fulfilling the requirements to adopt the reporting methodologies in compliance with the Magnuson Stevenson's Act. Given that past observations have shown that fisheries managed under the council have varying degrees of bycatch and reporting methods, adopting the standardized bycatch reporting methodologies is important to the council's ability to best manage West Coast fisheries. In conclusion, I support the current draft language to the amendments to the Coastal Pelagic Species Fisheries Management Plan and recommend that this motion be passed. Thank you for the opportunity to comment today. And that concludes my comment. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Elliot. Uh, questions for Elliot on his uh, public comment? Okay. Uh, next up would be Andrew LePage. Andrew? Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the council. My name is Andrew LePage, and I'm speaking on behalf of myself in regards to the standardized bycatch reporting methodology relating to coastal per seine fishery. First of all, I would like to express support for the Council in standardizing bycatch reporting methodology. My concern here, though, lies with the uncertainty of reported bycatch when using this purse same gear. With the lack of an observer program, the Council will rely on fishery logbooks to report bycatch, and this may not provide the best information possible. One reason for not needing observers, it is mentioned that this fishery is classified as a Category 3 fishery under the MMPA, and thus a low risk to marine mammals. This, however, doesn't include other groups and leaves them at risk of being underreported. Sharks and sea turtles, for example, aren't mentioned here as a concern, even though NOAA Fisheries information on per seine fishery bycatch risk to these animals is listed on its website. As a graduate student uh, at Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego, I'm concerned with efforts to reduce harmful bycatch. So it is my belief that more measures might be taken to improve bycatch reporting methodology when possible. The use of observers periodically may be considered as well. National Standard 2 of the Magnuson-Stevens Act requires that conservation and management measures shall be based on the best scientific information available. Accurately recording bycatch is a way to help achieve that standard. So other than expressing this concern, I agree with the Council's plans to adopt the amendments to the Fishery Management Plan. Thank you very much for the opportunity to comment on this matter today. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, questions for Andrew on this testimony? Okay, seeing none, thanks, Andrew. And uh, with that, that takes us to council discussion and action. John Lewis. John. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, I'll just uh, start by saying I really appreciate the effort that both um, the advisory bodies and council staff have put into this matter. Uh, they've really taken to heart what the requirements were, provided us with very good information, and made excellent recommendations on how to meet the requirement. Um, really supportive of what's going on here. With regard to the comment on um, bycatch uh, in per seine fisheries, um, well, I agree that uh, observer programs are necessary to categorize bycatch. Um, I believe there is historic observer data from various per seine fisheries in California, and that uh, we really haven't seen bycatch of sharks and sea turtles in those fisheries. Um, I don't really feel a change is necessary there. Thank you, John. Further discussion? Motion, John? Thanks, I do have a motion um, if we're ready for that. Well, I 
from I, you're the only hand up, so I'd say yes. All right, thank you. I believe staff has it. I move that the council adopt the FMP amendment language in C8 attachment one for the salmon, highly migratory species and coastal pelagic species FMPs to bring the FMPs into compliance with the National Marine Fisheries Service SBRM final rule, including the one minor edit recommended by the CPS MT in their report. The council also affirms that the ground fish FMP is compliant with the final rule and no amendment is necessary. Rationale for these decisions can be found in the respective management team's statements from June 2021, C2A Supplemental GMT Report 1, September 21, E5A Supplemental HMS MT Report 1, and E5A Supplemental CPS MT Report 1, and November 21, C8A Supplemental STT Report 1. Okay. Thanks, John. Is the language on the screen accurate? It is. Okay, looking for a second. Second by Corey Writings. Thank you, uh, Corey. Okay, John, uh, do you speak to your motion? Thanks. I think uh, my prior statements suffice. Uh, I support moving forward with the language that's been proposed. Okay. Um, Discussion on the motion? Okay, seeing no hands, I'll call for the question. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Uh, motion passes unanimously. Thank you, John. Um, Frank Lockhart, Frank? Just very quickly, a uh, uh, couple of things. First of all, I just want to echo the, the the praise for all the the folks that worked on this. I think that the teams took this uh, task very seriously, uh, worked through the issues, and provided good comments. And we have um, uh, some good language to consider. Um, and so just wanted to, to thank everybody for that. Um, also, just want to express my thanks to Brett, uh, who did a great job kind of uh, um working with obviously multiple teams to, to get this done so uh thank you brett and then finally i just wanted to say that there's, there's a couple things that happen now one is that now that the council has taken final action nymphs will have to review uh this uh, the uh submissions that were mentioned in the motion and uh, make a determination of uh you know whether the support is adequate enough for us to determine that the um FMPs as amended would will be in compliance. And then uh, obviously, actually, we have to go through the FMP amendment process, which Brett mentioned. So uh, those will happen concurrently. And uh, we are optimistic that we will be able to meet the uh, deadline of February 22nd. And, I'll be, and, and we'll give you an update at the March Council meeting. Um, uh, of what the outcome was. And that was it. And uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Okay. Thank you, Frank. Okay. Um, with that, I will uh, turn to Brett to see uh, how we're doing here in this agenda item. Thank you, Vice Chair. Yes, I think we've completed our council action here. We've identified uh, the compliant fishery management plans. That was the ground fish one. And then we've adopted some uh, FMP amendments for the others. So I think this completes this action uh, in its entirety. I appreciate the accolades and uh, the smooth transition here and uh, and Mr. Ugarts for presenting the motion. So I think that closes this agenda item out. Very good. Thank you, Brett. Um, and we're going to E6 next, but first I'm going to turn to uh, Executive Director uh, Merrick Burton for an announcement. Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Um, just a quick announcement for everyone. Um, later this afternoon, we will be coming back to E5 as it is on your agenda. There is a, a new report available on that agenda item, and as such, we've reopened public comment. So um, just a heads up for folks that may have more to say on this agenda item that public comment on E5 has been reopened. Okay, thank you, Merrick. And uh, with that, um, I'll turn to Todd to, uh, for e 6 
Todd? Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. So as uh, the council is well aware, um, this is a continuation of this of E6 from Friday, November 19th. I believe we are, uh, well, as Mr. Merrick Burden said, uh, public comment has reopened. There is a document um, in the briefing book. Um, it speaks to what the Mr. Renko was uh, asking for regarding uh, some research off the tops for um, Quillback and Copper, I believe. Um, also, just for council knowledge, there is a revised, uh, I believe, report on this one. Um, there were just some numbers that were changed uh, regarding the Flat Yale Rock. Oh, excuse me. That is not this agenda item. That is 100 specs. My, my apologies. My brain was confused there. So, um, yes, we are in discussions for E6 non-trawl sector area management measures. I apologize for any confusion. Too many groundfish items going around in my head. Uh, okay, Dot, thank you. It's Well, there's a lot of balls up in the air, that's for sure. And so, um, okay, so we're in the middle of council discussion and uh, we broke to uh, have some cleaned up motions potentially to be made today. And so I would open the floor. Uh, Maggie Summer, Maggie. Thank you, Vice Chair. I wanted to uh, appreciate the opportunity to hold over for motions today um, and also appreciate the uh, consultation yesterday uh, with representatives from the National Marine Fisheries Service and the other states, uh, as well as this morning on some refinements and um, appreciate quite a bit the, the good work done by staff to prepare us for this and provide the uh, substantial information available in the briefing book to review in terms of preliminary, and preliminary analysis and setting up uh, this, this selection of a range of alternatives as well as by our advisory bodies. And uh, I am prepared to offer uh, a motion with some modifications to the purpose and need statement following up on some suggestions uh, and then as well a motion on alternatives for consideration for the area between 4010 and the Oregon Washington border when you are ready for motions. Okay well uh, thank you Maggie. Um, stay close because I don't see any hands yet um, just in case. So uh, further discussion? Well, I'm not seeing any hands, so I, I take that motion. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. This will be ODFW motion one. I move the council adopt the following revised statement of purpose and need for non-trawl area management actions. I'll note that the motion shows the uh, d proposed deletions in strikeout and the additions in bold underlined font and I will read it um, as it would read with those changes made. The purpose of these proposed actions is to provide access to additional areas that are currently closed to groundfish fishing inside the non-trawl rockfish conservation area, RCA, and cowcod conservation area, CCA. The non-trawl sector is presently unable to access many target species where they are most abundant. The actions are needed to provide increased access to non-overfished shelf rockfish stocks and other important target stocks that can be found in the existing non-trawl groundfish conservation areas, thereby increasing the overall potential economic value of the groundfish fishery. The actions are also needed to help diversify fishing strategies in light of restrictive opportunities in other groundfish and non-groundfish fisheries and to provide more stable year-round fishing opportunity, expand opportunities to supply seafood, and increase potential financial benefit to fishermen, communities, and the infrastructures they support. 
the additional access might be provided by actions such as, one, moving and or modifying the existing non-trawl RCA and or CCA boundaries, and or two, allowing ground fish fishing inside the non-trawl RCA and or CCA using only select gears that minimize bottom contact. Okay, thank you, Maggie. Does the uh, language on the screen accurately reflect your motion? Yes, it does, thank you. Okay, looking for a second. Thank you by Krista Swenson. Thank you, Krista. Um, Maggie, to speak to your motion. Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, this, these modifications to the purpose and need statement uh, that we have previously seen are intended to be inclusive of um, uh, uh, the non-trawl sector a little more broadly than shelf rockfish uh, and are based on the suggestions in the GMT report under this agenda item. Uh, they are also intended to include uh, consideration of CalCOD conservation area modifications under this action, um, as well as uh, some more minor changes to uh, just recognize that restrictive opportunities in other fisheries, uh, more than just salmon and crab, uh, are a factor. And uh, I, I think I'll leave it there. That's the intent of these modifications to the purpose and need statement. Thanks. Okay, well, thank you. Um, discussion on the motion? Okay, not, not seeing any, um, so I will call for the question. Um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay. Uh, motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Maggie, for that. Okay. Further discussion? Motions? Maggie Summer. Maggie. Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, I can offer a second motion and then uh, note that after um, all motions under this item are completed, we probably want to have some council uh, discussion and, and confirmation of priorities uh, as we move forward with any actions adopted under motions today. So be prepared to offer ODFW motion two. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. One moment while I make sure I have the right version in front of me on my screen with some notes. That looks like it. Great. Um, I move the council adopt the following range of ground fish non-trawl area management alternatives between 46, 16, and 4010 North Latitude, waters between the Oregon-Washington border and Point Conception, California. Alternative one, allow open access vessels targeting groundfish to fish in the non-trawl RCA using approved hook and line gear. Allow open access vessels targeting groundfish to operate inside the non-trawl RCA with hook and line gear, except bottom long line, vertical hook and line that is anchored to the bottom, and dingle bar gear are types of hook and line gear that are not allowed. Fixed gear types other than hook and line are not allowed. Vessels must declare their intent to fish within the non-trawl RCA prior to departure. Fishing area, vessels may fish inside and outside the non-trawl RCA on the same trip. Gear on board, vessels shall only carry approved hook and line gear on board the vessel when fishing occurs in the non-trawl RCA. Alternative two, allow limited entry fixed gear vessels targeting ground fish to fish in the non-trawl RCA using approved hook and line gear up to limited entry fixed gear trip limits. Allow limited entry fixed gear vessels targeting ground fish to operate inside the non-trawl RCA and fish up to the limited entry fixed gear trip limits with hook and line gear 
except bottom long line, vertical hook and line that is anchored to the bottom, and dingle bar gear are types of hook and line gear that are not allowed. Fixed gear types other than hook and line are not allowed. Vessels must declare their intent to fish within the non-trawl RCA prior to departure. Fishing area, limited entry fixed gear vessels may fish inside and outside the non-trawl RCA on a trip. Gear on board, limited entry fixed gear vessels can only carry approved hook and line gear on board a vessel. Vessels shall not fish during, uh, vessels shall not switch gears during a fishing trip. I would like to make one change as I'm reading this, please. Uh, the gear on board limited entry fixed gear vessels can only carry approved hook and line gear on board a vessel when, and this is the addition, after vessel, please add when fishing occurs in the non-trawl RCA. Thank you. Moving on to reading uh, alternative three, reconfiguration of non-trawl RCA boundaries. The seaward non-trawl RCA boundary will be 75 fathoms. Sub option one, prohibit all bottom contact groundfish gear in groundfish EFH conservation areas that would otherwise be reopened under this action. Alternative four, completely remove the non-trawl RCA. Sub option one, prohibit all bottom contact groundfish gear in groundfish EFH conservation areas that would otherwise be reopened under this action. Priority of alternatives and incremental process. Alternatives in this motion are prioritized in this order. One, two, three, four. Analysis and future council action should allow for adoption of preliminary preferred and final alternatives for alternatives one and two as soon as possible, and this may occur before those steps for other alternatives under this item. In addition, the council may consider action on alternative three prior to alternative four. Alternatives may, may be combined. Action alternatives are not mutually exclusive. Logbooks required for all action alternatives. Logbooks will be required to collect data on fishing effort, location, gear, catch, releases and discards and other information determined to be necessary. And block area closures for all alt action alternatives. Block area closures may be used in the non-trawl sector to control catch of ground fish or protected species by restricting fishing by gear type and sector within specific latitudes and depth contours. Block area closures could be implemented in season or pre-season. Yellow eye rockfish conservation area closures. For all action alternatives, identify potential yellow eye rockfish conservation areas, if any, that could be used to mitigate impacts to yellow eye rockfish resulting from this action, which could be implemented in biennial management measures or in season action. Okay, Maggie, thanks for that. Before we go to a second, I see or ask you for clarification. I see Todd Phillips' hand up. Todd? Yes, yeah, so thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, Ms. Somers, I noticed in the very top there where it says I move the council, um, et cetera, et cetera, um, you have between 4616 and 4010 north latitude, and then in parentheses, you have waters between OR or Oregon Washington border and Point Conception. Uh, 4010 is not point inception. Um, thank you. Thank you for the catch, Todd. I appreciate that. Uh, perhaps we, my intent is 4010 up to the Oregon-Washington border. So perhaps striking that whole parenthetical statement would be best. Let's just delete that. OK. Thank you, Todd, for that catch. And uh, Maggie, is the is the language now on the screen now accurate? It is now. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you for the motion. Um, second by Marcy Rimko. Thank you, Marcy. Um, uh, Maggie, speak to your uh, motion as needed. I will. Thanks, Vice Chair. Um, overall, this motion uh, generally adopts the recommendations of our groundfish advisory subpanel with a few um, 
A few modifications to the alternatives as they were proposed in attachment one under E6 in our, our briefing book. Um, this suite of alternatives is intended uh, for this area between 4010 and the Oregon Washington border to um, allow us to evaluate these potential modifications to the non trawl RCA. Um, and as I will speak to in just a moment when we get down to the item on um, incremental process and prioritization. Would, um, a very important part of this is allowing um, uh, evaluation and potential action on these first alternatives, uh, if that can occur prior to alternatives three and four, understanding that there is um, likely to be a more substantial analytical uh, uh, process and time frame for alternatives three and four. Um, so uh, alternative one would allow uh, hook and line gear types, and I'm using the uh, current gear definitions in uh, section 660.11 in the federal regulations. Um, so it would allow hook and line gear types, except that it would specifically exclude those hook and line gear types which are designed to make bottom contact, uh, and that includes bottom long line, the vertical hook and long pardon me, hook and line anchored to the bottom, um, as well as dingle bar gear. And then for clarity, the motion also specifies that fixed gear types other than hook and line would not be allowed under this alternative. It includes the uh, requirement for declaration when uh, fishing in the non trawl RCA. It removes the sub, the the multiple sub options for fishing area and gear on board, which were included in the um, uh, attachment one, so that now there is a, just a, a single statement about which the what's allowed in terms of fishing area on a trip when this activity occurs and what kind of gear can be on board. Alternative two is very uh, is. Similar to alternative one, the difference being that it would allow limited entry vessels to fish up to their limited entry trip limits uh, under this activity. I will note that um, as, as uh, analysis proceeds on these items, the expectation is that among the uh, types of gear that would be allowed under these alternatives will be the three configurations allowed in the uh, approved midwater rockfish non trawl EFPs that have been authorized uh, Emily Platt, Cook, and Real Good Fish. Um, and so we will have some, uh, some information on that. In, in fact, we already do in the appendix to the attachment that was presented. Um, but this alternative is not narrowing it specifically to only those gear configurations. This would uh, provide for a little bit more flexibility and uh, we'll see, hopefully that can, uh, that can continue. I also considered the information we uh, discussed on Friday. We heard a little bit about, about potential concerns about seabird impacts with the use of natural bait um, that would potentially, uh, or sorry, presumably be part of the analysis under this action. And if necessary, uh, the alternative could be modified in the future to require use of artificial bait. Uh, but for now, this alternative would allow the use of natural bait as we move through further review and consideration. Alternative three um, would leave the shoreward boundary of the non trawl RCA in this area entirely status quo uh, and addresses only moving the seaward boundary to 75 fathoms with a sub option that would prohibit uh, all bottom contact ground fish gear in uh, the EFH in the EFH conservation areas that would otherwise be reopened under this action. There are some uh, trawl EFH conservation areas which are currently closed to trawl gear uh, that are inside the non trawl RCA and in areas where the non trawl RCA would be opened by this action, those would be opened 
to uh, fishing with non-trawl gears unless the sub-option is selected. The sub-option would leave those closed to bottom contact uh, non-trawl gears uh, in, in order in, I guess, recognition of the uh, ongoing status of those areas. They have been protected from habitat impacts because of the closure in the non-trawl RCA since the early 2000s. And this would maintain, uh, this su sub-option if selected would uh, maintain that that uh, status quo for those areas. Alternative four uh, contemplates entirely removing the entire non-trawl RCA, again, with the same ground fish EFH conservation area sub-option. Uh, again, on, on priority and incremental process, we certainly have heard from the ground fish advisory sub-panel and in some public testimony, a strong interest in seeing uh, alternatives one and two move through uh, first and not be delayed by the potential lengthier analysis associated with alternatives three and in particular alternative four. And so the intent would be to um, point the analysts toward uh, working on alternatives one and two first and to um, state at this time and, and notify everybody that, that the council is um, certainly prepared to consider action in next steps on uh, uh, on just some of the alternatives. They don't have to come as uh, an entire package of four at once. Um, as the analysis is conducted, if it appears that uh, alternative three could be ready for further council consideration and action prior to alternative four, uh, that, that could be considered as well. On the logbook requirement, um, I note that uh, we will, the council will be discussing logbooks in currently tentatively scheduled for our March meeting. We'll be discussing the fixed gear logbook and we will have an opportunity at that time to specify that uh, fishing activity allowed under these alternatives um, and any others adopted under this item today would be uh, su subject to that logbook requirement and have any other discussion of, of logbook needs. And then the block area closures and yellow eye rockfish conservation area closure statements um, are to clearly indicate that um, these, I would like these tools to be uh, considered in the analysis and available as uh, measures to respond to um, catch of ground fish or protected species um, under this activity. Finally, just a few additional comments. Um, regarding the habitat analysis uh, that will be conducted as part of the analysis here. Uh, pardon me, I would like to uh, request that uh, the National Marine Fishery Service conduct and lead analysis of habitat impact related to management measures uh, for the complete range of alternatives adopted under this action with assistance from council staff as available and appropriate, as well as the habitat committee, uh, provided their habitat committee members from each state available to participate in the analysis. Uh, I would like to request that um, in habitat analysis, the, the recommendations for analysis that were provided in advisory body reports, uh, including E6 Supplemental Habitat Committee report, and in public comment uh, be considered. I want to recognize the importance of monitoring regarding these issues, uh, monitoring for compliance as well as for fishery dependent data collection and acknowledge that this is a significant issue and will likely be a factor in council uh, evaluation and decisions on these alternatives at future steps. We reckon, I recognize that VMS and observer coverage are already requirements uh, and also would like to explore whether there is potential to increase observer coverage rates for vessels fishing in the non-trawl RCA or newly reopened portions of it. Um, I understand that at this time there, there is no, there are no new resources available to the observer program to increase this coverage. Uh, so we will just be continuing to 
look for information from the National Marine Fisheries Service on trade-offs and how an increase in observer coverage rates in the non trawl ground fish sector could potentially affect observer coverage availability and rates in other sectors um, and any other relevant information that NIMS feels uh, they could add to what they have already shared with us uh, to inform the council understanding and, and of potential observer coverage rates in this fishery. Um, I mentioned logbooks earlier, uh, just again, recognizing that requirements specific to these activities would need to be developed and evaluated, uh, whether an existing logbook can be used or an, a new one can be developed. Uh, there are some enforcement related issues, certainly any new gear type and sector approved for use should be added to the declaration reporting requirements as recommended by the enforcement consultants. Uh, and gear types and, and specific gear uh, configurations should be evaluated to determine if new definitions needed, need to be added to the West Coast ground fish fisheries fishing gear definitions at 660.11, uh, including definitions for the terms used in this motion. Uh, we may discover more specification is appropriate and certainly, as the analysis proceeds, uh, we'll be looking for it to enable the council and, and our advisors to evaluate the enforceability of gear specifications in any areas, uh, new areas that might be defined under these actions. Now, finally, just a note uh, on other fisheries, the action alternatives here would not make any changes from status quo for um, for any non-ground fish fisheries, uh, including salmon troll, and would um, hope that the analysis will uh, enable evaluation of the potential for gear and area conflicts with other fisheries as well. That concludes the motion and my rationale for it. Thank you, Vice Chair. Well, thank you, Maggie, for a very complete rationale. In a, in a, over such a large motion, but uh, um, Marcy Remco, Marcy? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, question to the maker of the motion, um, and Sandra, if you wouldn't mind scrolling up. Just wanna clarify back, um, thank you, um, in response to the inner, there's the exchange with uh, Todd Phillips earlier. Um, I don't, I, I'm wondering if your intent is to annex <laughs> uh, south of 4010. Um, I, I believe we might've been looking for language that said 4616 to uh, 3427 point conception. Maggie? Thank you, Vice Chair. Thank you for the question, Marcy. Uh, I uh, would would defer to a recommendation from California on how far south these alternatives should extend. Um, certainly don't want to <laughs> portions of your state. Uh, I, well, I have, have made this change to the motion, but I certainly, um, if you are interested in proposing an amendment to extend it uh, farther south to the actual point conception line. I have no objections to that. Thank you, Maggie. Marcy? Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, yes. Uh, thank you, I would um, propose a friendly amendment here to uh, strike 4010 and replace with 3427. Um, okay, Marcy, obviously it's a, I'm assuming the language is what you want. Um, yes. If not, let me know. Looks good, thank you. Okay, second by Bob Dooley, I believe. Um, I, I guess speak to the, your, uh, your amendment uh, if, um, as well. Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I believe uh, in working through the content of uh, the ODFW motion and um, 
the collaborative nature of the work, um, we uh, certainly would like uh, the alternatives to apply all the way to uh, south, uh, to point conception. Um, that's that was uh, that's consistent with the recommendations we've received from the GAP as well. Okay, wonderful. Um, any any discussion? Okay, with that, I'll uh, call for the question. All those in favor of the amendment, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Okay, so now we have an amended motion on the floor and uh, looking for uh, discussion. Bob Dooley, Bob. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I'd really like to thank the group that worked so hard yesterday for so many hours to bring this forward. And thank you so much, Maggie, for, for presenting it. I think it's a, a really good motion. I have a couple questions. Um, one of my questions is you have additional verbal guidance and I don't understand it. It wasn't included in the motion and was the intent to, have that pertain to the motion and how, how is it, uh, how are they linked? I mean, maybe I'm just showing my ignorance here a little bit, but that's a question. Uh, Maggie. Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, thanks for the question, Bob. My, my intent with my additional verbal guidance was that it would apply to this motion. Uh, and if you have a specific question about something I said, I, I would be happy to clarify further. Bob? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. No, thank you, Maggie. I just wanted to make sure it was on the on the record here that that is part of this motion because I think it's a very important part of it. And I do have another question, if it's okay, Mr. Vice Chair. Please. In your mention of monitoring it in the fourth bullet point, um, I believe it was, it, we explore the potential to increase observer coverage rates. And I would, uh, I guess it's more of a request that a NIMS gives us a, a, a thought or a uh, analysis of how much observer coverage would be adequate to um, properly monitor as we enter into an area that has been closed for 20 years and to be able to uh, eliminate a lot of the uncertainty at the low rates, particularly in the open access sector that was indicated earlier is 5%, what would be the proper, the suggested amount of oversight and monitoring to, to adequately account for um, bycatch and discards and, you know, and, uh, and such so that we can defend the fact that we are coming into an area that hasn't been there for, for 20 years, hasn't been in use. So um, I guess the bullet says to explore the potential increase. And it was in the context, I believe, in whether there's observers available, but I don't know that we get to the point of what is what would be ideal or what is needed to adequately define this bycatch. So I hope this is appropriate comment at this time, but I just, uh, and, and question. So thank you, Maggie. Okay, um, I see uh, Keely Kent has her hand up. So uh, Keely. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I could respond to that if this is the right time, but I want to make sure this is the right time to respond to that or if you'd prefer um, that come up more under discussion. I, this would be, be fine for me. Thanks. Um, in response to Mr. Dooley's uh, question and request, um, Certainly we can look into that, um, you know, depending on the scope of that sort of investigation and the type of information the council will be 
seeking to um, have in front of it to look at that. Um, it, it could be a considerable undertaking, and so we just caution that um, we'd likely need some time to be able to prepare that sort of information. Um, I certainly do not have you know specifics that I could offer at this time, but um, would consult with our um, observer program uh, managers and, and seek to provide that information um, to, would just request um, some additional time to be able to put that together and bring that back to the council. Okay, thank you, Keely. Um, Maggie? Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, and I, I will add that my, uh, my, my thinking on it is not that uh, NIMS can tell us how, how much observer coverage is enough I think I have been looking at that as a, a council policy decision on how much uncertainty, you know, how much we feel is necessary to achieve a level of uncertainty that we are comfortable with. And so I, I appreciate Keeley's response just now. And I think that is um, the, the type of information that I would be hoping uh, might be available at some point to help inform the council as we proceed with uh, you know, future future evaluation and decisions on whether we think the current observer coverage levels are, are appropriate or we would want to somehow uh, uh, allow for or potentially require higher levels, et cetera. But I, you know, I think that's a, a policy call and I think we'll want to give that some more thought with any additional information that might be available about it. and. That's why I didn't specify anything uh, more definitive about observer coverage levels in the alternatives in this motion. Okay. Okay, thank you, Maggie, for that. Um, for the discussion on the motion, the amended motion. Okay, I'm not seeing any hands, so um, I'll call for the question, so. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Uh, motion passes unanimously. And uh, thank you, Maggie, um, and really everyone involved uh, with putting that together. And uh, I know most people had a, uh, a day off. Some people had a day off yesterday, but individuals there are involved that certainly didn't. So. Much gratitude for that effort. Okay. Um, I guess um, I would turn to Marcy, because I believe she has a motion, I believe, but Marcy? Yes, thank you, my, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. You're, you're correct. I do have a motion. Uh, Sandra or Chris? Thank you. Um, I move that given the timing and efficiency concerns cited by NIMS in agenda item E5, NIMS report one, include consideration of CalCOD conservation area repeal alternatives within the non trawl sector area management measures range of alternatives. Waypoint analyses for areas within the CCA offered for consideration in E5A supplemental CDFW report should be included in future analytical materials developed for this alternative. Okay, thank you, Marcy. Is the uh, language on the screen accurate? Yes, it is. Thank you. Very good. Um, seconded by Bob Dooley. Um, okay. Marcy, please uh, speak to your uh, motion. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, first wanna um, acknowledge um, the priority need uh, for consideration of the CalCOD conservation area removal. Um, this has been a longstanding uh, priority uh, of the councils. Um, it has been on our to-do list for many moons. Um, CalCOD are completely rebuilt. Um, we've also completed our uh, EFH amendment that includes um, essentially a determination that no trawling um, is uh, 
conducted in um, these waters. So um, time is uh, right. Um, we had included uh, consideration of this action item in our um, initial cut of items uh, to go in the 23-24 uh, management measures package this cycle. Um, that was after um, being unable to accommodate it in the 21-22 specifications cycle. Um, However, in uh, reviewing the NIMS report uh, that was provided to us for this meeting, uh, the agenda item E5 NIMS report one, um, NIMS uh, took the time to uh, document their thinking on um, where this area fits best. And um, I do agree that there are um, efficiencies to be gained by pairing um, the Calcott area repeal uh, with consideration of the bigger non-trawl uh, RCA, RCA um, items that uh, we just approved in the ODFW motion. Um, certainly agree that uh, for um, evaluation and analysis uh, efficiency, um, pairing uh, the CalCOD piece uh, with the rest for north of Point Conception uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, given the similar considerations needed uh, for habitat and um, focusing on um, monitoring needs. I um, want to appreciate the GAPS uh, statement on this item um, that um, they acknowledge that if it's quickest to get done here in this non troll RCA action, then this is the place it should go. Um, though they um, also uh, remind us that uh, reopening the Calcott area has become uh, even more critical or will, will be even more critical um, in the near future due to um, constraints in the near shore on copper and vermilion and um, fullback rockfish. Um, the CCA contains um, several areas um, of known um, abundance for very healthy stocks, um, including chili pepper, um, and then the deep water areas of the slope um, that really we've been um, aiming to get access to for our, our sable fish and thorny head uh, participants. Um, those areas have been locked up a long time and um, we're looking forward to working uh, on this action and um, revising the, the boundary lines, considering new waypoints, um, and meanwhile also working to ensure we maintain protections for coral and sponge hotspots. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, Ben Intingdap's public comment to us and uh, the work that already is uh, underway um, with members of industry and um, Oceana um, and some sidebar discussions that have started to come together to um, develop a joint proposal that would include these protections um, to the most uh, highest priority sensitive areas. Um, as been acknowledged, um, those meetings are underway and they do hope to have, um, have a work product for us to review, um, hopefully by March or April. So that will, um, I think, fit nicely in the, the timeline for the non troll RCA action. Um, and just want to um, acknowledge that um, the intent there is to um, take a big step toward producing um, the analytical work that's needed um, to support the action to repeal or modify as needed the, uh, the CalCOD conservation area. So um, that was our hope that, you know, we've been hearing for um, many cycles now that um, the reason we couldn't consider repealing the CalCOD conservation area uh, first, CalCOD was overfished. Um, then the EFH action um, 
should be effective before we consider um, access in that area and then um, you know newer concerns that have surfaced on um, coral and sponge uh, habitat that is definitely uh, present in the in the Calcutt area. So we look forward to that work. Um, CDFW has been um, facilitating uh, some of those discussions and um, I expect them to continue over winter and just want to again thank the the participants in that process. Um, it includes um, a number of our GAP members and also uh, other industry reps um, from the fixed gear sector, open access and limited entry, um, the recreational sectors, we've got private boat recreational interests as well as CPFEs uh, in the discussions. Uh, and then uh, again, the, the leadership uh, from Oceana um, and brought together um, our data, our, um, our priorities, what, what, are the, what are the most important areas to each sector and how do we work together to develop a, a proposal that um, balances uh, the needs of the fishing communities and the need to protect uh, the most sensitive of the bottom areas uh, with regard to coral and sponges. Um, with that said, and um, noting that you know it is a it is a, an, a work that um, is is new work that we um, recognize is very important uh, in support of the um, the analysis needed to complete this action. Um, I just want to I think flag a few of the comments uh, in the NIMS report about. Um, other analyses um, that might be needed uh, to accomplish uh, the opening of the Calcot area. Um, Maggie spoke about um, monitoring, and I believe the the same um, priorities hold true here. Um, we we certainly need to look at um, monitoring programs and how we would monitor activity in the CCAs, um, noting that we do have existing tools of VMS, um, some observer coverage. Um, we also have um, some um, onboard um, catch monitoring of the CPFV fleet. Um, we also have our fish ticket data uh, which is available to us now um, nearly real time, uh, as well as our uh, location specific uh, CPFV data uh, in the form of California uh, state logbooks for uh, the CPFV fishery. Um, and then again, uh, um, onboard data from some coverage of the CPFV activities. So um, I don't. I think we're we're starting off um, with you know programs in place, um, and we look forward to discussion about how we um, best utilize our existing programs um, or make recommended modifications to ensure that um, monitoring um, is sufficient. Um, with regard to um, Another uh, suggestion from NIMS that the council consider catch of other stocks that are prevalent in the CCA that have previously been identified as vulnerable, such as bronze spotted rockfish and pink rockfish. Um, I guess um, I'd say this, this was new to me, um, hearing concerns about uh, bronze spotted and pink rockfish associated with uh, access in the CCA. Um, but again, just uh, reiterating that we do have um, species specific catch data, um, species specific uh, discard data, uh, bronze spotted is a prohibited species. Um, and um, we do um, our, our best uh, to 
um, educate anglers with regard to species identification um, to aid them in um, properly identifying um, bronze spotted rockfish. Um, we may have some work to do on, on pink rockfish um, and maybe more work to do on bronze spotted rockfish, um, but um, fish identification is certainly something that is um, an area of emphasis um, in our recreational sampling program, in our, in our training protocols, um, and also in our outreach materials that we prepare uh, each year uh, for the public um, in association with the, uh, our annual uh, regulations booklet. Um, so I think we're looking at some other uh, outreach materials to um, aid identification of um, these stocks now that NIFS has identified them as um, of a particular concern. Um, so we'll certainly be um, doing some evaluations uh, over winter to see, to see what else we might be able to do to alleviate uh, any concerns with those stocks. Um, so with that, I'm, I'm happy um, to include uh, consideration of the CalCod conservation area uh, repeal among the alternatives for uh, the non troll RCA uh, action and um, looking forward to next steps. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. I see uh, Todd Phillips uh, has the end up. Todd? Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, Mr. Renko, just so uh, council staff understands the intent of this motion, do you intend recreational fisheries to be part of the analyses? And I would also um, point out that that if, if that is the case, it's not exactly clear to me that the purpose and need uh, would cover recreational fisheries because we've been primarily dealing with commercial fisheries in the analyses to date. Um, thank you. Thank, thanks, Todd. Um, I see Keely has her hand up, but um, Marcy, you want to take that first? or? Sure. Um, I, I guess I would um, note that really what is going on here is moving um, a proposed item that was included um, in the ROA for the biennial management measures. Um, this is CalCod conservation area repeal has been among the, the items included on the list un, until now. Um, and that, you know, it's the, the work that's been um, considered in that um, process and the specs process certainly includes a recreational component. So, um, yes, that would certainly be the intent. Um, I'm, I'm sure if we needed to modify language in the future to make that clear, we, we can do that. But um, I saw the action here today is basically a wholesale move of the item out of E5 and into E6. Thanks. Thanks, Marcy. Uh, Keely? Thank you. Um, I had a clarifying question. Um, with the changes to the purpose and need um, that we saw previously, um, where it does lay out that um, in that second, or in the last sentence of the purpose and need, um, basically the approach that um, adding the CCA changes in with into the same structure that the non trawl RCA changes are being looked at, which is kind of a separation of consideration for non-bottom contact gear and then consideration of bottom contact gear changes. Um, I just wanted to confirm the intent crosswalking between this motion, the previous motion, and the purpose and need statement that the intent would be that the CCA changes are um, integrated into the alternatives um, in the same way that, yeah, there's a separation of the approach um, in the different alternatives between looking at non-bottom contact gear in the CCA and then also looking at changing um, and or removing the boundaries um, of the CCA in the same way that it's gonna be considered for the non troll RCA. Is that a fair uh, summarization? And if not, I would appreciate um, further feedback. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Keely. I'm gonna answer that as a qualified yes. Um, I think that um, there is 
there are elements kind of yet to unfold as we begin the discussion um, for areas north of Point Conception and how we um, how we um, develop alternatives and, and the pathways and the phased approach discussion. Um, I think that um, exactly how the CalCOD piece is considered, um, if it's appropriate to consider gears um, as opposed to full, um, I guess we'd, we'd say no fishing areas, um, that to me is, is not something that's um, had a lot of resolution yet. Um, you know, acknowledging that the work is just getting going on this action. Um, we thought we were doing the right thing by approaching this proactively to get some discussions going and look at some waypoints and look at some coral and sponge hotspots and put some folks together that are interested in working on this area. So I would, um, I would support uh, flexibility as we move forward to integrate these two pieces of the action, um, acknowledging that you know we have just now made the decision to in to uh, to talk about them both under um, this action item. Um, you know, I think there will be some some things that become more clear as we work to develop um, the alternatives. Um, but I would, you know, yes, I would like to proceed, um, including the Calcott area in as part of the discussion. Um, again, noting that this was the recommendation to pair this item um, with the non troll RCA item. So um, I think that's the best answer I can give you at the time. And I'm looking forward to um, the discussions as they transpire. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Marcy. Um, for the discussion. Okay. Um, seeing no hands, I'm going to call for the question. Um, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Thank you, Marcy. Um, with that, I'll. I think I'll turn to Todd to give us an update how we're doing this. Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I believe oops, the council oops. has had, whoop, oh, there's a hand up. I also see it. Yeah, I, I, Corey. Uh, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, yeah, we, I do have a motion um, to offer as well. I believe Sandra or Chris should have that. But if you have questions for Todd, I don't mean to interrupt. No, no, that no, I, that was, um, that's, um, we have a motion. I'd love to have it. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, there, you should see it on, I see it on the screen here. Um, so I'll, I'll read it here. Uh, I move that the council add, and please delete that to Sandra or Chris. Sorry about that. Put it in the wrong place, but I'll start over here. I move, and can you add a, um, a two after the comma in that same sentence? Oh, second comma, excuse me. Thank you, apologies. Okay, starting over. Uh, I move that the council add the following alternative specific to the area off Washington, north of 4616 north latitude to the range of alternatives. Open limited areas of the non troll RCA and to pot gear only. Limited in that only parts of the current boundary would be modified and that the opening would be only extend so far onto the continental shelf. The areas would be generally located seaward of the 75 fathom line, but may be defined by coordinates that do not necessarily follow a single depth contour. The open areas would satisfy the following objectives. Allow only minimal increases of yellow eye bycatch. Avoid direct and indirect conflicts with recreational and other fisheries currently fishing within 100 fathoms. Avoid impacts to sensitive habitats. 
are distinct enough from the 100 fathom seaward boundary to be enforceable by the existing vessel monitoring system. And can you add an ING after monitor there? Sorry about that. It's on the very last bullet point, the very last phrase, the event monitoring I should have written. And it's Yeah, and sorry for the confusion. Under that very loud vessel monitor system should be monitoring. Thank you. Okay, Corey, does that uh, language on the screen accurate? It, it does now, thanks to Chris or Sandra. Okay, very good. Um, for a second. Second by Butch Smith. Thanks, Butch. Uh, Corey, please speak to your motion. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, yeah, I guess I'll start off. Make I didn't. I didn't with this easy one. I didn't suggest a number for this alternative, um, but it, it's meant to be a standalone alternative separate from, from what we just passed. You know, I um, have faith council staff can figure out how to package it, but th this is this is a, a separate alternative that applies um, just to those areas off Washington. Um, and, and, and we spoke, I'll just take a couple minutes here, and we spoke a little bit to it in our, re in our WDFW report under this item. I spoke to it the other day, yesterday, or whenever, what a Friday, um, that, you know, Washington has a different history um, the, 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 in, in terms of, of, our, of our near shore areas that, that, you know, the state led in the 90s, the council has supported, and we, we have, um, we don't have the same near shore commercial fisheries that they do off of, off of Oregon and California. Um, and a lot of that was as out of concerns about whether, whether the, the area could support a commercial fishery on top of our recreational and, and tribal fisheries. Um, so maybe I'll go bullet point by bullet point briefly here. And that's, you know, really that first bullet point about yellow, yellow eye bycatch. It, we have a lot of yellow eye off of Washington. Um, and, and, and the pot gear only part is because we believe that, um, you know, a catch of yellow eye will be minimal on pot. The data shows that. Um, on that second bullet point, you know, this this area has been closed for close to 20 years. Our uh, our recreational fisheries have been experiencing the same type of restrictions for rebuilding yellow eye as, as the commercial fisheries, and have adapted over that time to fish in deeper waters. Um, and and there is a potential for for. Um, for, for conflict over over fishing grounds and 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 the same species, but we think suspect that with pot gear, at least the indirect conflict in terms of of harvest of the of the rec recreationally popular species like halibut and lingcod, um, black rockfish, et cetera, would would be very low. Um, that the third bullet there, I think we spoke into the to that to the habitats, and we, we're not meaning to have a full review of our habitats protections here, but we'll be looking, looking at that as, as um, we would be looking at that as, as we look for areas that would be open. And then I think the uh, enforcement consultants report and others spoke to that last, last one there um, about um, the need to uh, be able to enforce this with VMS. And especially so if we're going to, we're going to differentiate gear types, um, we need to pay attention to whether, whether this would be enforceable or not. Um, I have a couple more, a couple more thoughts to offer. Um, you know, we recognize that the, the fellow council members representing our state up here have concerns about looking at this idea, and we appreciate their their support. Um, we, we, you'll see, we don't have specific coordinates at this time. Um, we we had some initial discussions with with people with with folks, the proponents of this of this idea. And recreational stakeholders, and it just it those highlighted the need to have more discussions. So this would generally put folks on notice that we're considering this. Um, doesn't say that we're going to find 
areas that meet these objectives, um, but we, we think that more, more um, valuation is warranted. And I, I think there was an exchange yesterday or the day on Friday with the GMT on what we meant by the report meant in terms of is it is it the whole area or is it parts and and the language here is meant to indicate we're, we're not talking about a move completely um, of the 100 fathom line into 75 fathoms everywhere off Washington. Yeah, we, we're, we've seen enough to know that you know that wouldn't be consistent with these objectives, but we, we think there are some smaller areas there to that 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 have the prospect of, of satisfying these. Um, I briefly mentioned that the uh, tribal co-managers, um, we haven't had a chance to fully engage them, but we, we, we would still like to, to do that. We uh, hope to hear their thoughts on this. And we think this, this evaluation, this setup would, would, would help them, uh, help us understand if their concerns, if, if, if they have some about, about opening these areas. And let me, a couple more, just a couple more thoughts and I'll wrap up and see if there's, if I can speak, speak more to questions. Um, and, and understand that this leaves um, somewhat open for, for what we would ask staff to be, to be analyzing from this point on. Um, and on that, I think the GMT's report was, was excellent in, in many regards, but I think we would be, uh, WDFW would be looking in particular to come up with coordinates for the next stage of council consideration and being asked and ask analysts to look you know generally at, at these um as they are in the other states looking at at habitat about bycatch rates about about the economics and of, of the of the the, the fishery here the purpose is to uh possibly open some some grounds in late summer and fall to to uh to to get to some some bigger sable fish higher value sable fish so we think the analysts could help look at that and on that should say these in, in terms of only being part of the coast, we expect these openings would be only for part of the year where, where there is that interest. Um, just pausing, I'll, I guess I'll end with, um, yeah, those, those four objectives what, what rose to the top for us. They're of course not the only, not the only objective the council would have to consider um, under the Magnuson Act and other laws. Um, and, you know, we've heard the GMT and others mentioned the possibility of whale entanglements you know, pot gear is nice for yellow eye, bycatch, and, and seabird encounters. It does pose uh, some questions about whale entanglement, which we didn't name here explicitly, but of course we would we would be, and the council would be uh, paying attention to those. Yeah, and uh, I guess I'll end there, end there, Mr. Vice Chair, see if I can answer any questions. Okay, thank you, Corey. Um, I see Keely Kidd has her hand up. Keely. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Mr. Niles. Um, did want to um, confirm intent. Um, you know, looking at this um, motion, it is very broad, as you have noted, um, and there is additional development work to be done, similar to some of the other alternatives that um, the council just adopted. And so I want to confirm that the expectation would be there will be further development and refinement of specific alternatives for the next stage um, that we would need additional clarification on what exactly the alternatives are um, rather than being able to to just jump to like a PPA for example and I, I just want to confirm that understanding with you. Corey? Thanks Mr. Vice Chair. Yes I, that, that is the intent. Um, and, and given, yeah, that we're not talking about wholesale changes here, uh, the work of the analysis going forward would, would be to get to, to, to that more specific proposals of coordinates, which would then, um, you know, we, we wouldn't, I wouldn't see us coming to a PPA um, at the next step. We, and, and we might even, like I said, come up with, with areas that we don't think are workable. Um, and I, and I'll, on that, I think, um, I will say I did not say this in, in speaking to it earlier, but in terms of priorities, um, you know, as the gap spoke to in their report, uh, there's some concern that 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 we that this waiting for for this area off Washington might slow other changes to the to California and Oregon, and we have no intent of doing that. And if it turns out 
a slower track is needed um, after the next stage. That that that's the possibility. Um, that is a possibility we recognize. And who knows? We've all even talked about maybe we'll we'll have these discussions. Look at the data. Look at the areas more closely, and perhaps something like an EFP might even be more appropriate. But yeah, no, I I don't expect we would be able to jump to a PPA right away at the next step. Hope that answers it. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Corey. Uh, for the discussion, uh, Phil Anderson. Phil. Thanks, my, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. I won't say much here. I'm just, just, um, and and uh, Corey noted it. I'm, I, I I'm approaching this uh, action with the, uh, with reluctance. Um, the, of course, these RCAs have been in place for over. 20 years or right at 20 years, I think. And a lot has changed um, uh, over that course of the 20 years, uh, particularly uh, the area between, I'll just say between 75 and 100 fathoms and the recreational use um, in those areas. So um, I will um, uh, try to try to work within the process the department sets up to have further discussions about whether or not uh, we can find these areas um, um, and uh, we'll uh, see how it goes. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Phil. Um, anyone else? All right. Um, I'm not seeing any hands. For discussion, so uh, we'll call for the question. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Um, motion passes unanimously. So, okay. With that, um, I'll go back to Todd to see how we're we're doing on uh, on this one. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, obviously, the council's had a very vigorous and good discussion on this item. Um, the motions have given us a, a direction to go, and uh, I'll also note that, that Ms. Somer's uh, motion did give us priority of how to uh, to start in on these particular agenda item, or particular items. Um, I would say that you have achieved the desired goal of uh, of your council action. Um, and we will get to work on this as we can. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Todd. Um, so next up is E7. Uh, we've been at this for uh, close to two hours now, and um, I, my understanding is that uh, the CDFW report is fairly lengthy, and so I think um, we're going to take an early lunch and um, uh, we'll take a full hour and uh, we'll be back here at um, 1240.
Okay, welcome every, uh, welcome back everyone from uh, from our lunch. It is 12.40 and I'll be looking to um, Todd to start us off on E7. Todd? Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Good afternoon, Council. Um, as the Vice Chair mentioned, this is agenda item E7, in season adjustments, including Pacific whiting set-asides for 2022, final action. <clears throat> Manage measures for ground fish are set by the Council with the general understanding that these measures will not will likely be needed to adjust, be adjusted within the biennium to attain, but not exceed annual catch limits. This agenda item will consider progress to date of the ground fish fisheries, including activities under exempted fishing permits, as well as routine in-season adjustments remaining in 2021 fisheries and 2022 fisheries. Potential in-season adjustments include adjustments to catch limits, season structure, and other items relevant to in-season management of the fishery. Additionally, the council will take up the, the Pacific Whiting Yield Set-Asides. The council is scheduled to adopt yield set-asides to accommodate the incidental mortality of Pacific Whiting in the 2022 research activities and in the pink shrimp fishery. Attachment one, um, historical mortality of Pacific Whiting in research and pink shrimp from 2011 through 2020, contains information on the historic mortality of Pacific whiting in research and pink shrimp fisheries. Well, in your briefing packet, you have the supplemental uh, revised attachment one. Then you have a report from California, two reports from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, a report from the GM, two reports from the GMT, and a report from the GAP. Your action today is to adopt final in-season adjustments for 2021 and 2022 as necessary to achieve but not exceed annual catch limits and other management objectives. And two, adopt Pacific white whiting yield set-asides for 2022. That concludes my overview. I'm happy to answer any questions or we can move right into uh, the manager reports. Thank you. Okay, uh, questions for Todd on his overview? Um, okay, seeing none, thank you, Todd. And uh, we'll go directly to the CD, CDFW report. I believe we have uh, Mel Mandrup and uh, Melanie Parker given those. So, Marcy. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. If I could uh, just like to spool uh, this item up a little bit. Um, CDFW report one um, will present uh, our normal um, report to the council on our in-season tracking efforts and our catches to date in 2021 in our uh, recreational and commercial fisheries of importance. Um, moving to CDFW report two, um, we've had a lot of discussion this week on copper and quillback rockfish and um, in preparation for our um, specifications actions next June uh, and management measures next June, um, we are looking to propose some modifications in 2022 fisheries so that um, we might revise um, some of the catch projections that are incorporated in the current stock assessments or, or rebuilding analyses. So the goal here um, is, is to um, lay out the um, information we have and the proposals uh, as well as how uh, we expect uh, the savings to be achieved. So um, I just wanted to kind of set this item in context with other items that we've been taking up this week in the specifications and the management measures. And um, just to say that this is a, a necessary step. Um, it's, it's, not a, it's not a pleasant step, um, but in order to um, reduce the projected impacts um, in 2022, um, action is needed now um, if we want to realize some savings that, you know, the, the idea being we, we, we keep the fish in the bank 
and um, rerun um, a few of the tools we have to um, to then use the outputs from from the stock assessments and the rebuilding analyses uh, in our specifications actions that are uh, ahead of us still um, in March, April, and June. So I just wanted to make sure that um, everyone's aware of, of why <laughs> the lengthy report and why um, there's so much in it. I, I understand that the analysis that we've prepared here today um, is useful and, and necessary uh, in support of in-season action. Um, on the on the NIMS uh, regulatory uh, implementation side, so we did our best, and um, we'll uh, uh, have some other uh, remarks on on things at the end. But thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Marcy. Um, actually, on uh, on uh, your overview there, it kind of makes me. Um, I've heard some rumblings about a potential ramp down strategy on those species, and uh, what you just said there is that. Are you thinking about Something like that, like we did for cow cod uh, maybe 10 years ago? Um, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I, I, I don't know if I can put the ramp down, if I can label this as a ramp down approach, but I, I think what I would say is that the savings that we are proposing for 2022 um, don't get us as far as we are likely going to need to go in 2023. So um, the actions in 22 are um, in some way is a just a precursor, or, you know, it's an action to save uh, some fish in the bank and we'll see what the, the outputs are from the reruns. But um, I, I think it is in concept a ramp down because um, again, I'm, I'm afraid that what we see in terms of the projected impacts for 2022 under these new uh, recommended actions aren't going to be enough to achieve the, the reductions that will be needed in the 2023 specifications. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, okay, um, appreciate that. And I think maybe that's probably a maybe more discussion in, uh, under E5. But uh, with that, we'll, um, we'll go to um, either Mel or uh, Melanie to, to get us going here. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, Council. Um, I will start off uh, with CDFW report number one, um, I being Mel Mandrup. And uh, I will then roll into CDFW report two, um, but I'll note that I will be tag teaming with my CDFW uh, cohort, Melanie Parker. So um, you have the CDFW Mel's on, on the line with you uh, this afternoon to go through the California in-season uh, items. So uh, with that said, I will get started. Um, with agenda item E7A, supplemental CDFW report one. For this, I will um, uh, pretty much just give an overview of the report. And this is uh, the, the typical um, report that we provide, that, that CDFW provides uh, for every in-season in that um, shows the ground fish harvest in California. Um, I'll note that uh, this is only through um, September, the rec pro uh, projections are only through September of this year, and um, the commercial projections are through um, early November. So we will come back in March with a, an update on uh, the complete year of 2021 um, to share, share with you. So with that said, um, I'll go ahead and uh, walk through table one. So this is uh, first report, table in the report and this is showing the stocks and stock complexes that um, are um, 
shot off California in our recreational fishery and the uh, non-trawl commercial fishery. However, I will note that for blackgill rockfish south of 4010, that um, commercial number does include the trawl take as well because we are tracking to uh, an HG uh, that is set to the, the ACL um, contribution to that complex, the Southern Slope complex, and uh, that has been split between trawl and non-trawl. So we are tracking both those fisheries in this. So that is the only uh, species that includes a trawl, uh, trawl mortality in there or landings. So um, the list kind of goes uh, from north to south with, uh, with how we uh, kind of uh, reach our species. Um, that would be uh, the first column there. Second column is our reference points. Um, I'll note that there are a few in there that uh, it's only the recreational uh, HD or ACT that we are tracking to, that would be for yellow eye rockfish, um, canary rockfish, and cow cod. So uh, those tables, those numbers you see in table one are only from the recreational fishery tracking against those, those particular uh, accountability measures there. Uh, then um, moving Right uh, across the table there, you have your recreational mortality of each of those stocks or complexes, uh, the commercial landings, the total uh, of the commercial and recreational landings that um, uh, have, have a tracking limit for both uh, uh, commercial and, and rec, uh, and then um, Tracking limits, uh, so whatever's referenced uh, in that second column, those are the tracking limits um, for those point reference points and then the percent attainment. So um, I will call your attention to the Vermilion Rockfish south of 4010. Uh, we've been tracking this one uh, in particular um, uh, as a single uh, item. Um, in that shelf, southern shelf complex, uh, and we've been tracking it to the ACL contribution to that complex. And um, if you are following along at home, you'll see in the percent attainment column, we are at 109% of that ACL contribution of uh, the recreational catch and uh, the commercial catch combined. Uh, again, noting that recreational number is uh, estimate only through September. So we still have a few more months to go um, to, to add into that. And uh, we are we are projecting to be much higher than that 109.1%. Uh, then uh, moving on to table two, this is uh, all our um, recreational catch. Um, again, through September, you can see each of the, the same stock and stock complexes uh, by their monthly estimate for that total, which is then added into table one. And then lastly on table three, uh, this is the commercial catch all the way through the beginning of November. And uh, that total there is also uh, added into table one, except for yellow eye rockfish, uh, canary rockfish, and cow cod. Um, because again, those are the only, those are the three stocks we, or species we are tracking um, to a recreational uh, HT. So uh, with that, um, I will take any, any questions on report one. Okay, thanks, Mel. Uh, questions for Mel on the uh, CDFW report one? Okay, I don't see any, so uh, please proceed. Alrighty, um, I will go ahead and roll into uh, agenda item E3, E7A rather. CDFW report number two. 
um, on in-season adjustments for the 2022 fishing season. Due to the results of the recent Quillback Rockfish length-based data moderate stock assessment of California, indicating the stock is overfished and the combined length-based moderate stock assessment for copper rockfish of California, indicating the stock is in the precautionary zone, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, CDFW, recommends the council take in-season action to begin reducing mortal total mortality of these California stocks. Additionally, due to recent high catches of vermilion rockfish south of 4010, that include 109% of the 2021 annu annual catch limit or ACL contribution to the shelf rockfish complex south of 4010, has been taken uh, further reductions in reference in that report I just overviewed, uh, further reductions to the recreational sub bag limit may be warranted. CDFW also requests that the decision tables for the quillback rockfish off and copper rockfish off California assessments be rerun using the 2022 projection, removal projections resulting from, this har from the harvest reductions proposed in this report. For quillback rockfish uh, off California. The California quillback rockfish length based data moderate assessment currently assumes uh, 2022 removals of 13.5 metric tons. The 2023 and 2024 ACLs are not yet determined, though quillback rockfish in California will be removed from the near shore complexes. California proposes the following sub bag and sub trip limits for California rock. Uh, Quillback rockfish to reduce projected mortality in 2022. Recreational fishery. Current recreational regulations provide various season lengths and fishing depths by management area, as seen in Table 1. Quillback rockfish are managed as part of the rockfish ca uh, cabazon greenling or the RCG complex for which a 10 fish bag uh, daily bag and position limits exist. Anglers are limited to no more than one with one line with two hooks when fishing for rockfish. So as mentioned uh, earlier, table one uh, we see is the California recreational structure for the conser uh, rockfish conservation area depth boundaries by management area. Uh, and um, as well as for a month for the 21 and 22 fishing seasons. And in this table, you have the recreational area management areas um, going from north to south. Uh, northern uh, management area that, that would be the about 40 is 42 to 4010 uh, degrees latitude, north latitude. The Mendocino area is um, just south of that, um, which includes uh, like the Fort Bragg area, then we have San Francisco, um, the central management area, which would be uh, Monterey and, and Morro Bay areas, and then southern uh, management area that would be uh, everything south of Point Conception and the uh, Channel Islands area. So you see here, um, should be a familiar uh, table uh, where we have our depths and uh, season lengths um, for each management area throughout the year. Projected total mortality of quillback rockfish in California's recreational fishery in 2022 is 10.4 metric tons, which is in table two, which I'll get to in a moment. The catch projection was calculated using the established wreckfish model with base year data from 2017 to 2019 and recent catch trend information and assumes management measures from 2021 are the same in 2022. Quillback rockfish are one of a number of near shore rockfish species that contribute to a mixed species bag, though they are often taken in large though they are not taken in large numbers, even in the northern part of the state where they are more common. More than 50% of anglers who catch quillback rockfish catch only one fish. So in table two, 
can see the uh, projected California recreational mortality quillback rockfish by each of those management areas and uh, the total statewide um, mortality that's projected uh, that has current previously projected for 2022. Quillback rockfish are considered a deeper nearshore rockfish species, and while they are commonly found in waters shallower than 30 fathoms, can be encountered in waters deeper than that. Sample data from CDFW's California Recreational Fishery, Fishery Surveys, uh, also known as SURFs, program indicates that between 2017 and mid-2021, approximately 87% of sampled quillback rockfish were from depths shallower than 30 fathoms, which is in Table 3. It should be noted that the northern areas of the state where quillback rockfish are more commonly found, the recreational fishery depth restrictions have generally been 30 fathoms or less in recent years. Therefore, the data showing encounter rates by depth bin are driven by the allowing, allowed fishing depth in regulation. So in table three, we can see the proportion of total sample quillback rockfish by each of the 10 fathom depth bins. Um, and that was uh, data from 2017 through, um, uh, through part of this year. CDFW examined changes to the recreational regulations for quillback rockfish that would minimize impacts on opportunities for the other groundfish species. Under consideration is implementation of a new statewide one fish stat sub limit within the 10 fish daily RCG bag limit or no retention of quillback rockfish in the recreational fishery in California. Impacts under a one fish sub bag limit and no retention were analyzed using the previously established bag limit tool available on RECFIN and depth dependent mortality rates. The analysis was conducted under the following assumptions. One, anglers will continue to fish in the same depths and areas. Two, Quebec rockfish caught in excess of one fish sub bag limit, uh, sub bag catch projections will be discarded. By three, by apportioning the assumed discards to the depths in which quillback rockfish were historically caught, in the recreational fishery, the recreational quillback rockfish um, depth dependent DDM depth dependent mortality rates in table four could be applied to the apportionments, then summed for a discard estimate. These assumptions are likely to generate overestimates of discard mortality as angular angler behavior will likely change to avoid the species as happened with other species of concern like yellow eye rockfish, cow cod, and canary rockfish. Results of the analysis indicate a statewide, statewide one fish sub bag limit could result in total mortality of 8.8 .8 metric tons and 4.8 metric tons under no retention. And in table four, uh, we have the recreational quillback uh, rockfish depth dependent mortality rates uh, by each uh, 10 fathom depth bin. And I'll point out anything greater than 30 fathoms is uh, already uh, automatically receives 100% um, mortality to, to that catch. In table five, we see projected recreational total mortality in metric tons for the quill, for quillback rockfish in uh, California by each of the management areas um, for the uh, under status quo regulations. And if it, if there was a one fish sub bag limit uh, implemented or if no retention was implemented, you can see 
that uh, we can go from 10 metric tons uh, down to 8.3 metric tons with a one fish sub bag limit in 4.8 metric tons uh, with no retention. So a slight correction that in the text above. Due to uncertainties surrounding the analysis analyses, the need to reduce total mortality in the 2022 and beyond um, CDFW is increasing tracking and monitoring of quillback rockfish catch beginning in 2022. This will allow fishery managers to make timely changes to management measures if total mortality significantly exceeds to projected total mortality. The surf supplies, um, the surf supplies monthly catch estimates by area Producing surf estimates requires information on catches and effort from several sources. As a result, there is a five to eight week lag time between when the catch data are collected and when catch estimates using angler effort are generated. During the intervening weeks, CDFW performs special tracking for several rockfish species of concern using preliminary surfs weekly field reports. These preliminary reports are converted into anticipated catch values or ACVs using catch and effort data from previous years. The weekly ACV is used to approximate catch during the lag time until the corresponding monthly surfs estimates are available at which time the ACV for that month is replaced with the surf's estimate. This combined total, the ACB plus the surf estimates, represents CDFW's best in-season estimate of catch to date for rockfish species of concern. CDFW plans to add quillback rockfish to the list of species tracked using the ACB process in 2022. Commercial fishery. To harvest quillback rockfish commercially in California, a deeper nearshore fishery permit is required. The area between 42 and 4010 North Latitude, uh, in the area between 42 and 4010 North Latitude, quillback rockfish is part of the minor nearshore rockfish trip limit. South of 4010, quillback rockfish is part of the deeper nearshore trip limit. Quillback rockfish is primarily landed in the Crescent City, Eureka, and Fort Bragg port areas, which is in Table 6. And, it, and Quillback is of great importance to the live fish fishery as indicated by the increasing ex-vessel revenue in the last few years seen in Table 7. California's deeper nearshore uh, fishery permit was established in 2003 and includes black rockfish, blue rockfish, brown rockfish, calico, copper rockfish, olive rockfish, quillback rockfish, and tree fish. The deeper nearshore fishery permit was established by the Fishing Game, California Fishing Game Commission in 2003 amid concerns of the new nearshore fishery permit limited entry program for five shallow nearshore species, uh, cabazon, California sheephead, and, and greenlings might shift toward might shift effort to deeper near shore rockfish as the rockfish conservation areas had already closed off much of the shelf to the, to the protected overfish shelf species, rockfish species. The deeper near shore uh, fishery permit was initially a non-transferable permit in the number of permits and the number of permits decrease 37% from 2003 to 2018 when the permits became transferable. Since 2018, the number of vessels catching Quebec rockfish has increased 36%. 
likely due to activation of latent permits through the transfer process. Since 2018, landings of live quillback rockfish have increased 44%, while dead landings only increased 19%. Additionally, the proportion of quillback rockfish land within the deeper deer shore species group from Crescent City to Fort Bragg has more than doubled, going from 3% in 2017 to 7.7% in 2021. In table six, uh, you can see uh, we have the landings of Quebec rockfish and, and metric tons in the uh, port areas of Crescent City, Eureka, Fort Bragg, and then um, the, the ports uh, south of Fort Bragg are combined in the south of Fort Bragg um, row there uh, as those, those landings are very minimal. Um, and uh, you can see the, the grand total of Quebec landings in California over the last few years and um, the high percentage of uh, those landings in Crescent City in, in uh, south to Fort Bragg. In, in table seven, we show the ex vessel revenue of uh, Quebec rockfish and deeper near shore species, uh, rockfish rather, from the dead and live fisheries uh, in California. So um, you can see uh, on the left, we have the area, uh, Crescent City to Fort Bragg. Uh, Quebec rockfish is split out from the other deeper near shore rockfish. Um, and the, the ex vessel revenue from each year from uh, the dead and the live fisheries. And then um, moving south to, moving south, so all uh, the remainder of the port area south of Fort Bragg, uh, you see uh, similarly the, the ex vessel revenue for Quebec and the other deeper near shore rockfish from um, the dead and live fisheries from 2017 to current. And then um, uh, on the bottom of the table, you can see the percent of Quillback rockfish, rockfish X vessel revenue from the total X vessel revenue. And you can see that the, the uh, Quillback rockfish uh, X vessel revenue um, uh, increases over the years and the, the uh, especially with the live market there. And this year it's uh, already close to 20% of that live market. And we have not even finished the, the year out. So uh, moving on in mid 2020, the, uh, through in-season action, several trip limits were increased in an effort to provide economic relief to the fixed gear fleet from missing, from missed fishing opportunities earlier in the year due, due to COVID-19 pandemic. Minor nearshore rockfish and the deeper nearshore rockfish uh, trip limits in California were two of the trip limits that were increased. The minor nearshore rockfish north of 4010, uh, that would be from 42 to 4010 trip limit, increased from 1,500 pounds per two months to 2,000 pounds per two months. And the deeper nearshore trip limit south of 4010 increased from 1,000 pounds per two months to 2,000 pounds for two months. In 2021, additional opportunity was offered south of 4010 when the opening, with the opening of the March, April, or period two closure for nearshore rockfish, shelf rockfish, and lingcod. Also in 2021, the board boundary of the, the uh, rock, non trawl rockfish conservation area was adjusted to provide 10 additional fathoms from the California Oregon border south to Point Arena to offer additional opportunities for the fixed gear fleet. However, due to the results of the recent length-based data moderate stock assessment for Quillback rockfish, 
These recently implemented increased limits and fishing depths may need to be revisited to reduce harvest levels of Quebec rockfish in 2022 to provide for potential harvest opportunities in 2023. Under consideration for the commercial fishery is a sub-trip limit for Quebec rockfish. Within the status quo minor nearshore trip, rockfish trip limit and the deeper nearshore trip limit. So uh, within that 2,000 pound trip limit for um, both those, the minor nearshore rockfish and the deeper nearshore rockfish trip limits. All other stocks within the minor nearshore rockfish and deeper nearshore rockfish limits are healthy and modeling indicates that the 2,000 pounds per two months can remain for 2022. Since commercial discards of quillback rockfish are minor, typically less than 0.01 metric tons, the deeper in the deeper nearshore fishery, estimating the discard mortality from reducing the trip limit is difficult as model estimates rely uh, on historical discarding behavior. To estimate discards associated with the reduced trip limits for quillback rockfish, the following assumptions were made. One, the fleet will continue to fish in the same depths with the same gear. Two, Quebec rockfish caught in excess of the sub-trip limit landing projections will be discarded. Three, by apportioning the dead assumed discards to the depths in which Quebec rockfish were historically caught, the DDM rates uh, in table eight could be applied to the apportionments and then some for discard estimate. The DDM rates were applied uh, are the same that are applied in the ground fish management team near shore fishery projection model and the West Coast ground fish observer program for their um, mortality estimates. These assumptions are likely to generate overestimates as the deeper near shore fishery fleet tends to be fairly responsive when harvest limits were, are restricted and would adapt, uh, adapt accordingly. However, until additional data can be gathered, CDFW provides the following landings and discard projections in tables nine and 10. In table eight here, you can see the depth dependent uh, discard mortality rates for Quebec rockfish. Uh, in the area of 42 to 4010, as well as South 4010. And I'll note that they do vary, um, and that is uh, based on the amount of uh, long line gear versus sport light gear used uh, in those, those areas. Um, and I'll be happy to answer questions on that a little bit later. So table nine. Uh, shows proposed trip sub trip limits for Quebec rockfish in the minor nearshore rockfish trip it, trip limit uh, north of 4010. Again, this is only going to apply for 42 for the area between 42 and 4010. And uh, you see the proposed trip limits of 50 pounds for two months or 75 pounds for two months, and these would be across all periods. You have your landing projections the discard estimate with mortality rates applied, uh, and then you have your total mortality estimate. In table 10, we have um, proposed trip limits for Quebec rockfish in the deeper near shore trip limits south of 4010. And again, uh, 50 pounds for two months or 75 pounds for two months across all periods. And uh, you have your landing projections, discard estimate mortality with mortality rates applied to get your uh, total estimate, estimated mortality. From discussions with industry, estimating the economic loss uh, from reducing harvest limits on quillback rockfish would be difficult to quantify at this time. However, since quillback rockfish is one of the preferred species in the live market, it is expected that there will be loss of revenue until there is a shift in demand for other species in the live fish market. To date, the ex-vessel revenue for Quebec rockfish in the live fish market is approximately $31,000 and approximately $39,500 for all landings live and dead. In 2022, the ex-vessel revenue for Quebec rockfish in the live fish market 
was approximately $36,000 and approximately $44,600 for all landings, live and dead. And uh, you can go back up to table seven to, to uh, look at those numbers. So uh, combined rockfish and commercial excuse me, <laughs> combined recreational and commercial impact for Quillback rockfish. The combined projections for Quillback rockfish from both the California recreational and commercial fisheries um, uh, would depend on the adopted management measures seen in, 20, in, in table 11. So uh, in this table, table 11, you um, you have the alternative in your left column and then you follow it across. Uh, it's kind of a, in a matrix setup. So um, if you're looking at the recreational, uh, no, uh, no retention statewide and you follow it, follow it to the right, um, the next cell over, it's that recreational impact plus the commercial statewide um, projection of 50, met 50 pounds per two months to get you 8.3 metric tons and so on. Um, so you have your statewide no retention um, plus the 75 pounds per two months. And then you have your statewide one fish sub uh, bag limit with the, the two commercial uh, sublimit uh, projections. CDFW recommendation recommended in season action for quillback rockfish. The 2022 projections used in the quillback rockfish length based data moderate assessment was 13.5 metric tons for a minimal, meaningful reduction in total removals, yet still allowing some opportunity for the deeper nearshore fishery, CDFW recommends the council consider going with no retention for the recreational fishery statewide and a 75 pound per two month trip limit within the minor nearshore rockfish um, north of 4010, again, specifically only in the area between 42 and 4010 uh, north latitude as well as a 75 um, pound per two month trip limit in the deeper near shore uh, south of 4010 trip limit. Therefore, in, uh, the new 2022 removals would be uh, 8.4 metric tons, which is uh, 5.1 metric tons less than the original projection. With that, I'm gonna get some water and hand it over to uh, the other Mel. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Melanie Parker, for the record. Uh, copper rockfish. The California copper rockfish length-based data moderate assessment for the area between the Oregon-California border and Point Conception assumes 2022 20, total removals of 113.1 metric tons and from the area between Point Conception and the U.S.-Mexico border currently assumes removals of 88.9 metric tons. The 2023 ABC in the area north of Point Conception is projected to be 78.76 metric tons. And for the south of Point Conception is, for, and for the area south of Point Conception is 8.7 metric tons. These ABC contributions are expected to be managed within the respective minor nearshore complexes and may possibly include species specific harvest guidelines or other management measures. CDFW proposes the following sub bag and sub trip limits for California copper rockfish to reduce mortality in 2022. Recreational fishery. Copper rockfish are a popular recreational ground fish species in California and are managed as part of the recreational or CG complex for which various season lengths and fishing depths by management area as shown in table one exist. There is a 10 fish daily bag and possession limit with, for the RCG complex. Anglers are limited to no more than one line with two hooks when fishing for rockfish. Under current recreational regulations, the projected statewide total mortality for copper rockfish in 2022 is approximately 181 metric tons as shown in table 12. This catch projection was calculated using the established RecFish model with base year data from 2017 through 2019 and is similar to annual total mortality in the recreational fishery from 2015 through 2019. 
Actual catch in 2020 and 2021 has been significantly lower than projected, and there is uncertainty if the current 2022 projection is an overprojection or not. Uh, shown in Table 12 is the projected recreational copper rockfish total mortality in California by management area for 2022. Um, this is that 181.2 metric tons broken out by management area from the north to the south. And you can see that a significant portion of the catch um, is coming from San Francisco and south. Copper rockfish are a deeper nearshore rockfish species, but can commonly be found both in shallow nearshore waters and in deeper waters considered shelf. Approximately 61% of copper rockfish encounters statewide in the recreational fishery occur in depths shallower than 30 fathoms, as shown in Table 13. In the San Francisco, Central, and Southern management areas, where recreational depth limits have been greater than 30 fathoms for several years, an additional 27% of encounters occurs between 30 and 40 fathoms. In the Southern management area, where the depth limit is currently 100 fathoms, Approximately 39% of total sampled copper rockfish from 2017 through present had reported depths greater than 30 fathoms. And table 13 is a um, graphic showing of that information of pro pro the proportion of total sampled copper rockfish by 10 fathom depth bin from 2017 through mid 2021. This is for all California ground fish management areas combined. Um, and you can see that there's um, more than 50% of the sampled fish are coming from depths shallower than 30 fathoms, but there still is a good proportion of fish coming from deeper. Implementation of a new copper rockfish sub bag limit for within the 10 fish RCG daily bag limit or a new copper rockfish minimum size limit could reduce total mortality of copper rockfish without disproportionately impacting fishing opportunities for other rockfish species. Impacts under a one fish sub bag limit and prohibition were analyzed using the bag limit tool available on RECFIN and previously established DDM rates. The analysis was conducted under the following assumptions. One, anglers will continue to fish in the same depths and areas. Two, Copper rockfish caught in excess of the one fish sub bag catch projections will be discarded. And three, by apportioning the assumed discards to the depths in which copper rockfish were historically caught in the recreational fishery, the recreational copper rockfish DDM rates, seen in table 14, could be applied to the apportionments, then summed for a discard estimate. These assumptions are likely to generate overestimates of discard mortality as angler behavior will likely change to avoid the species as happened with other species of concern like yellow eye rockfish, cow cod, and canary rockfish. Results of the analysis indicate that a statewide one fish sub bag limit could result in total mortality of 137.5 metric tons and 110.6 metric tons under prohibited retention. And see table 15. Table 14 shows the recreational copper rockfish um, depth, depth dependent mortality rates. This is by 10 fathom depth bin where there are increasing mortality rates the deeper you go until you hit 30 fathoms. And at that point, all fish caught deeper than 30 fathoms are seen to have 100% mortality rate. Table 15 shows projected recreational total mortality for copper rockfish by management area under status quo regulations and with the implementation of a one fish sub bag limit or prohibited retention in 2022. Again, the projection under status quo regulations is 181.2 metric tons. The one fish sub bag limit would have a statewide catch projection of approximately 137.4 metric tons and prohibited retention would be a statewide um, projection of 110.6 metric tons. Currently, there are no recreational minimum size limits for rockfish in California. Implementation of a minimum size limit may offer reductions to catch and total mortality projections for some species, especially those with low release mortality. 
CDFW analyzed surf sample data for lengths of copper rockfish in one inch bins by management area from 2017 through August, 2021. The analysis indicates the average size of kept fish are generally larger in the northern areas of the state and smaller in the southern areas, figure one. And here with figure one, um, it shows by management area, um, each length bin on the x-axis with the leftmost column in the darker blue representing fish from the southern management area. The next column to the left that's orangey colored, that is from the central area. The middle column that's light gray is San Francisco. The uh, yellow or goldenrod one, which is the second from the right, is the Mendocino management area. And the light blue or furthest to the right column is the northern area. And you can see the distribution by management area where the peak proportion of sampled fish in these management areas, uh, the peak in the southern management area is in that 12 to 13 inch bin. And the peak in the Mendocino and northern management areas is in the 17 to 18 inch bin. As an example, the estimated size at 50% maturity for copper rockfish south of Point Conception is 13.4 inches or 34 centimeters. If a minimum size limit of 12 inches in the southern management area were to be enacted, a reduction in catch of approximately 29% could be expected, but many fish between the 12 inch size limit and the size at 50% maturity would still be eligible for take. If a minimum size limit of 14 inches in the southern management area were to be implemented, approximately 62% of catch could be reduced and projections for immature fish would be realized and see table 16. Table 16 shows the percent reduction to catch. Um, this is not total mortality, it is just catch of copper rockfish by management area under implementation of a 12 inch or 14 inch minimum size limit. And you can see here by management area, there are fewer projected, um, the reduction in catch in the northern areas of the state is less than in the southern areas of the state where the fish on average tend to be smaller. When a minimum size limit is implemented, regulatory discards of fish smaller than the size limit occur and discard mortality increases. Using the recreational fishery DDM rates for copper rockfish as seen in table 14, and the same assumptions used for the sub-bag limit analysis, CDFW calculated projected total mortality of copper rockfish by management area for implementation of a 12 inch or 14 inch minimum size limit, see table 17, and implementation of a one fish sub-bag limit combined with 12 or 14 inch minimum size limits, see table 18. Outside of no retention, this analysis indicated the greatest reduction to projected total mortality of copper rockfish would be the combination of a one fish sub bag limit and a 14 inch minimum size limit statewide with projected impacts of 125.6 metric tons. However, CDFW notes enforcing minimum size limits are extremely difficult. Therefore, between the potential for excess discarding and enforceability issues, CDFW does not recommend proceeding with a minimum size limit to attempt to reduce mortality for rockfish. Again, table 17 shows projected total mortality of copper rockfish by management area under status quo regulations and with implementation of a 12 or 14 inch minimum size limit. So again, with status quo, our statewide mortality would be 181.2 metric tons. With just a 12 inch size limit implemented statewide, we could expect more total mortality of 166.9 metric tons. If a 14 inch minimum size limit is enacted statewide, approximately 148.3 metric tons would be the total mortality. Table 18 shows projected total mortality for copper rockfish by management area under status quo regulations and implementation of a one fish sub bag limit combined with 12 inch or 14 inch minimum size limits. So here again, status quo regulations, we would expect approximately 181.2 metric tons of total mortality statewide. Under just a one fish sub bag limit, we would expect a total mortality of 137.4 metric tons statewide. 
if we combine the one fish sub bag limit and a 12 inch size limit, we could expect approximately 132.3 metric tons of total mortality. So that's only about five metric tons less than just the one fish sub bag limit. If a one fish sub bag limit and the 14 inch minimum size limit were to be combined, total mortality uh, could be expected to be 125.4 metric tons. CDFW plans to monitor catch of copper rockfish weekly in 2022 using the previously established ACV process described above in the Quillback Rockfish section, allowing fishery managers to make additional changes to management measures if catch significantly exceeds projected total mortality. Commercial fishery. Similar to Quillback Rockfish, a deeper nearshore fishery permit is required to harvest copper rockfish in California. Copper rockfish is part of the same minor nearshore rockfish and deeper nearshore trip limits as quillback rockfish, and thus was subject to the same recent trip limit and RCA adjustments. Also, much like quillback rockfish, copper rockfish is an important species in the live fish market. However, due to the distribution of the species, copper rockfish is important to all port areas in California. Table 19 shows that landings of copper rockfish are slightly higher in the central port area, which encompasses Fort Bragg, Bodega Bay, San Francisco, Monterey, and Morro Bay. Yet, as seen in Table 20, the ex-vessel revenue from copper rockfish is significantly higher in the southern port areas, which encompasses Santa Barbara, Los Angeles, and San Diego, where copper rockfish is nearly half of the ex-vessel revenue of the entire deeper nearshore fishery. The number of vessels catching copper rockfish has increased 20% in the northern areas, similar to quillback rockfish. Here we have table 19, which shows recent landings of copper rockfish in the northern, central, and southern areas of the state. The northern area covers Crescent City and Eureka. The central area covers Fort Bragg, Bodega Bay, San Francisco, Monterey, and Morro Bay. The southern area includes Santa Barbara, Los Angeles, and San Diego. These um, landings are by year area and um, are in metric tons. And you can see that uh, landings have increased beginning in or from 2017 through 2020. And the data through 2021 does not include full year data. It was only through uh, September at that point in time. Table 20 shows ex-vessel revenue of copper rockfish and other deeper nearshore rockfish from the dead and live fisheries in the same northern, central, and southern areas um, as were described in Table 19. We can see that in the northern area, um, the ex-vessel revenue for copper rockfish has increased each year in both the um, dead and live categories. In the central area, we see a really similar trend. And in 2020, the um, ex-vessel revenue of the live fish in this central area was over $63,000. In the southern area, the ex-vessel revenue for live fish has ranged from approximately $40,000 per year to over $50,000 per year in 2020. Um, and further down in this table, it shows the percent of copper rockfish ex-vessel revenue of the regional subtotal. So this is the proportion of all deeper nearshore rockfish ex-vessel revenue in each area that copper rockfish um, accounts for. And you can see in the most northern area, it has been um, a smaller amount than in the other areas, but has been increasing in recent years. In the central area, it has ranged um, between six and a little bit about 15% of the total. However, in the south, um, copper rockfish makes up a significant portion of the entire deeper um, nearshore rockfish revenue. Estimates of discards associated with reduced trip limits for copper rockfish were developed using the same methods as for quillback rockfish, but applying species-specific DDMs. 
The assumptions in developing discard mortality estimates are likely to generate overestimates of discards as the fleet tends to be fairly responsive when harvest limits are restricted. As with quillback rockfish, CDFW used the same DDM rates used in the GMT nearshore fishery projection model and used by WITGOP, Table 21. Until additional data can be gathered, CDFW assumes the total estimated mortality projections in Table 22 and Table 23 are what is associated with the proposed lower trip limits. Table 21 shows the commercial depth-dependent discard mortality rates for copper rockfish. Um, there are different rates north and south of 4010 and consistent with the other discard mortality rates that we have presented in this report, uh, fish caught deeper than 30 fathoms are seen to have a 100% discard mortality rate. Table 22 shows proposed sub-trip limit alternatives for copper rockfish in the minor nearshore rockfish trip limit in the area between 42 north latitude and 4010. Um, so we have the three different alternatives that were analyzed, a 50 pound per two month, 75 pound per two month, or 100 pound per two month sub-trip limit. The projected landings under each alternative and there's only 0.2 metric tons difference between the smallest and the largest alternatives analyzed. The discard estimate with mortality rates applied, there's only a 0.1 metric ton difference um, between these alternatives. And then the total estimated mortality, which is the um, addition of the landings projection and the discard estimate with mortality rates. Um, and the um, Totals between the three different alternatives analyzed only differ between 0.1 metric tons. Table 23 shows the proposed sub-trip limit alternatives for copper rockfish in the deeper nearshore trip limit south of 4010. For copper rockfish between 4010 north latitude and 3427, three alternatives were analyzed, um, the same 50 75 and 100 pound per two month trip limits as were analyzed for the Northern area. Um, there's a little bit bigger difference in landings projections in this area. Um, the discard estimate mortality rates um, are also included and the total mortality, there's a 0.2 metric ton difference between the three alternatives. For copper rockfish south of 3427, four alternatives were analyzed no retention, and then the same 50, 75, and 100 pound per two month trip limits as in the other areas of the state. Uh, the same methods were used to generate um, landings projections, discard estimate mortality rates, and total estimated mortality. And between the no retention alternative and the 100 pound per two month alternative, there's only a difference of 0.3 metric tons between all three uh, or all four alternative projections. Combined recreational and commercial impacts for copper rockfish. The combined projected impacts for copper rockfish from both the California recreational and commercial fisheries would depend on the selection of management measure alternatives, table 24. Table 24 is similar to the table that we presented for quillback. It is a matrix, uh, kind of similar to an old multiplication table. We have our recreational alternatives um, going down. They are the, the rows, and then the columns are the commercial alternatives. However, we did not include the no retention alternative for the commercial fishery south of Point Conception here. So to determine the uh, total projected impact under the alternatives, you would choose which recreational alternative you wanted and um, read the line across until you got to the column with the commercial alternative um, that you would like to look at the impacts for. For example, um, for recreational with statewide no retention and a commercial statewide trip limit of 50 pounds per two months, the total uh, projected mortality would be 124.9 metric tons, whereas if a statewide one fish sub bag limit and 14 inch minimum size limit were implemented with the 50 pound per two month uh, commercial trip limit, the total impacts would be 139.9 metric tons. CDFW recommended in-season action for copper rockfish. 
The 2022 projections used in the California copper rockfish length-based data moderate assessments were 113.1 metric tons for the area north of Point Conception and 88.9 metric tons for the area south of Point Conception. For a reduction in total removals, yet still allowing some opportunity in the commercial and recreational fishery, CDFW recommends the Council consider recommending a one fish sub bag limit for the recreational fishery statewide and a 75 pound per two month sub trip limit within the minor nearshore rockfish north of 4010 um, north latitude trip limit. That would be the 42 to 4010 um, north trip limit and the deeper nearshore south of 4010 north, um, north latitude trip limit. Therefore, the new 2022 removals projection for north of Point Conception would be 78 metric tons. And for the area south of Point Conception, the projection would be 73.1 metric tons. CDFW notes that these projected 2022 impacts for south of Point Conception are nearly an order of magnitude greater than the, than the 2023 copper rockfish ABC contribution for this area and that projected impacts even under a no retention scenario are not expected to achieve the 2023 specifications without other regulatory modifications. This analysis suggests that areas or seasonal closures will need to be analyzed in addition to the prohibitions on retention within the 2023-2024 biennial management process. And I will pass it back to Mel Mandra. Yes, thank you. Um, I will go over the uh, trip limit language section. In addition to propose new sub trip limit alternatives, CDFW proposes changes to the minor near shore rockfish and California blackfish rock black rockfish trip limits in the area between that should say 42 and 4010 north latitude and the deeper near shore trip limits south of 4010 north latitude in the federal trip limit tables for limited entry fixed gear north of 4010 uh, as seen in table two north uh, and I put the the link to the that um, federal trip limit there uh, so uh also looking at the limited entry fixed gear south of 4010 trip limit, the open access gears north of 4010 trip limit table, as well as the open access gears south of 4010 trip limit table. Uh, the ta uh, table 25 below shows the status quo trip limit language for the minor near shore rock rockfish and black rockfish trip limits as seen as in table two north and table three north of the uh, federal trip limit tables. And uh, table 26 is the proposed language for the sub limits for both Quillback rock, rockfish and copper rockfish. Uh, and I will note that CDFW understands that NIMS, uh, their GC will run through this in, in a verify language. This is just an attempt to help um, make it a little clearer for the um, commercial fishermen to, to, to understand that, that there's a, especially for the minor nearshore rockfish trip limit between 42 and 4010. Um, by removing that that black rockfish portion of that trip limit to its own uh, line uh, line item uh, on the trip limit table, it would be a little more clearer to understand um, the additional sub trip limits for Quebec rockfish and copper rockfish within that minor nearshore rockfish trip limit. So. Um, in 20, table 25, we have that, that um, status quo trip limit um, that is between 42 and 4010 that is seen um, on the limited entry uh, north 4010 and um, out open access gears north 4010 uh, trip limit tables where uh, it says 7,000 pounds uh, per two months, no more than 2,000 pounds of which may be other than black rockfish um, black rockfish. So the proposal again is to split that out. Um, so black rockfish would have its own trip limit uh, line and then uh, minor near shore rockfish uh, in the area between 42 and 4010 will have its own trip limit 
uh, line in the trip limit table as well. Again, just to an attempt to try and make the language uh, clearer for the reader. Similarly, um, for the deeper near shore trip limits, um, uh, we propose the, the following um, for uh, um, including the quillback and copper uh, rockfish sub trip limits uh, for, um, yeah, for consideration by NIMS. Um, so moving on to vermilion sunset rockfish. Vermilion rockfish is managed as part of the minor shelf rockfish complex south of 4010 north latitude. Total mortality of vermilion rockfish in California's recreational fishery has, has recently been increasing such that the stock's OFL contribution to the complex was exceeded each year from 2015 through 2019. However, the overall ACL com complex, excuse me, however, the overall complex ACL has not been exceeded in any year. And that would be the, the Southern rock Shelf Rockfish Complex. Um, the most recent catch update where recreational estimate estimates are through September and commercial landings are through um, early November. Um, the update of total vermilion rockfish take south of 4010 in 2021 is 228.7 metric tons or 109% of the ACL contribution to the complex ACL as referenced earlier in report one uh, from CDFW. And, in it, and it is expected the OFL contribution to the complex will be exceeded once final 2021 values are available. Under status quo regulations, CDFW expects total mortality of vermilion rockfish in 2022 to be similar to that in 2021. Consideration of additional reductions to vermilion rockfish sub bag limit may be warranted to keep catches from exceeding the OFL or ACL contribution in 2022. And that 2022 OFL contribution would be 269.3 metric tons. And the 2022 ACL contribution would be 209.5 metric tons. As such, CDFW analyzed impacts under a four fish, three fish, and two fish sub bag limit using the bag limit tool available in RECFIN and previously established depth dependent mortality rates. The analysis was conducted under the following assumptions. One, anglers will continue to fish in the same depths and areas. Two, Vermilion rockfish caught in excess of the four fish, three fish, or two fish sub bag catch projections will be discarded. And three, by apportioning the assumed discards to the depths in which vermilion rockfish were historically caught in the recreational fishery, the recreational vermilion rockfish DDMs, uh, which are seen in table 29, could be applied to the apportionments, then summed for a discard estimate. These estimates are likely to generate overestimates of discard mortality as angler behavior will likely change to avoid this species as happened with other species of concern like yellow eye rockfish, cow cod, and canary rockfish. And in table 29, we see the depth dependent mortality rates for vermilion rockfish. In those 10, uh, 10 fathom depth bins, um, similar to the other mortality rates we viewed uh, in this report, the deeper you go, the higher mortality uh, rate is applied. And again, uh, anything over, anything caught deeper than 30 fathoms, it is assumed 100% uh, mortality. Approximately 59% of the vermilion rockfish encounters statewide in the recreational fishery were encountered, were, excuse me, occurred in depths shallower than 30 fathoms, as seen in Table 30. 
mortality rates of less than one mortality rates of less than 100% are applied to these encounters according to the depth depth strata in the in table 29 which we just went over approximately 41% of the vermilion rockfish encounters are in depths greater than 30%, where 100% mortality rate is applied. Projections under the status quo, which is a five fish sub bag limit, within that RCG 10 fish bag limit, and proposed four fish, three fish, and two fish sub bag limit alternatives are shown in table 31. The commercial projection for 2022 is approximately 65 metric tons, and the combined recreational and commercial projections are shown in Table 32. So in Table 31, we have the proportion of total sample vermilion rockfish by 10 fathom death pins uh, from data um, from 20, 20, 2017 through um, mid of 2021. And in those uh, 10 fathom depth bins, uh, you see the proportion of fish sample where greater than 30 fathoms is uh, about 41% of the, 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 the catch. Table 31, projected recreational and total mortality uh, in, in metric tons for vermilion rockfish uh, in, by each California recreational management area uh, is shown um, for under status quo regulations, where uh, it's projected to take uh, 210 metric tons uh, and under a four fish sub bag limit, the estimate or the projection is a uh, uh, 109.7 metric tons under a three fish uh, bag limit, it's 182. 6 metric tons and under a two fish sub bag limit we're looking at 171.6 metric tons and again those those values are statewide projections table three is the combined recreational and commercial impacts for vermilion rockfish south 4010 based on the varying management measures. So similar to what we walked through for copper and quillback, this matrix style um, table where you have your recreational alternatives on, on the, uh, in the rows. And if you follow across, you um, can match it up with the um, commercial status quo value of 65 metric tons. And then we show the difference in the bag limits uh, and then compare those projections to the 22 OFL contribution as well as the 2022 ACL contribution of the shelf complex south of 4010. CDFW recommends in-season action for vermilion rockfish. The, sorry, CDFW recommendation recommended in-season. It's been a long week. CDFW recommended in-season action for vermilion rockfish. A reduction to the, the vermilion rockfish sub bag limit for 2022 may be warranted to keep catches from exceeding the OFL or the ACL contribution. CDFW recommends a four fish sub bag limit under this alternate alternative impacts are projected to exceed the egg sale contribution by almost 20%. However, impacts are projected to remain under the OFL contribution. Further, the largest reduction in projected impacts when comparing a, a sub bag limit decreases from the current five fish sub bag limit to the four fish sub bag limit with savings of 19.3 metric tons. CDFW emphasizes that this proposed in-season action for 2022 is unlikely to be adequate to manage impacts from the recreational fishery under, a, under new specifications for vermilion rockfish in 2023 and additional reductions sh should be expected. Okay, getting there. Uh, CDFW recommendations for 2022 fisheries. 
CDFW reiterates that all projections for 2022 are potentially overestimates of ca as calculations were based on recent fishery performance. Copper and vermilion rockfishes are co-occurring species. Implementation of new and or reduce sub bag limits for these species may encourage anglers to change their behavior to avoid the areas with high encounter rates once the sub, sub bag limits have been reached. This could res result in fewer regulatory discards than projected and estimates of total mortality in 2022 could be lower than projected in this document. Further, these species of concern will be monitored in season and included as line items in the CDFW in season catch track tracking report. That would be report one that we discussed earlier. That is provided every council meeting. Additional and management measures could be implemented in season if catch exceeds or is projected to exceed harvest limits. CDFW recommends the following in-season changes to California's non-trawl fisheries for 2022 with the goal of reducing total mortality for quillback rockfish, copper rockfish, and vermilion rockfish. So to recap, quillback rockfish recommendation, no retention of quillback rockfish in the recreational fishery statewide. Implementation of 75 pounds per two month sub trip limit within the 2000 pound per two month trip limit, um, the minor near shore rockfish trip limit for the area between 42 and 4010 um, north latitude and a 75 pound per two month sub trip limit within that 2000 pound uh, per two month deeper near shore trip limits south of 4010. For copper rockfish, implement a new statewide one fish copper rockfish sub bag limit within the 10 fish daily RCG bag limit. Implement a 75 pound per two month sub trip limit uh, within the 2000 pound minor per two month uh, minor near shore rockfish trip limit for the area between 42 and 4010 and a sub um, and a 75 pound per two month sub trip limit within the 2000 pound uh, per two month deeper near shore trip limit south of 4010 and for vermilion reduce the vermilion rockfish five fish sub bag limit to four fish within the 10 fish RCG bag limit within the recreational fishery statewide. With that, I'd like to take a little breather for myself, but I will be happy to answer any questions. Okay. Thank you, Mel. Questions on the uh, CDFW2 report? Okay. I think. Um, I think you got off um, easy on the questions here, <laughs> not so much on the report. Um, thank you for that, and uh, both Mel and Melanie, and we'll go to the GMT report, uh, one I believe with uh, Whitney Roberts. Whitney. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Whitney Roberts here uh, from the GMT, and I will be reading agenda item E7A, supplemental GMT report one. The Groundfish Management Team report on in-season adjustments, including Pacific Whiting set-asides for 2022 final action. The Groundfish Management Team discussed the current status of groundfish fisheries, requests from industry, and any needs for in-season adjustments during the November 2021 Pacific Fishery Management Council meeting. The GMT may provide an additional supplemental report to discuss and provide recommendations on any remaining proposed adjustments. Under action items, the first one, Pacific Whiting set aside in research activities and the pink shrimp fishery. At each November council meeting, the council adopts a set aside amount of Pacific Whiting to account for incidental catch in research activities and the pink shrimp fishery based on previous year's mortalities. This amount is needed to, set it, to establish the 2021 Whiting fishery allocations and be deducted from the total allowable catch. 
Prior to 2021, 1,500 metric tons of Pacific whiting were set aside to accommodate mortality and research activities and the pink shrimp fishery. However, in 2020, the GMT and Ground Fish Advisory subpanel recommended lowering the 2021 set aside to 750 metric tons to more accurately reflect a declining trend in mortality. The GMT recommends continuing to set the Pacific whiting set aside for research activities and the pink shrimp fishery at 750 metric tons for 2022. Under Sable Fish Daily Trip Limit, each biennium, the Council sets preseason trip limits to reach but not exceed the landings targets for the limited entry fixed gear and open access DTL sectors north of 36 north latitude. These trip limits are frequently adjusted in season because price and participation can cause attainments to vary considerably from projections. The typical approach, as requested by the GAP, is to set conservative trip limits at the beginning of the year and increase them in season if catch amounts are tracking low compared to annual limits. In September 2021, the Council chose to increase the trip limits in season for the limited entry north and open access north sectors, which are reflected in the final 2021 trip limits and regulation and represented in Table 1 as no action for 2022. The 2021 in-season increases were possible because unanticipated low sablefish prices and less than projected fishery participation led to annual landing amounts lower than those projected pre-season. Under even a low price scenario for 2022, the limited entry north sector is projected to land approximately twice the amount of their landed catch share under the no action trip limits of 4,500 pounds per week and 9,000 pounds per two months. The GMT has also received requests and passed in season actions from DTL participants that vessels be able to attain their, month, their bi monthly limit within two weeks instead of three. Thus, the GMT modeled alternative trip limits option one of 2,400 pounds per week and 4,800 pounds per two months and provides the projections under those trip, limit table, trip limits in table two as well as those for a more conservative option two. Additionally, the GMT modeled alternative trip limits for the open access north sector of 2,000 pounds per week and 4,000 pounds per two weeks with a 600 pound per day limit under both alternatives to maintain open access north trip limits that are lower than the limited entry north trip limits as shown in table two. And in table one, you can see the no action and option one trip limits for the limited entry north and open access north sablefish DTL sectors across the six periods of the year. Under limited entry fixed gear north of 36, given that the status quo trip limits would not be sustainable throughout the entire 2022 20, year, the GMT recommends selecting the option one 2022 trip limits of 2,400 pounds per week, not to exceed 4,800 pounds per two months for the limited entry north sector of the DTL fishery. Under option one, the limited entry north sector is projected to attain 99% of their 2022 landed cash share under an average price scenario and 80% of their landed cash share under a low price scenario, as shown in table two and figure one. The GMT provides option two as a more conservative alternative, but notes that selecting option two would result in limited entry north and open access north trip limits of the same value, which is generally avoided. Additionally, prices in 2021 tracked similarly to those in 2020, which were low as a result of market constraints and the COVID-19 pandemic, and prices could continue to fall within the low to average range in 2022. Table 2 shows the options for trip limited adjustments in the limited entry north sector, which includes status quo, option 1, and option 2, as well as their projected landings under two price scenarios, low and average, and attainment as a percent under the low and average price scenarios against the landed cash share. And figure one represents the same statistics, uh, just in graphical format with cumulative projected landings across periods. Under open access north of 36, to keep the open access north trip limits lower than the limited entry north trip limits while still providing enough opportunity for open access north vessels, the GMT recommends selecting the option one 2022 trip limits of 600 pounds per day, 2,000 pounds per week, and 4,000 pounds per two months for the open access north sector of the DTL fishery. Under option one, the open access north sector is projected to attain 70% of their landed cash share under an average price scenario and 52% of under a low price scenario, as shown in table three and figure two. And as I just said, table three represents the options for trip limit adjustments in the open access north sector under status quo and then option one, 
uh, and similar to Lunatry North, provides the projected landings under two price scenarios, low and average, against the landed cash share to give the attainment as a percent under the low and average price scenarios. And again, figure two just represents the same statistics for the open access north uh, sector um, in graphical format. For LINCOD limited entry and open access north of 42 degrees north latitude, a request for increased LINCOD take in the limited entry fixed gear fishery north of 42 degrees north latitude was made before the September 2021 meeting due to the entirety of the 4,000 pounds trip limit being landed within the first two weeks of a trip limit period shown in table four. As of November 19, 2021, LINCOD attainment is 17% for all fisheries, so increasing this trip limit could allow for increased attainment. This request was made because in May of 2020, participants in the tier fishery started encountering more LINCOD than the limit allowed, increasing the number of LINCOD discarded at sea. Therefore, the status quo could potentially result in a continued regulatory discard of LINCOD north of 42 degrees north latitude. We modeled raising the LINCOD trip limit by 1,000 pounds per two months for limited entry and 500 pounds per month for open access, shown in Table 5. We project that raising the limit for all of 2022 will only slightly increase yellow-eye rock rockfish bycatch, less than 0.03 metric tons, for both limited entry and open access under Option 1. Therefore, the GMT recommends Option 1 implementation in 2022 because higher trip limits are expected to reduce regulatory discard and provide additional opportunity for some industry members already in the fishery. The GMT still believes that 1,000 extra pounds per two months is less likely to entice new effort than a higher limit, which will help minimize increased discarding of or increased targeting of lingcod and associated yellow eye rockfish bycatch. Table four represents status quo and alternative trip limit options for lingcod north of 42 across the different periods under status quo and option one. Table five shows projected impacts compared to the non trawl allocation for LINCOD north of 42 uh, under option status quo and one. Uh, short spine thorny head open access north of 34 degrees 27 north latitude. The GMT considered increasing the short spine thorny head north of 34 degrees 27 north latitude limit from 50 pounds per month to 100 pounds per month for the open access sector. However, given the lack of information, the GMT is not recommending making an adjustment to the short spine thorny head north latitude trip limit at this time. Moving on to informational items at sea set asides. Except for the short spine thorny head north of 34 degrees north latitude, sorry, 27 north latitude, all stocks with an at sea set aside are under 60% of their 2021 set aside as of November 15, 2021. Short spine thorny had exceeded its set aside by 8% as of that date, but attainment of the stock has been generally low in recent years, and the GMT does not consider this minor exceedance to pose any risk to the ACL. Industry noted that this exceedance is largely due to changes in vessel operations to avoid other non ground fish species, such as jack mackerel, as the sector experiences larger than anticipated bycatch. Under stable fish DTL, limited entry fixed gear south of 36 degrees north latitude. Sable fish prices per pound in the limited entry fixed gear sector of the DTL fishery south of 36 degrees north latitude have been tracking slightly lower in 2021 than 2020. However, 2020 prices in the limited entry south sector do not appear to be as heavily impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic as those of the limited entry north sector. The council increased the limited entry south trip limits from 2,000 pounds per week to 2,500 pounds per week in the 2021-22 harvest specification cycle and there have been no adjustments to the status quo 2,500 pounds per week limit in 2021. There is no daily or bi-monthly limit for this sector. The GMT did not receive any requests to adjust the trip limit for 2022, and the sector is projected to attain 28%, 162 metric tons of their 572 metric ton landed, share, landed cash share in 2022. Open access south of 36 degrees north latitude. Sable fish prices per pound in the open access fixed gear sector of the DTL fishery south of 36 degrees north latitude have generally been tracking lower than previous years. However, landings in 2021 as of November 19 will still far, was, while still far below the 435 metric ton landed cash share, are tracking higher in 2021 than in 2019 or 2020, which were the lowest year, years since at least 2011, as shown in figure third, three. 
Infrastructure limitations south of 36 degrees north latitude continue to be a constraint. The GMT did not receive any requests to adjust the existing 2,000 pounds per week and 6,000 pounds per two month trip limits. Figure three shows the annual landings and metric tons in the open access sector from 2011 to 2021, noting that 2021 landings are through November 19, 2021. Chinook salmon scorecard. Table six shows Chinook salmon catch from ground fish fisheries and exempted fishing permits as of November 19, 2021 in relation to the sector thresholds. Table seven shows the breakdown of catch from the trial gear modification EFP. Um, moving on, short belly rockfish scorecard. As of November 19, 2021, a total of 416.1 metric tons of short belly rockfish is estimated to have been taken in 2021. Table eight provides the estimated mortality by sector. And that's shown below in table eight. Uh, one difference from past in-season reports that I will note is that the GMT chose to add the threshold of 2000 metric tons that the council adopted to the table as a reference against the total mortality. Uh, rebuilding species scorecard, appendix one shows the updated 2021 and draft 2022 rebuilding species scorecards for yellow eye rockfish. And then summary of recommendations, the GMT recommends the council adopt 750 metric ton Pacific whiting set aside for research activities and the pink shrimp fishery for 2022 for the sable fish DTL fishery, limitatory north, option one, 2022 trip limits of 2,400 pounds per week, not to exceed 4,800 pounds per two months. Open access north, option one, 2022 trip limits of 600 pounds per day, 2,000 pounds per week, and 4,000 pounds per two months. And for link cod north of 42 degrees north latitude, limited entry north, option one, 2022 trip limit of 5,000 pounds per two months and open access north option one 2022 trip limit of 2,500 pounds per two months. And as I said, appendix one shows the rebuilding species scorecard for yellow eye rockfish. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you, Whitney. Um, questions on the GMT report one? Uh, Corey Niles, Corey. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair, and thanks, Whitney. It was nice of you all to not make Mel read that report. Um, I guess I'll start off, well, for th thank you for all the hard work, but on table eight, I was, um, just thank you for uh, um, just noting that you all are tracking short belly and against that, the 2000 metric ton threshold um, that the council discussed last cycle. So that's appreciated. But I do have a question for you all on the, um, the Sable Fish DTL limited entry north discussion. I, I guess looking at page, what page is this? This is page two of the report. Um, I guess as you reminded us in September, we we increased the the, the trip limits uh, quite a bit. For the for the the last two periods of the year, for September through December, and I know I think I'm pretty sure the models you all use, you know, use data from however long it is, ten years or so, and the pandemic conditions have um, thrown a lot of these patterns that that the model depends on for a loop here. So I'm kind of wondering, you know, if you know, if um, we're all hoping 2022. Is a normal year, and then we see the projections you give us, and in that figure one, um, we see. I see what your the worry worry is about um, the current the current limits being way too high. Um, but I guess what I'm worrying about with is is the goal of making sure that opportunities are are pretty fair throughout the year, and that we don't you know some areas of the coast can fish later in the year than others. So I wonder if you had any thoughts, and maybe I'll try to remember to ask this. Come come April or, or June, but um, if if early 2022 looks like it's not too different, um, are you seeing a way that we can maybe not wait till September uh, to need to to bump them up? And maybe a April or June, we we'd have enough um, enough signal in the from the from the fishery where where we could spread out the uh, bump them up for for longer periods of of the year instead of just those last two periods. 
so yeah, anything, any, any insights you have there, um, how you see maybe the model, um, you looking at it differently in, in 2022, um, compared to what we did in 2021. And let me, let me, I can ask, I can restate that more succinctly if you're not catching my question there. Hey, the vice chair. Thank you, Mr. Niles, for the question. Um, I think I do actually understand uh, what you're getting at. And um, maybe it's good that Mel didn't read this report, too, because she probably would have had to phone a friend for me anyways, um, if this is the only question. Um, yeah, so the limited entry north model does, as you said, use uh, essentially the last decade worth of data um, in terms of price and participation in the sector. Um, and thinking about early 2022 um, ways in which we could try to uh, assess the status of the fishery um, and how it compares to COVID impacts um, is that we do incorporate actual landings to date every time we run the model throughout the year um, and especially those cum cumulative projection graphs that um, we put in our in-season report um, incorporate as we go throughout the year, it incorporates actual landings against projections for the remainder of the year. Um, and we can look at how actual landings um, as of you know, March or April or whatever um, are tracking against uh, pre-COVID times versus COVID times um, and see if impacts from COVID are still being felt uh, against prices and landings and participation. Um, and so that's one way is just looking at um, actual trends to that date um, against what number one, the model would project uh, versus what uh, we would see in years prior to 2020. Um, another option, and this is potentially a more longer term option, um, is looking at year waiting to see if, uh, if waiting a more recent year such as 2020 and 2021 um, would provide more accurate uh, retroactive projections for those years um, and seeing if that uh, matches what actual uh, trends we're seeing in 2022 as well. So um, I hope that helps answer your question. And it's certainly something that the GMT can keep in mind in the start of 2022 when we um, start looking at this model again to, to see how um, the fishery is, is tracking and how we might think about um, any tweaks to the model to make sure that it's capturing impacts from COVID. And I uh, hope that answered your question, Corey. Yeah, thank you, Whitney. No, uh, good to hear. Very, very thoughtful thoughts um, and have confidence that you all look at next year closely. So appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, Corey, thank you. Further uh, questions for the uh, GMT? Uh, Marcy Urimko. Marcy? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Whitney. Uh, I want to echo Corey's thanks to the GMT, as always, for the very useful reporting on the uh, informational items. Um, just want to point our attention to the uh, rebuilding species scorecard in Appendix 1 for yellow eye rockfish. And um, some of you probably recall in uh, cycles past how complicated this table became uh, when we had numbers of overfished species. Um, but I guess my question. Um, for Whitney is um, looking ahead a little bit uh, and also looking ahead to um, our actions under uh, specifications um, and management measures that uh, we'll be um, taking um, in the spring and then final action in June. Um, just wondering um, if you've got some work in progress uh, on revisions to the scorecard to um, incorporate um, quillback rockfish, um, if, if you've started any thinking about that, because I'm looking at these um, set asides and allocations and um, just wondering about that process. Thanks. Through the vice chair, thank you, Ms. Yermko, for the question. Um, we did not discuss that at this meeting, um, but we do fully acknowledge um, the need to look forward at that for Quillback um, and Copper. And so um, the, maybe 
the process has started in the background, but we have not um, discussed that at the the November meeting. So, but I will certainly um, say that I'm sure it's being thought of, uh, just has not been discussed and we will make sure to get the ball rolling on that um, as soon as we possibly can. Uh, through the vice chair, thank you so much, Whitney. That was exactly uh, what I was hoping to hear and appreciate the thinking that's uh, already starting there in the background. Much appreciated. Okay, thank you, Marcy. Further questions? Okay, um, next we'll go to Katie Pearson and the um, GMT report too. Katie. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, for the record, my name is Katie Pearson, and I will be reading agenda item E7A, Supplemental GMT Report 2. The Groundfish Management Team received an overview of the contents of agenda item E7A, Supplemental California Department of Fish and Wildlife, CDFW, Report 2, from CDFW staff and concur with the contents. Therefore, the GMT recommends that the council adopt the following re recommendations that are outlined in agenda item E7A, Supplemental CDFW Report 2, November 2021, for the following in-season changes to California's non-trawl fisheries for 2022. Quillback rockfish south of 4010 uh, north latitude, no retention of quillback rockfish in the recreational fishery statewide, Implement a third no. Nope, implement a 75 pound uh, per two months sub trip limit to to the 2,000 pound two month minor nearshore rockfish trip limit for the area between 42 and 4010 north latitude, and a 75 pound per two month sub trip limit to the 2,000 pound per two month deeper nearshore trip limit south of 4010. Copper rockfish south of 4010 uh, north latitude. Implement a new statewide one fish uh, copper rockfish sub bag limit within the 10 fish daily RCG bag limit. Implement a 75 pound per two month sub trip limit to the 2000 pounds per two month minor nearshore rockfish trip limit for the area between 42 to 40. Uh, 10 north latitude and a 75 pound per two month uh, sub trip limit to the 2000 pound per two month deeper near shore trip limit south of 4010. Vermilion sunset rockfish south of 4010 north latitude. Reduce the vermilion rockfish five fish sub bag limit to four fish within the 10 fish daily RCG uh, bag limit within the recreational fishery statewide. And that concludes this report. All right. Thank you, Katie. Um, questions for Katie on GMT report two. Uh, Marcy Rimko. Marcy? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Katie. Um, just a question of clarification um, on the three main bullets in the report on, on quillback rockfish south of 4010, copper rockfish south of 42 and or 4010, and vermilion south of 4010. Um, I'm just wondering if if um, the phrase there south of 4010 is um, uh, aligns with the recommendations that fall below. Um, for example, the first bullet says no retention statewide, and then the second bullet says um, the area between 42 and 4010, and then the area south of 4010. So I just um, want to make sure that we can disregard that south of 4010 reference in each of those three headers. Through the vice chair, thank, thank you, Mr. Remco. Um, you are absolutely right. I think that was an error uh, made uh, late in, in the evening. Um, the recommendations are uh, follow what is in the bullets. Okay, thank you very much. I, I certainly understand. Okay, thank you, Marcy. Um, further questions? Okay, 
Thank you, Katie. Um, that'll take us to the uh, GAP report and uh, Gary Ricker. Yeah, good yeah. afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Vice Chair. Let me we got you. A, yeah, I, I, I'm slow. Um, bear with me, folks. There's stuff in here that's not going to be right. Uh, I'll try to fix it as we go along. Read from agenda item E7A, supplemental GAP report one. Ground Fish Advisory Subpanel Report on Consideration of In-Season Adjustments, including Pacific Whiting Set-Asides for 2022. The GAP met with the Ground Fish Management Team to discuss progress of this year's fishery and possible in-season adjustments. The GMT discussion was led by Ms. Melissa Mandra, Ms. Whitney Roberts, and Ms. Katie Pearson. The GAP offers the following recommendations and comments on proposed in-season adjustments to ongoing fisheries. For 2022 Lincoln trip limits, the fixed gear industry had requested an increase in the Lincoln trip limits north of 42 north latitude for the remainder of 2021 and wish to continue those trip limits for the 2022 season. Fixed gear fishermen have noted that most of their entire allocation of Lincoln has been taken during the first two weeks of the fishing period, thus has led to regulatory discards of Lincoln. The GMT analysis suggests by a catch of yellow eye would increase only slightly with increased trip limits of Lincoln in the area north of 42 north latitude. Working from the supplemental GMT report one, the GAP recommends the following for open access fixed gear Lincoln north 42 north latitude. Uh, GAP supports option one, which would increase it to 2,500 pounds a month as soon as is possible in 2022. For limited entry fixed gear north of 42 north latitude, GAP supports GMT option one, which would increase it to 5,000 pounds every two months as soon as is possible in 2022. Looking at Sablefish daily trip limit for 2022, at the September council meeting, the DTL trip limits were increased substantially for both open access and limited entry fixed gear fleets for the remainder of the 2021 fishing season. Those final 2021 trip limits are not sustainable for carrying over to start the 2022 season. Thus, adjustments need to be made at this meeting. And working from the supplemental GMT report one, table one, GAP recommends the following. For open access DTL fixed gear sablefish north of 36 north latitude, GAP supports GMT option one, 600 pounds day, a day or one landing per week, 2,000 pounds, not to exceed 4,000 pounds every two months. For limited entry DTL fixed gear sablefish north of 36 north latitude, GAP supports GMT option one of 2,400 pounds a week, not to exceed 4,800 pounds every two months. For open access thorny heads north of 34 27 north latitude, open access fixed gear fishermen north of 34 27 north latitude requested a trip limit increase for short spine thorny heads for 2022. A new trip limit increase was just implemented at the start of this year, and the GMT needs more time to better analyze the impacts of that new trip limit. No increase is supported at this time. For CDFW recommendations for 2022 fisheries, the GAP reviewed supplemental CDFW report two regarding in-season adjustments for the 2022 fishing season. The GAP was quite impressed with the in-depth analysis contained within this document as it relates to copper rockfish, quillback rockfish, and vermilion rockfish. The report suggests several different options for industry to consider to better achieve reductions in total mortality of copper, quillback, and vermilion rockfishes in 2022. The GAP notes these species of concern will be closely monitored in season and that adjustments in management measures can and will be implemented in season should catch projections exceed harvest limits. And uh, working from CDFW Supplemental Report 2, GAP recommends the following. In-season adjustments to California's non-trawl fisheries for 2022. Now, please scratch that referencing table eight and nine. You're going to spend a whole lot of time looking for it. Matching it up with uh, what I've got here. Uh, the GAP recognizes the need for the following recommendations in the CDFW report. And quillback rockfish, no retention of quillback rockfish in the recreational fishery statewide. Uh, next, implement a 75 pounds per two months sub trip limit to the 2,000 pound two month minor nearshore rockfish north of 4010 north latitude to 42 degrees north latitude in the commercial fishery. Implement a 75 pounds 
per two months sub trip limit to the 2000 pounds, two month deeper near shore trip limit south of 4010 North latitude in the commercial fishery. Please scratch referencing tables 23 and 24. GAP acknowledges the CDFW recommendations as follows for copper rockfish. Implement a new statewide one fish copper rockfish sub bag limit within the 10 fish daily RCG bag limit. Next, implement a 75 pounds per two month sub trip limit to the 2000 pound two month minor near shore rockfish commercial fishery north of 4010 north latitude. And that would be from 4010 to uh, 42 degrees, by the way. And then lastly, implement a 75 pounds two months sub trip limit to the 2000 pound two month deeper near shore commercial fishery trip limits south of 4010 north latitude. Uh, next, again, Please scratch referencing table 30. GAP recognizes the need for a CDFW recommendation as follows for vermilion rockfish. Reduce the vermilion rockfish five fish sub bag limit to four fish within the 10 fish daily rockfish cabazon greenling bag limit within the recreational fishery statewide. And lastly, under Pacific whiting set asides, Council is scheduled to adopt yield set-asides to accommodate the incidental mortality of Pacific whiting in 2022 research activities and in the pink shrimp fishery. GAP supports selecting a value of 750 metric tons of Pacific whiting for the 2022 research and pink shrimp set-asides. And Mr. Vice Chair, that completes our GAP statement and I'm reckoning I'm gonna have some questions. Uh, thank you, Gary. Uh, questions for Gary on the uh, GAP report? Uh, Corey Niles. Corey. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. And uh, Gary, probably not the questions you're expecting, but thinking of the question I asked the GMT and Whitney on the, um, you know, what's going to happen in 2022 for sable fish versus, you know, up in the limits late in the year here. Do you have any uh, any insight during your discussions on what you all think of the gap and what, what might be happening in 2022, if you have any, any crystal ball type thoughts, or uh, is it just is, is it just open, I mean, totally unknown in your minds of what's going to, what markets are going to do next year? Yeah, Mr. Vice Chair, Corey, yeah, uh, you know, we talked to Alverson a lot, trying to get a grip on what the prices may be, uh, what, you know, overseas market may be, stuff like that, and not looking too good right now. So, I, you know, I'm guessing we can't even give you a best guess for next year. Uh, with COVID, you know, COVID may be bouncing around again next year. looks like it's making another comeback. So it's totally up in the air, Corey, honestly. Okay. Uh, further questions uh, for the gap? Uh, Corey. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Not seeing any other hands pop up. I had, I guess I had one more and I don't know, Gary, if you had a phone a friend on this one, but on, on the whiting set of sides, um, I'm a little bit not, not, oh, I'm happy to see that you're, everyone's okay with 750 metric tons, but looking at the time series here, it looks like it's been a, a while since catches have got anywhere near that, that number. Um, yeah, I don't know if, if I, not to put you on the spot, it's not your sector, but is, is the thinking that, uh, we're going to see more surveys next year and so we, we are more likely to get closer to that 750 metric ton number yeah mr vice chair Corey. yeah i i would always defer to mr waldeck on it i recall us talking about this last year and the same question came up at least within the gap and we just decided to stick with the 750 metric tons uh beyond that i would have to defer to dan and i don't even know if he's on here Let's. That's okay. okay. Appreciate it. Thank you, Gary. Yeah. Sorry, Corey. I didn't have anything more for you, but no, that's good. Thanks. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Actually, I see uh, Dan Waldeck has his hand up. Dan. Well, sure. Um, you guys picking me up? We do. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the question. Now, through the vice chair and, and Mr. Niles, um, you know, the gap did not spend a great deal of time talking about the 750 metric tons for whiting. Obviously, we had. Uh, a full plate of other um, stressing and important issues to talk about. Um, Mr. Richter's right. We did spend some time talking about it last year, and, and that was where we, we went from 1,500 down to 750. 
750 seemed like a, a, a fair reduction from the, the higher 1500 metric tons. Um, I don't think we spent a lot of time thinking about it for this year, other than the fact that that 750 still seemed like a reasonable amount. Um, you know, I think if if you're thinking about a, a lower number, I, I think the, the gap would support that. There's, there's probably logic in that, given, as you've said, attainment in the open access in incidental fisheries and research has been very low. And so if the council were looking to um, reduce that amount, I think the gap would support that. There's probably a rationale for it, but the gap didn't talk about it. All right, thank you, Dan. Okay, further discussion? All right. Um, thank you, Gary and Dan. Um, before we go to public comment, we're going to go to a break. Um, probably be, we're almost two hours here. And so um, 10 minutes, and we'll see everybody back here at, uh, well, it'll be 2.40 here in a second, so 2.50.
Okay. okay. We're back in session on E7, uh, public comment. Um, we have originally six names, but uh, Tom Martin <laughs> has uh, declined to testify. So we're, we have uh, five. And um, we'll start off with Bill James. Bill. Okay, um, don't see Bill there, so um, uh, we'll go to uh, Jamie Diamond. Jamie? Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Uh, we can. Oh. Chairman and council members, I am here to speak with you regarding copper rockfish. My name is Jamie Diamond. I own Stardust and Coral Sea Sport Fishing Vessels and Santa Barbara Landing out of Santa Barbara, California. I'm on the board of directors for the Sport Fishing Association of California. Out of respect for your time, I'm going to be the only person speaking on behalf of the Sport Fishing Association and, his, and its members. The Magnuson-Stevenson Act says to manage using best available science. Beyond best available science, the Act also says we must take into consideration the economic hardship on a community. Specifically, National Standard 7B, alternative management measures. Management measures should not impose unnecessary burdens on the economy, on individuals, on private or public organizations, or on federal, state, or local governments. Factors such as fuel costs, enforcement costs, or the burdens of collecting data may well suggest a preferred alternative. Also, National Standard 2.2, scientific information that is used to inform decision making should include an evaluation of its uncertainty and identify gaps in the information. Management decisions should recognize the biological, ecological, sociological, and economic, i.e. loss of fishery benefits, risks associated with the sources of uncertainty and gaps in scientific information. We as a fleet are going to incur increased fuel costs with having to fish deeper, moving frequently to avoid copper and vermilion rockfish, reduction in passengers due to lack of access to desirable fish in the bag, we are facing inflation and increasing ticket prices while at the same time having to offer a reduced product to our customers. This also impacts data collection. How can surf samplers observers get any accurate data on copper rockfish if we're actively avoiding them? Furthermore, there are no numbers for off the top reductions on copper or quillback to be used for valuable data collection needed to write the ship, if you will. I understand a placeholder is being written in for research in the IOA, but how on earth can we be expected to move forward without the ability to capture this information now? I will reiterate, I haven't had time to calculate solid numbers, but once again, back of the napkin math says we're looking at a potential lost revenue of 60 million statewide for rec and commercial. Worst case would be loss of boats and landings from the larger LA area to the Oregon border. Most in the advisory bodies and on the council seem to acknowledge the disaster of this obviously incomplete data moderate assessment. This is far too damaging to the entire California fisheries, both rec and commercial. When an assessment is this far off, the council needs to have the ability to table it and come up with a better plan. In fact, the council does have this discretion and has done this before several times in its history. There is precedent. The system is intended to be introspective, yet this does not come across as such to stakeholders and rarely seems to happen. NIMFS is required to provide the council with all the information and data needed to make decisions. A lack of data such as what has happened here, specifically missing, biased, and outdated data should void any action until a proper data-rich full assessment can be done. And until then, we need to go off the previous assessment information. We the fishermen have huge mistrust with recent assessments. The collection of data has not been sufficient. For example, surf's data in this assessment came from the most underrepresented areas of the species. The bulk of the fish living in the MPAs, CCAs, and outside RCAs have not been captured in any data set, and it's as if these fish don't exist according to the assessment. We the fishermen want to work with you all, the council, NIMPS, NOAA, CDFW, on creating the best assessment program for ground fish instead of piecemealing data together that leaves huge gaps and too much room for uncertainty. I would also ask NIMPS to work with the Ocean Protection Council, who through their goal to look to financially support fisheries research, quote, 
Through active collaboration and coordination with other state agencies, OPC seeks to advance systemic scientific research, policies, and restoration projects that reflect the interdependence of people and natural systems as a shared community. This seems quite important hearing research programs like CCFRP may not have funding for next year. My first ask is that you do table the data moderate copper rockfish assessment. My second ask is if you are unwilling to do so, please create a preferred alternative allowing us to keep two rock, two copper and four vermilion and allow the use of descending device credits similar to cow cod yellow eye and, uh, and canary because they are similar in their, their biology as far in their physiology, pardon me. This is what we need to survive. In the inevitable event, you vote for one copper and four vermilion. I'm again asking you to prepare initial steps for a disaster declaration to open fisheries relief funds for the fleet who will be severely impacted by this decision. Thank you for your time and I am available for questions. Thank you, Jamie. Um, questions for Jamie on her testimony? Thank you, Jamie. Um, next up is uh, Bill James. Um, Bill? Oh, hello. Um, uh, 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 Councilman uh, uh, Pettinger, members of uh, uh, everybody there, I'm really sorry. I, I just realized I was here and I was outside and had to run in. So anyway, uh, in continuing a little bit on Jess and Jamie's uh, um, idea of uh, tabling it, you know, when we had the, with the uh, mop-up uh, committee meeting, uh, which was just held, you know, the, the agenda came out and it had public comment after they made the decision that Every every uh, meeting that I have been to, you're required to put public comment before uh, the decision. So that should give you an idea, why, uh, another idea of throwing it out, because that's not right. You know, I you know I went there especially with data prepared to talk to these guys to see if they could see it another way rather than this. Oh, it's put down in the in the terms of reference. You know, and speaking to the terms of reference, I was under the uh, uh, information that it wasn't going to be used for management, and and apparently a couple of years ago that was changed. But I don't remember that coming to gap and being um, discussed that we were going to have to put um, deal with uh, data moderate where it affects uh, um, management right away. Because here this is, I mean, this just happened. And now we're getting nailed. You certainly don't give us a lot of fish as soon as it comes back. You know, it's, um, it's just unfortunate, really unfortunate. We've spent, I, I've spent hundreds of hours working the data and so is uh, Tom Marking and uh, Dan Platten and I and Harrison have all talked, trying to get the language right so you know what gears we're gonna use. It's, it's simple to us, but you know, again, it's, slightly different than the gears that are in that are written down and you have to look those up and just immense amount of time and then they come to this where we get sports get one fish and we get we get uh you know 50 pounds or 75 or whatever whatever that is and then the scare of 10 fish north and south of 40 10 it's just mind-boggling and how do you expect us to continue and continue and continue to go to the meeting, offer and do all the work that we have to do. Um, and we're not we're not full time employees like um, a lot of you know obviously the state and federal folks. So um, something has to change. I missed C four um, because I was so busy working with this, but that's where you know they discuss uh, on how to how to do a, um, the research and stuff like that. And it was, and I see it's a, it's a real top level up there. And why not have somebody from GAP 
they're suggesting what to do or where to do it. Growback basically is, is a north of 4010 stock. It's only slightly available in Fort Bragg and really, really comes down. And why are we doing a stock assessment on only at, where it's only in a quarter of the state? And we're doing the stock assessment on a quarter of the fish that are in the quarter of the state that they are. Because 80% of the biomass is outside where we fished since 2000. So it, uh, it's just, and then we don't have the data. I, it just had to turn out bad. And it's, it's so, so bad, I just cannot believe it. I mean, it's not fair. It really just is not fair. And it's not pragmatic to continue down this line. You know, so I, I'm really for, let's throw this assessment out if we can. Minimize, you know, there's always a, things you can do with a P-star or whatever, sigma or whatever, to back us down on quillback until we get the right data. But, but as a essential, and I was going to talk under in-season about this, is get the data that we need, at least list it, find out how much it's going to cost, and send it out where we go get the money. I mean, I get, I, you know, there isn't anybody I don't think that would want to pitch in and help get the, the, the data. You know, the sending devices, why can't, there's been a new, a new research project on the sending devices that really got into how certain fish react and it's, you know, they left them in containers at the bottom of the ocean for a long time. So to say that we can't get any extra and that, that mortality is set, man, we can't do that when we spend all this time. I mean, they were getting, uh, they were getting, um, Picaccio is 90% of the time to live. I mean, that's amazing, the Picaccio. So, um, quills and coppers, you know, again, maybe we're not releasing them down far enough, but if you get them down, they're going to stay down. So, um, let's get the information, at least we'll, to know whether we can or can't get better um, uh, percentage of uh, uh, more, you know, the fish that live because one big fish is, in the right time can make an awful lot of babies so I'm going to stop there and let other people talk because I, I've spoken enough and I can go on with different parts of this for, for days talking about it where things are wrong and uh, I really appreciate the council um, uh, listening to me and um, especially um Maggie for putting all this stuff together and helping us get the right language because you know 48 is um, hook and line vertical hook and line is different you know the idea was things to be uh, uh, fastened to the bottom you know that kind of thing well so we I think we've got that out of the way for 48 to understand that we're not we, we, we have eliminated all the bad gear that could possibly put us into trouble, and we're just leaving the best stuff. So, again, I thank you. Any questions? Uh, questions for Bill? Okay, thanks, Bill. Uh, next up is uh, Jason Diamond. Jason? Hi, I'm Jason Diamond from Stardust Sport Fishing in the Coral Sea here in Santa Barbara. And I just want to talk about how, how difficult this is going to be for a lot of us, especially up here, because we have a ton of coppers and reds up here. We catch so many every day. Fishing is so good for them. We haven't seen a surf sampler in two years, which is weird because... I mean, this is kind of where the stuff lives, the Channel Islands area and stuff. So there's areas where we have to fish sometimes that um, we, in bad weather, like offshore, like the Channel Islands, if that weather's bad, we have to fish up the coast, the Gaviota Coast. That's almost straight coppers and reds. And um, that's going to be kind of like a closed area because that's all there is to catch up there. We'll catch our four reds and our one copper in like two seconds. I mean, it, you know, I mean, it's really good up there. And 
being a fisherman, a guy that runs the boat all the time, I'm going to be scratching my head after that. What else am I going to catch? Where else am I going to go? So I'm going to have to move around a lot to try to catch, you know, salmon grouper and stuff like that and, and all kinds of other fish like that, which is going to take a long time, burn a lot of fuel. And hopefully those fish are biting and fired up at that time. But it kind of reduces our, 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 our area. And I, I'd hate to have to cancel trips and tell people, oh, we can't fish because of our, we can't fish up there because of our regulations. We wouldn't give you a good trip. So we're going to be letting go a lot of copper rock fish, like a ton. We'll have to make gannions of barotrauma devices to let those things go. It's almost impossible to see your numbers that are accurate. I mean, seriously, nobody's, nobody's done anything up here to speak of. No, no surveys, no surf samplers for virtually two years. So I don't know where your, your data came from, but it didn't come from an area up here that's thriving with copper rockfish and reds and stuff. And I want to thank you for your time. And I'll take any questions that you have right now. Um, questions for Jason? Um, Phil Anderson? Phil? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. And, um, thanks very much, Jason, for your testimony. Um, I'm from up north, so I'm not as familiar with your uh, current rockfish limits. Could, could you describe for me what your current rockfish limits are and Give me a sense of um, your relative catch per unit effort. I mean, are you do you typically limit, or if it's, or you get eighty percent of your limit, or how? Can you just give me a sense of your current situation? I'd say fifty percent plus is copper rockfish. We have a ten fish bag limit as well. Okay, thank, thanks, Jason. Uh, further questions for Jason? Okay, thank you, Jason. Thank you. See, see Thomas Marking, or Tom Marking is, uh, is passed on his testimony. So we have um, <laughs> Dan Wolford, Dan? Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, can you hear me all? We can. Excellent. Uh, Mr. Vice Chairman, Council Members, my name is Dan Wolford. I'm speaking here today on behalf of the Coastside Fishing Club. Uh, we're an all-profit, <laughs> an all-volunteer, nonprofit organization with more than 7,000 members dedicating to improving the recreational fishing experience for Californians. I want to first start off by saying I really appreciated the comments from uh, Jamie Diamond. I thought she was right on right on top. Um, since I was last part of the council, we've had some pretty good times and some bad times, and today is one of those bad ones. Our salmon are in trouble because there isn't enough spawning habitat to sustain their once abundant numbers. Our crab opportunities are severely impacted by the abundance of rebounding whale populations. And our ground fish are being managed with insufficient and out-of-date information, which brings me to my purpose here today. It is particularly troubling that three species of groundfish, copper, quillback, and vermilion, are about to severely restrict recreational groundfish in California after years of sacrifice on the part of the recreational and commercial sectors to rebuild the disaster situation from 20 years ago. We did what we had to do then, and we will step up and do what we have to do now but we need the council and NIMPS to step up and do what they need to do to prevent this from happening again and again. Too many times, NIMPS and the council have used the excuse of being overworked and underbudgeted to put aside essential tasks like prompt data collection and analysis, stock assessments, and innovation to avoid bycatch mortality. We all need to work harder to ensure that managing our fisheries is properly prioritized, funded, and focused in order to keep the fisheries alive. Without that, we are about to die. These three species of fish need the attention of nymphs 
to ensure that the data and analysis is available to support robust stock assessments in order to have meaningful management objectives. As it is, insufficient data and analysis resources result in conservative management measures that in all likelihood are overly restricted and are about to artificially constrain our fishery. Additionally, lack of data and supporting analysis resources result in setting management objectives for complexes of fish rather than individual species. But when it is time to actually manage them, we immediately drop down to the species level and create a crisis which does not exist at the complex level. We need to fix this and either manage at the complex level consistent with our data and analysis resources or dramatically increase those resources so that we can fully manage at the species level. Continuing as we are is impacting the fisheries we are obliged to protect and enhance. Neither the fish nor the fishermen are getting a fair shake out of this. Specifically, COSIDE reluctantly accepts narrowly restricting individual subquotas in the recreational fishery to constrain the catch of these three fish. We are, however, particularly dismayed by the continued dismissal on the part of CDFW to include as a reasonable management measure the use of descending devices to reduce discard mortality that would be associated with the increased regulatory discards that are going to come with these subquotas. Descending devices can reduce discard mortality at all depths to something close to that, close to that observed in less than 10 fathoms of water. By including the effectiveness of such mortality reduction in the analysis, it may be possible to greatly reduce the magnitude of the restrictions being proposed. And here again, we're struggling to manage without the robust data resources of depth-based mortality of individual species of groundfish. Instead, it will be necessary to use a proxy from the few species for which actual data does exist. We urge the state and the council to mandate the use of descending devices for regulatory discards in all depths greater than 10 fathoms, and to incorporate those savings into the supporting analysis to minimize the magnitude of the restrictions. And yes, a mandate of these devices is necessary, as even I, the primary pusher behind this concept, am sometimes lack in my use. It is not sufficient to rely on the good intentions of concerned fishermen. Other states can mandate it, why not California? The state must take some responsibility to correct the situation we are in, rather than simply pushing restrictions onto the fishing public to absolve the state of its responsibility. In short, we urge the state, the council, and NIMPS to step up and do what they need to do in order to shoulder their share of the responsibility for correcting the situation. Recreational and commercial fishermen will do our part, but do not put the entire burden on us. The primary issue is not the behavior of fishermen, but rather the lack of resources and innovative management measures to adequately manage the fishery. The fishery. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, questions for Dan on his testimony? Uh, Marcy Uramko, Marcy? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Dan. Um, I appreciate you taking the time out of your Sunday to to come uh, visit with us. Um, it's it's really nice to hear your voice, and um, thank you for um, coming back and sharing uh, some perspective with us um, from your time here. Um, and we appreciate your um, involvement and uh, your thoughts. Um, just want to, um, I guess encourage and invite you um, to participate in some additional discussions that will happen over winter. Um, you brought up um, depth dependent mortality um, and descending devices. And um, I believe that um, you'll be pleased that um, we definitely are taking a look at that. Um, I think if you stick around for some of the discussion in E5, uh, you might hear a little more about that, um, we have pulled together um, some information to help inform us um, on a species basis what appropriate um, depth dependent mortality rates might be for the species in question. Um, so examining that is on our priority list. We've already started work um, in the background uh, in the in the department to see what we can do about providing um, some uh, 
some accounting for fish that are released uh, in shallower depths um, using depth um, using the depth dependent mortality uh, strata and um, applying uh, offsets or survivorship offsets. So um, that's definitely part of the thinking about how we will be um, accounting for uh, fishery mortality looking forward um, for all three of the species you mentioned. So um, just want to um, encourage you to stay engaged. Um, that, that topic is <laughs> very important um, to all of us, and we uh, certainly appreciate uh, your, your interest in it. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Um, Corey Niles, Corey. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. And yeah, I'll echo Marcy, Dan, to say good to hear your voice. Um, it's been a long meeting. I heard what you said, but I wasn't quite following about, about the complexes. Um, yeah, and, and appreciating all, I'm in remembering your initiative on, on descending devices when you were council chair. Um, so appreciating that. But yeah, could you just elaborate on that point you were making about the, the complexes? Yes, thank you, uh, through the chair. Um, yeah, typically, uh, when we do have these, these complex of fish, we set the management, the official management, um, ACLs, et cetera, at the complex level. And we acknowledge that, that we got there by having these various contributions from the species within the complex. But the official number is at the complex level. And yet when we, when we find ourselves in a, in a, a accounting for fishery during the course of the year, we look at it as individual fish and we treat those um, contributions to the ACLs, et cetera, um, as, as mandated. And, and we don't have the resources to either manage at that at individual fish level or, we, or um, and, and so we should manage at the, at the complex level. So the fact that um, um, the vermilion are over their, their contribution level, that, that's unfortunate. We, we probably ought to do something about it, but still the number is at the complex level. If we had the resources to manage fish at the species level, we should do that, not have these complexes. I understand we're going to take quill back out. That's a probably a good move because then you'll be able to manage at that. But still, in order to do that, you're going to need stock assessments, timely analysis. Um, and do we have the, the resources to actually provide that and allow a reasonable set of management measures to be uh, put together for quill back? I don't think you do. And, and that's kind of where I was going. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Uh, questions uh, for the questions for Dan? Okay. Uh, next up is um, Wayne uh, Kowtow. Wayne? Yep. Good afternoon, Vice Chair and uh, Council. Uh, Wayne Cutto with CCA California. Uh, I had to comment after 20 years of closures and then celebrating the, the openings of all of these species, here we are again. It, it just it it just dumbfounds me. I want to express my concerns for the impacts at the recreational fishery level and the need for better stock assessments. This uh, since the recent stock assessments appear to be so inconsistent from what we're seeing on the water, um, it makes no sense that the species within the same complex are having opposite stock results as Dan was alluding to or stating. Um, I, I don't know how we can avoid some of these species when they're all sitting within the same area in, in the water. And I don't know how we're going to keep a recreational fishery going um, when those areas are key to certain zones within California, as uh, Jason uh, said. Um, you know, I, I participated in the CCFRP studies, which is the tagging and inside and outside the MPAs uh, along the Channel Islands. And what we tagged inside of there was very abundant and, and clearly showed that the stocks are there, 
And yet, as far as I can tell, we still aren't getting credit for all of the closed areas uh, within the stock assessment, yet we get hurt for all of the take that we do outside of those areas. So I'm not sure how we can be hit, hit up for overfishing when there's going to be these set-asides. Um, so I, I, I still don't understand how come we can't get proper stock assessments. If this is really going to hurt us every time we talk about fisheries management, then there needs to be an emphasis on them. Um, the overestimates that I hear about it, within these models are also uh, just dumbfounding to me that they're, they're building them in and we keep getting hurt based on overestimates. Uh, reported releases over 30 fathoms with 100% mortality is totally inaccurate, especially since a lot of our recreational fishery are using descending devices. Well, I know they're not mandated through regulation, we're using them. And so we should get some relief and credit for that, as Dan was stating. And if we need to create that regulation, then I want to work with CDFW to build that regulation in. Um, because it's the right thing to do. I mean, we can prove successful releases and survival rates. So I, I think that just needs to be built into these tables. So, you know, we, we urge the council to push for accurate stock assessments and not cut us off from the opportunity to fish for the species that are so um, necessary to our uh, recreational fishery livelihood. Um, and they're not at the critical levels as being portrayed, you know, by inaccurate or insufficient stock assessments. So that, that's really my point. I appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, questions for Wayne on his uh, testimony? Okay, seeing none, um, that came, takes us to a council discussion. Um, I know just should probably point out that the, uh, some of the testimony there that uh, we did have, Colback and Copper did go through mop-up process and um, those assessments were, um, were approved uh, earlier in the meeting and so here we are. Um, so I'll open the uh, council uh, floor for discussion and um, look for hands. Um, Chair Grillick, Mark. Yeah, I figured I would break the ice here so you're not standing around uh, looking at an empty slate there with no one raising their hand. Um, I, uh, I, regrettably, I, you know, I, I think that we have to do what we have to do here. And um, so I, I support the recommendations um, on these three species made by uh, uh, California, um, it, it's going to cause hardship, and, um, and I'm not persuaded in the end that that hardship will have been proven necessary, but we have stock assessments, and we are bound by them, so, um, you know, we got to do what we got to do. I, I will say, however, I remain puzzled at the results of those stock assessments. Um, we have... Uh, stock complexes where we have similarly situated species and with wildly different exploitation rates, um, which uh, isn't intuitive. And we have these species with uh, large amounts of their habitat uh, still protected. And yet we have these high depletion rates. Again, that's not intuitive. Um, so I, I uh, I think it's uh, it, it's the job of NIMS and the council with the cooperation of the states to provide um, accurate and complete um, stock assessments uh, so that we can do have effective management so that A, we can protect uh, our natural resources uh, pursuant to Magnuson and that we can also provide uh, opportunity and optimum yield pursuant to Magnuson. Uh, I'm fairly certain that's not where we are at today, but um, nonetheless, we have these stock assessments and we have to do what we have to do. That's all I have to say. Um, thanks, Mark, for laying out the, uh, the situation quite well. Um, Maggie Summer, Maggie. Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, I uh, appreciate Mark's comments. Uh, very eloquent about 
the assessments and the need for um, uh, good information from all of our data collection activities. Uh, I, I just wanted to, uh, I guess, offer my observation that it is, uh, yes, these assessments went through the prescribed review process, that it's public. Um, there are multiple steps to that review process. And still, it is very difficult uh, for anyone, even myself and, and others uh, who are very involved in this process and very familiar with navigating the documents, reading them, knowing what to look for and where. Um, and I can't imagine how much more difficult it must be for uh, many stakeholders who aren't that well versed in, uh, in, in our, our process overall to understand the impact that the assessments will have at the time that the assessments themselves are considered and adopted. Uh, because I think a lot of that understanding has really developed through our discussions on uh, the harvest specifications and uh, now management measures, well, in season now, pardon me, and, and we will be getting to management measures for the next biennium shortly. Uh, and I think that that timing, that order, uh, there really does make it difficult, and it is one of the factors that contributes to us um, maybe finding ourselves in this position now of, of uh, having hearing uh, quite a bit of, of frustration and criticism of, of the assessments in the process. Uh, I, I think along those lines, maybe the constructive comment I would have to offer is that uh, as we go through future cycles, uh, it would maybe behoove us to look for ways to communicate the, uh, the bottom line of the assessments and the potential impacts as much as we can, as much as we might understand them earlier in the process. I recognize that's difficult to do because that understanding, again, it develops as we go through this exercise. Um, I will also be, you know, we, we have set up our stock assessments on an every other year cycle, and we are not expecting to conduct any assessments again uh, until 2023. And there are plenty of activities that the science centers and the SSC itself are involved in, in, in the quote unquote off years, um, which aren't at all off in terms of workload, they are conducting other scientific activities that are very important to our process. Uh, but I, I am wondering if there is some opportunity to uh, take up as soon as possible some efforts to develop information related to these, these stocks that can really uh, help and feed into our understanding of their status um, and uh, potentially inform our management uh, sooner than a, an assessment conducted in 2023 and biennial management measures beginning in 2025. So uh, that's that's not an easy question to answer right now. I'm, I'm not looking for an answer uh, from other council members or the National Marine Fisheries Service on, on the spot here, uh, just offering that I think that's probably something that's on a lot of our minds. Thanks. Thanks, Maggie. Further discussion? Um, Marcy, you're up to go. Marcy? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I'm, I'm happy to offer a motion and I'll have some thoughts that go along with it if okay. now's a good time. I don't see any hands behind you, so we um, proceed. All righty, thank you. Whoa, uh, little, there we go, thank you. I move the council adopt the following for the 2022 fishing season for the Pacific whiting set aside in research activities on the pink shrimp fishery, continue to set the Pacific whiting set aside at 750 metric tons for 2022. For open access fixed gear link cod north of 42 north latitude, option one, increase to 2,500 pounds per month as soon as possible in 2022. Three, for limited entry fixed gear link cod north of 42 north latitude, option one, 
increased to 5,000 pounds per two months as soon as possible in 2022. Four, for open access DTL fixed gear sable fish north of 36 north latitude, reduce per option one, 600 pounds a day or one landing per week up to 2,000 pounds, not to exceed 4,000 pounds per two months. Five, for limited entry DTL fixed gear sable fish north of 36, 30, 36 north latitude, reduce per option one, 2,400 pounds per week, not to exceed 4,800 pounds per two months. And number six, no adjustment to the short spine thorny head north of 3427 north latitude trip limit at this time. For quillback rockfish, a one fish quillback rockfish sub bag limit in the recreational fishery statewide. Implement a 75 pound per two month sub trip limit to the 2000 pound two month minor nearshore rockfish trip limit for the area between 42 and 4010 north latitude and a 75 pound per two month sub trip limit to the 2000 pound two month deeper near shore trip limit south of 4010 north latitude. For copper rockfish, implement a new statewide one fish copper rockfish sub bag limit within the 10 fish daily RCG bag limit. Next, implement a 75 pound per two month sub trip limit to the 2000 pound per two month minor nearshore rockfish trip limit for the area between 42 and 4010 north latitude and a 75 pound two month sub limit to the 2000 pound per two month deeper nearshore trip limit south of 4010 north latitude. And for vermilion sunset, reduce the vermilion rockfish five fish sub bag limit to four fish within the 10 fish daily RCG bag limit within the recreational fishery statewide. Thank you, Marcy. I see Todd has his hand up. Um, Todd? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, just a quick clarifying question uh, regarding quillback copper and vermilion, uh, I guess some the bullets there for them, it's particularly for recreational fisheries statewide. Um, would that be just California or would it also include Oregon, Washington? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Todd, for the clarification. Uh, yes, statewide California. My apologies for not stating the word California there explicitly. I'd accept an amendment if that's necessary, but I am speaking only to California. The, the recommendations came from the CDFW report and statewide implies, thank you. Yeah, yeah there's no second here, so we're still good. Excellent. I'm still learning that fact. Hold off on the second. Okay. Oh, we um, need one a California after copper, the word statewide, and then also in vermilion. And yes, the language on the screen is correct. Thank you. Uh, you read my mind. Okay. Thank you, Marcy. Uh, looking for a second. Second by uh, Chair Grolnick. Thanks, Mark. Um, Marcy, speak to your statement, please. Okay, thank you, um, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, for the first six items in this motion, um, the GMT report uh, thoroughly explains the rationale for each of the recommendations. Um, and appreciate their analysis and uh, the GAPS review of those recommendations uh, and their concurrence. Um, I think we had a, a, a detailed discussion about the rationale for the increases and that um, the proposals uh, should work to um, help us um, achieve but not exceed um, our various uh, specifications for 2022. Um, moving to the three California pieces of this action, 
on Quillback, Copper, and Vermilion Sunset. First, I, I, I want to thank my staff. Um, they, um, there were a number of folks that worked on the analysis uh, that was uh, provided here today. Um, a lot of quick work in the background while also um, trying to manage a number of other GMT uh, analytical needs. Um, we've um, mined our data as best we can and um, did as thorough of a job here um, as we possibly could. Um, one thing I want to note is that um, when looking at the uh, the projected discards, fishery discards, um, that comprises an awful lot of the mortality in the case of uh, quillback and copper rockfish. And as you uh, reduce allowable uh, retention, your, your discard mortality is going to go up in the season structures that we have in our fisheries. Um, so I think I made this uh, comment at the onset, but our, our work is not done here in 2020. Uh, into 2023. Um, this is a, a first step um, at taking um, some cuts that um, are driven by um, stock assessments that um, a lot of folks around the table have spoken to um, that give us, uh, you know, pause. Um, the extent of the impacts that we are um, considering here um, today, as well as into the future, um, are, are grave uh, to our recreational and commercial nearshore fisheries. Um, when you hear things uh, in discussion about depth dependent mortality rates and um, measures to reduce effort in the nearshore, um, to try to, to get pressure off of these stocks. Um, these, these actions are, are not things that we want to propose because um, it's, it's, you know, we want to. It, it's because, you know, the council has an obligation to make sure that we are considering all of our management measures and all, all of our sources of fishery mortality. And as we look to start building the scorecard or scorecards um, in future in-season actions and in our future specifications, um, there's going to be a lot of work to do, mining available data and looking at impact across all uh, ground fish and non-ground fish fisheries. Um, so this is just um, the first of many unfortunate steps along this path to come. Um, I want to also uh, zoom in on um, some remarks about um, the veracity of the stock assessments um, I've expressed many times uh, around this table that, you know, I, I don't feel like we have a lot of choice. Um, once it's determined to be best available science, uh, our, our options are really quite limited. Um, but the amount of, of work that we will be spending to um, ensure that we are managing um, correctly and in accordance with Magnuson, um, it, it's, it, there's going to be a lot of work yet to come. And I know that we're going to have some tough discussions about priorities and um, needs for analytical time um, I know how difficult um, or how, how much volume we're talking about doing and how strapped staff are, but I don't feel like we can, um, that we can cut corners on our management um, when it comes to rebuilding um, an overfished stock. Um, so I think there are a lot of things yet to come that we haven't talked about yet um, that are going to be elements of the specs. Um, I guess I, I also want to note that um, when we leave here today um, and in consultation with NIFS on their 
uh, regulatory process uh, to implement in-season actions. Um, we will be quickly uh, needing to go to our California State Fish and Game Commission uh, and seek their concurrence to adopt and implement these regulations um, for state waters. So um, that will be uh, on the docket for the commission's uh, agenda um, coming up here in December. So um, we'll be working to support um, that regulatory process um, in addition to the council um, ongoing overwinter council, council analytical needs. Um, so I just, I wanna thank my staff. Um, they've had a heck of a, a week. Um, we've involved many people um, beyond just our GMT, immediate GMT folks in um, aiding us with this, uh, the analysis that we're working off of today. Um, and there's, there's more work to be done. Um, I wanna flag that in the quillback rockfish item, bullet one, um, you will see here in bullet one that there's a recommendation for a one fish quillback rockfish sub bag limit in the recreational fishery. I just wanna note that that is a different recommendation than what you see in the CDFW report, in the GMT report, and in the GAP report. And I wanna thank um, National Marine Fisheries Service for letting me know this ahead of time um, so that we could uh, make adjustments when it came, times for mo came time for motion. But um, in order, um, and I encourage Keely to, to follow up um, at some point in this discussion, um, but uh, I appreciate the heads up that um, we need a council recommendation that does not um, does not involve prohibition in order for um, NIMS to be able to pursue an in-season action. Um, if we were looking to do a, a complete prohibition, it's my understanding that we'd need to be enacting a rulemaking action under a point of concern framework instead of under the in-season action. And so it would be a, a more um, involved and lengthy regulatory process um, that um, wouldn't um, allow us to utilize the in-season tools that we have available to us in the toolbox. So that's why um, this recommendation here today differs um, from the recommendations that you're reading in the report. Um, I appreciate the heads up because uh, we do want NIMS to um, implement this uh, recommendation as soon as possible uh, with the idea that it will um, be effective um, through as much of 22 as possible. Um, with that said, um, it's important to note that the expectations for catch in 2022 um, are going to be higher than what we were hoping to um, to estimate for quillback when um, it comes time to discussing um, the inputs that would go into the rebuilding analysis. So the savings that, that um, were reflected in the various tables, um, just note that um, with the recommendation for a one fish bag rather than a zero fish, um, bag limit on quill back in 2022. I think the uh, the difference uh, in the increases in the on the order of somewhere near four tons. So um, we were uh, hoping to achieve more savings in 2022, but uh, it doesn't appear that there is an expedient way to do that here and now. So I do um, appreciate NIMS taking the time to look into what options we had under the in-season uh, toolbox authority um, and uh, appreciate them uh, alerting me of that uh, before we took action here today. Um, moving to um, vermilion rockfish, um, the reduction um, from five fish to four fish um, I believe that um, 
that action is intended to um, take a step uh, in the direction of doing better to ensure that our um, our management measures help us to keep within our ACL contribution to um, the minor nearshore rockfish um, contribution uh, to the minor nearshore rockfish complex, um, acknowledging, um, as uh, described in our report, that um, going down to four fish still doesn't project that we're going to get there. Um, so we we just need to flag that um, you know this may not be enough, um, but we we do feel it's important to make a, a meaningful step um, toward the direction of doing better to um, stay within our contribution for vermilion uh, within that overall uh, complex. We've had um, a long um, several year track history of exceeding um, the OFL contribution and uh, the analysis suggests that we, we will not do that in 2022 um, by reducing to four fish. Um, so um, I, um, <laughs> it's uh, again, I, a difficult um, cut to make, um, especially with a stock assessment that um, will be, it, it was an optimistic assessment and did um, suggest the stock is healthy. So I, I know that it's it's difficult from a perception standpoint to reconcile why um, more cuts are needed, but um, recognizing the need for us to stay within our complex contributions, um, this action is needed. Um, and I think with that, I will, conclude my remarks and um, thank the council uh, for their time on this issue. Okay, thanks Marcy. Um, discussion on the motion? Uh, Keely Kent, Keely. Thanks Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I will take the invitation uh, set up by Marcy to just um, follow up a little bit more on the, the Quillback rockfish. Um, and um, Marcy was spot on that we looked at that, um, recognizing that there wasn't a lot of time to evaluate that particular request, um, but the council does not have, and it's in season toolkit um, a clear ability to make um, that kind of change or prohibition on retention. Um, and so we don't see an in-season pathway for that right now. Um, certainly, you know, if the council is um, concerned with uh, pullback rockfish mortality in 2022, um, it could look for other options. Um, there is the point of concern framework in the FNP, um, and should the council want to consider a pathway other than in-season, we could evaluate the possible rulemaking pathways to get there. So just wanted to note that um, if the council wants to further discuss that, um, we're happy to um, try to run down additional options that are posed. Thanks. Okay, thanks Keely. Um, further discussion? Corey Niles? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. And thanks, Marcy, for the motion. Um, I'll be supporting it. I, you know, I did raise some questions on the first six, but those can wait for next year. Um, I just wanted to, um, uh, you know, I, um, you know, comment on on the tough the tough uh, decisions actions being made here. Um, support those. Recognize that that they are going to be serious. Um, and I did, I just wanted to to. Um, also speak to the challenges here and you know in the, the excellent testimony we got and and to Maggie's comments and, and Marcy's on, on the challenges of stock assessment and yeah and Mr. Chair we it may turn out that when we assess these again these actions might not be necessary but you know I just want to our process is is you know the best the best you know humans have invented for 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 this for this challenge. Um, these are uncertain um, 
it, we don't know if we're precautionary or not until we until we get the data. And that's the point I'm here trying to make is, you know, let's let, I'm just encouraging folks to not forget, you know, we have some of the best assessors in the world. They're doing the best with the data we have. But as as people are thinking how to to um, address these problems, um, I'm just going to point to the to the state and federal budgets that support data collection and they haven't been keeping up with with costs with inflation and there's no easy way out of it I and mean, collecting data one time is not going to do it it's it's going to be have to be a, an investment in collecting data and and I, it was nice to hear folks recognize that in, in testimony and i hope that you continue to to advocate for improved data collection and it's not just the data collection it's the folks who who have the skills and, and the interest in, in looking at otoliths and in, in determining how old a fish was and, and, and collecting lengths and all that. And, and, and yeah, again, our, our budgets are not overflowing for those things. Um, but yeah, I'm um, supportive of the motion. And again, thanks to CDFD, CFD, excuse me, from our colleagues from California for all the time and thought they put into this. Thanks, Corey. Um, Chair Grolnick. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair. And, and Corey, I agree that this is this is a, a budget issue and uh, several of us uh, take every opportunity to raise this uh, with uh, NIMPS uh, when, when, when we have the opportunity and when it's appropriate. And when I say NIMPS, I mean headquarters because, um, you know, our, our region can only do what they can do with the money they're provided. Um, but, but I do want to say that, um, when we're not able to do assessments, uh, it reflects poorly on the process that we're all engaged in and we're all invested in this process and anything that causes the public to lack confidence in our process also reflects poorly on us. And, and right now that is what you're seeing amongst the public because the assessment, granted, it, they did the best job they could with whatever they had uh, it, it, because it doesn't seem to jibe with what people are saying. That's not to say that it's wrong, but it, 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 it does suggest that before you, um, you know, and we are, we are taking these management measures, no doubt about it, but, you know, it's going to cost people jobs. It's going to cost, it's going to cost people's livelihood. It's going to cost people's opportunity. It's going to hit people in the pocketbook. And when we take steps like that, um, it, it's my preference, and I'm sure others as well, that we do this not just on the best data available, but on adequate data. And um, we don't have that now. And um, it, it, uh, and I'm not blaming any individual, but it, it just does not. Um, reflect well on the process that we can't do and we can't make these decisions with adequate data. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, Bob Dooley, Bob. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. <clears throat> and thank you, Mark, for that. <laughs> you took the words right out of my mouth. I just, we have good people doing good work. We have inadequate funds to do the work that needs to be done. We don't typically, we can't use data that we can't verify. We should be using our, in this particular situation, I believe that there's so much uncertainty that was in this, in these stock assessments, so much doubt by industry, particularly from what they're seeing on the water and how, <clears throat> for various reasons, funding, COVID, you name it. A lot of things caused us to get here. And it's, uh, you're right, a lot of people are going to uh, <clears throat> lose their lives, lose their business. And I think we, you know, we can't turn fisheries off and on and expect them to survive. I, <clears throat> I know we're in a, in a situation we can't do much about. I also, want to recognize all the work that the states have done, particularly my state has done. And is, it's, it's amazing how much those people care and how much they do work to 
to try to mitigate these 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 type of situations. And I, I appreciate all that hard work. But I can't help but think that it's not our job <clears throat> to solely look at the data and do best available science and let that be the only thing that guides us. I keep bouncing back to national standard eight. That you know, it's our we shall measure shall, it says, <clears throat> take into account the importance of fishery resources to fishing communities, utilizing economic and social data to meet the requirements of paragraph two, but provide for the sustained participation of such, such communities. This and to the extent practical, practicable, minimize adverse economic impacts on such communities. And <clears throat> well, I'm, I struggle with how we wedge that in there. I know there's some of that that's in the, in these proposals, but then you hear our our industry come forward and this is gonna hurt. And so um, I heard um, Vice Chairman Bettinger talk about a ramp down. And I, I, I don't know if there's ways to ease the pain while we uh, go forward. I know this, this is all good work that's been done in this proposal and I support it, but boy, it's heavy. Um, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, Mark, I see your hand still up. Okay. Further discussion? If not, I'll call for the motion. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, motion passes unanimously. I believe we have a couple more motions uh, out there. So looking for, uh, looking for hands or discussion. I see a motion, but I don't see a hand. Marcy Repco, Marcy. Uh, yes, Mr. Vice Chair, I believe the motion that we just uh, approved did cover uh, items one and two, um, just to clarify, thanks. Okay. Well, then I was mistaken, so I'll, I'll turn to Todd. Todd? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, yes, I would concur with that assessment that the council has, um, has adequately considered both uh, numbers one and two in your council action and have addressed both those through that single motion. Um, so that would be my, my recommendation is that uh, you've done what you can do for under this particular action item. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Todd. And, um, and with that, um, I'm going to hand the gavel back to uh, Chair Gorelnik. Mark. All right, thank you very much, Vice Chair Pettinger. Uh, we have one one remaining agenda item uh, today. Um, I think we we've only been at this. Well, we came back at uh, well, we come back at one fifty. Uh, Vice Chair? It was like, it's about an hour and 15 minutes ago, I think. Yeah, so why don't we take a 10 minute break? I think the goal here on E5 is we have a supplemental GMT report and then we'll provide for uh, public comment on this new material from the GMT. Um, and then the remaining uh, action would be a council discussion and action. And my understanding is that uh, the states would like a little more time on on the motion so we may not take up the motion 
any motions until uh, tomorrow morning after appointments, but um, to the extent we can get through council discussion, that would be great. So why don't we come back at 410 and see what we can get done on E5, and then we will uh, break for the day.
Okay, it is uh, 410. We are back. Uh, we are on agenda item E5, which is our last agenda item of the day. Um, and we had completed reports, but there were some, uh, some questions asked to the GMT. So um, I, I don't know, uh, Todd or John, do you have any comments or shall I just go straight to the GMT for report four? Thank you, Mr. Chair. No, I don't have any comments. I think uh, we've covered what needs, what's gonna happen here pretty, pretty adequately. Thank you. Great, all right. So Lynn Mattis, if you're there in the ether, would you please provide us with the supplemental GMT report? Sure, thank you, Chair Gorelnik. Um, but before I go to the report four, I do want to point out that we have submitted a revised report two with table 12 on the Black Gill and Slopes, uh, Southern Slope Rockfish Complex uh, has been corrected. Um, I know uh, Vice Chair Pettinger pointed that out in our presentation the other day. So we just wanted to highlight that we have revised that report, report two, um, just the report, not the presentation has been revised. So table 12 is updated and is now correct. So then based on the, some of the questions to the GMT on, I believe it was Friday or Thursday, a couple of days ago, uh, we were able to go back and get some very, very preliminary information on the research and in incidental open access set asides or a mortality in the Quillback Rockfish South and Copper Rockfish South. Well, this may not be completely what uh, what council members were after. We thought it was good to show um, just that way council members have an idea of the scale of the impacts. You know, there, there's whether it was two metric tons or ten metric tons, uh, but the the ten year average uh, for research for Quillback is 0 0.004 metric tons, and for incidental open access, um, out to three decimal places, there wasn't any impacts. For copper rockfish south, uh, its research was about 0.4 metric tons on average and 1.5 for incidental open access. So while it's not a full analysis, this seemed like a good way to, to at least show what the magnitude of recent mortality has been. And maybe that would, would help with uh, council discussions. Um, with that, I would be happy to try to answer questions concerning that report. All right, thank you very much, Lynn. Let's see if there are any questions. Uh, Marcy Remco, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Lynn, for um, folks doing some quick work uh, on uh, their day off. But uh, just a question, um, south of 4010, uh, we're not likely to see a whole lot of quillback uh, impacts in IOA fisheries or research because the stock isn't distributed that far south in any magnitude. Um, did you happen to have a chance to take a look at north of 4010 where we'd be looking at um, IOA set asides for uh, research, um, pink shrimp, uh, directed Pacific halibut, uh, and I think some other incidental category, if I'm not mistaken. Through the chair. <laughs> Ms. Yuremko, we, we, we did, uh, thanks to some quick work yesterday or this morning, we did have an opportunity to look at the data. We just didn't have the time to get it into a report. Um, but to answer the, the question about the numbers, um, using the last 10 years of data, the research has averaged north of 4010, for all areas north of 4010, 0.06 metric tons for research pink shrimp has been zero. Um, the directed halibut fishery has been 0.3 metric tons. Uh, so when you combine those all, uh, it's averaged less than 0.5 metric tons for incidental open access and, and much less than 0.1 metric tons for research in the area north. Again, that's not in a report. We just didn't have time to compile it and get it into a report, but um, we have looked at the data. All right, thank you, Marcy. Thank you, Lynn. Are there further questions of the Grand Fish Management team? Marcy. Yes, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess my question is back to Lynn. Um, where do we go from here? Um, I note that we have already 
um, take an action to approve our EFPs uh, as one example. Um, I don't know if you've had a chance to examine uh, any quillback or retention there. I, I did look at the interim reports that were provided. I, I didn't see any mention of copper and quillback, um, but I don't know um, if I'm, I'm assuming nobody's had any time to go back and look. Um, but certainly, you know, the whole reason that we adopt EFPs uh, at the November meeting is so that we can establish those set asides. Um, or preliminary adopt, preliminarily adopt the EFPs. Um, that's the whole reason that we have the structure that we do with the specs is to be able to kind of nail these set asides down. Um, and I, I don't know if this question is for you because it's not really fair, um, but I am wondering uh, where we go from here um, in light of basically um, not the full suite of information to look at uh, with regard to off the tops uh, for these newly um, constraining stocks. Um, anyway, if you have, I don't know how much discussion you may have had in the back room um, or if there's been uh, any assistance or thinking from council staff or NIMS on, on this, but to me, it's a, a fairly important piece of the process and um, I'm just wondering where we go from here. Thanks. Through the chair, Ms. Uremko, um, I don't know if I'm lucky or, or you're lucky. I happen to be the one who's in charge of the set aside tables uh, that were in one of our other reports. And just a quick look at it uh, for EFPs, there are no set asides for EFPs for near shore rockfish south or north. So there's none for the complex as a whole, which means there would be none for those copper or quillback within that complex. So that, that's a little piece to answer, help answer your question. Um, for nearshore rockfish north, there is 1.5 for tribal fisheries. Um, I don't know the breakout of that quillback versus the rest of the complex, but there is 1.5 for tribal fisheries out of that complex. So that, that's sort of the story for off the top deductions. Um, the, the next steps to my understanding, and I will punt to Todd or somebody else after I probably stick my foot in it, is for the council to make those decisions on the set asides. So then we have the fishery harvest guideline. And then a subsequent step would be non trawl versus trawl, commercial versus rec within the non trawl. <clears throat> Anything further, Marcy? Um Thank you, Lynn. I appreciate the response. So um, I guess that to sum it up, then we will get the GMT's best estimate of these um, research and incidental um, IOA catches in March and then um, tentatively approve them then um, and move forward with the rest of our uh, specs and management process measures at, at that time is is that is that where we're is that what we're we're aiming for and that we can get this there's no problem with the timeline by holding that that piece of this discussion until March. I'm just acknowledging allocative implications and um, anyway, just wondering when when we when we'll have a chance to evaluate and address those. Through the chair, Ms. Uremko, part of the reason we hurried to, or we worked to get that these tables in in report four was so that the council had the information in front of them about what recent impacts were for research in IOA on those two particular species to try to help inform your decision at this point. If the decision on set-asides and harvest guidelines is not made until later. Um, I I suspect the G. I, I'm I don't want to speak for the the commercial modelers completely, but I I suspect as we move forward through our analysis and modeling and that we'll have a a decent idea of what the range might be and can move forward. That's my take on it. But I will defer to Mr. Phillips if he has more uh, more on that. Yes, thank you, um, Mr. Chair, Mr. Emko. Thank you, Lynn, as well. 
Um, I would agree with Lynn. Um, if without something to work through um, in terms of analysis over the winter, uh, there will be a. Uh, it will be difficult, obviously, to um, proceed with much. Well, not much, but with some of the analyses. Um, this was obviously this table or this, uh, excuse me, this report was hopefully going to answer some questions, obviously not all questions, noting that we, the team didn't have the ability really this meeting to dive into particular subjects. Um, I think I mentioned the other day that the team can come back um, in March and that you under the normal uh, updating of the council on the harvest specifications management measures with some informa with information for the council to use. Um, but we were, you know, that's kind of where we are, unfortunately, right now. Um, noting that John DeVore is much more of a uh, road warrior on harvest specs management measures. I'd invite him to um, chime in and if he also feels necessary. I don't mean to kick the, the can here to the next guy, but um, he might be able to provide some more information. John. Yeah, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Um, no, I, I'd say that it's it's been fairly common when we look back at um, development of rebuilding plans and, and the like that uh, the within uh, sector allocations um, do not come out uh, in the first meeting where we're deciding um, management measures for analysis and that sort of thing. So they, it, it, it's, it's not unexpected that a final decision on all of that comes later, but we are gonna need at least um, some allocation guidelines so that council staff and GMT can, can you know, base their analyses on that. But in, that, in those analyses is, is where you'll probably get the information you'll need to be able to make allocation decisions. And that, and that would be, uh, you know, scheduled for, you know, June is when the final management measures are decided. Hey, thank you. All right. Anything, uh, any further questions of the GMT? Uh, I am not seeing any other hands. Lynn, thank you very much. What? Uh, now I see a hand. Heather Hall. Thank you, Chair Grelnick. Uh, this might be a, a question more for for John. I'm not sure, but um, just thinking about these set asides and um, as we're looking at them for the area um, in California. So, just looking at California north of 4010, and um, so, for example, for Quillback we would think that the, the travel set aside shouldn't factor into California Quillback. And, and I'm just uh, wondering how that would work. And I, I know I've, I've uh, worked on that set aside table before and we've never really looked at it in terms of um, area, you know, um, attributing them to different areas, but just wondering if there's any thought to that. Yes, uh, to the chair, um, Ms. Hall, uh, yeah, I mean, when, when we manage a stock on its own, you know, it's, it's a management unit, a set aside needs to be decided for that stock. And in this case, uh, you know, presumably uh, the National Marine Fisheries Service will follow the council recommendation, remove cop, uh, quillback rockfish off California from the near shore complexes, in which case you would want to express, uh, decide set asides based just for quillback in California water. So a tribal set aside wouldn't be uh, applicable in that case. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's for that management unit, which would be just okay. for the state of California. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Anything further of the GMT? Okay, I'm not, uh, well, Brad Pettinger. 
Um, thank you, Chair Gronick. And um, well, since the GMT here is in front of us, um, um, we, Marcy, uh, in the previous um, agenda right. item, brought up uh, about getting credit for 2021 landing, 22 landings for the next specs. I may be incorporating that. And I mentioned the lock or the ramp down potential. Um, I'd like to ask the GMT if they've if they've uh, talked about that or has it been brought up to them or is um, is that how that might fit in? Through the chair to the vice chair. Um, we had a, an extremely brief discussion of it this morning to the uh, to the tune of, hey, we've heard this might come up. We have not had a, any chance to have any detailed discussion about it, what might be involved. It, it, it was basically, hey, this might come up, and that was the extent of the discussion we've had thus far. Um, Brad, if I may. Um, well, I'm kind of curious, um, maybe I had this, some uh, sidebar discussions with um, John DeBoer earlier about how that might uh, fit in the process, and I'm wondering if we maybe could ask him of how that might be incorporated, if at all, um, if I may. Uh, I think you want to ask uh, John, uh, staff, uh, council staff a question, is that? I think so. If you want to do that, let's leave that for council discussion. Right now we have the GMT report in front of us. And um, if, okay. that's, if that's okay, I just, um, it just yeah, good. seems that's, that's where we should have it. Uh, uh, any further questions of the GMT? Phil Anderson. I don't know whether to ask this now or later. So if I'm out of bounds, let me know and I can ask it later. I just want to, and it, it is for the GMT, um, although I wouldn't expect an answer well, right away, unless they obviously have, have one. But I'm just I'm I'm not remembering everything that we did relative to yellow eye. I mean, this is a to me a yellow eye type situation, um, and uh, my my memory is foggy on exactly what we did. But there was what I'll characterize, at least in my mind, a ramp down type approach that was used. I think we got sued on it as well um, for doing it. Uh, but that's, you know, that's what keeps the lawyers busy. Uh, so I just ask, not for an answer right now, but I'm just, it, it, is there anything to be, is there anything that we did in that yellow eye kind of situation, which was just catastrophic and could have been more catastrophic than it was um, that might be applicable in the situation we're in now. So I'll just ask the question and, and not expecting an answer. Of course, Lynn's really smart, so she might have one, but uh, I, I just keep thinking we did something there that, that helped us get through uh, a pretty d disastrous situation. Through the chair, Mr. Anderson, I, I don't have an exact answer for you either. Um, while I've been on the GMT a long time, um, the yellow eye stuff does predate me. But while we have been looking through and starting to examine what we need to do, how we move forward with species being pulled out of complexes, rebuilding plans, we have been going to the past and looking what we did previously and using some of that as a starting place or a basis for our beginning. So we would definitely go back and see what was done prior, which I don't know off the top of my head, but we would be using that as a basis for how we move forward. Um, and then I will defer to uh, either Mr. Phillips or Mr. DeVore if they have more to respond to that. Yes, Mr. Chair, uh, this is Todd Phillips. Um, Mr. Anderson, I don't have anything to add to that. Um, so, sorry. I mean, I, I could, excuse me, uh, this is John DeVore. I could, I could uh, add a little perspective on that, but um, this sort of gets to Brad's question and, and perhaps it's better to wait until council discussion. Yeah. You know, we have one public comment and then we'll be in council discussion. 
So, um, you know, if, I just want to see if there are any further questions on the GMT report. All right, thank you, Lynn, but don't go away because I have a feeling you're gonna get drawn into council discussion. I was uh, not planning on it, but thank you, sir. <laughs> I think we have one new uh, folk who, uh, person who signed up, Bill James, welcome. And your comments on the uh, supplemental report four of the GMT. Yeah, a uh, couple of new things. Uh, first of all, I was around with that, the yellow idea, but um, I think John, John the world know more about it than I have. Uh, um, I looked up a, a new uh, article on um, barrel trauma, and it came out on September 29th, 2021. It is post-release surviving uh, barrel trauma on deep-dwelling rockfish. It was done off um, San Diego, and that's where I got that 90% survivability with uh, Boccaccio. And I think that that might be something to be do with a, the three species we're talking about in the areas where they live. And that's one of the things I want to mention, that we should do any of that research where they live and have uh, local fishermen help to make sure that you're doing it in the right spot, not looking in the kelp beds that aren't there. So um, some people refer to kelp beds in the north of 4010. They're very, very few because the waves get up to 30 feet. So um, that being said, um, yeah, so... Uh, I, was, I just want to make that one comment. And uh, the other thing, maybe if you're looking at, at all this stuff, look through the national standards. It reads one to 10 and, and go right through the, uh, the numbers and uh, apply what it says. And I think that that has helped me a lot to come to a, an answer at the very end because it makes you, makes you look at every part of our, of our fishery management plan and what it's supposed to do or not supposed to do. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. I will um, comment. All right, thank you, Bill. Are there questions of Bill? All right, thank you very much, Bill. I don't see any questions. Yeah. All right, now, now we come to council discussion. Um, and um, I, I know there's some things to discuss before we take action. I know that there's an interest in perhaps uh, deferring some action at least uh, until tomorrow. So why don't we get started, uh, pick back up. Maybe Brad Pettinger, do you want to I'm calling you first, even though your hand's not up, because you, you tried before. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chair Grolnick. Um, a little bit of confusion maybe about where the a ramp down might play out and what it if it's applicable to where we're where we're at here. It appears to me that we have a lack of toolbox or tools in the toolbox, and it's something we've done before. And I, I believe it did a little bit of short term alleviation of the, some of the pain to the fishing industry. And um, I think it'd be good to maybe have uh, John DeVore maybe lay out um, an overview about how that might look and how much, um, and how about that may, may play out potentially. Um, so, uh, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you through the chair. Um, I, I've done a little bit of uh, look at this, but um, it, the, the answer comes back to whenever you're developing a rebuilding plan, you have to rebuild in as short a time as possible while considering the needs of fishing communities, the marine ecosystem, other stocks and that sort of thing. So it's not unlike any other rebuilding strategy that might be um, considered. You, you have to make the case that you need the ramp down to avoid some you know, real egregious short-term impacts that um, would otherwise, uh, you know, could be mitigated uh, with a ramp-down strategy that, that couldn't be mitigated with some other rebuilding strategy that you're looking at. So under all circumstances, you are comparing uh, the time to rebuild under that strategy 
the impacts associated with that strategy with the shortest time to rebuild, which is a zero fishing strategy. And clearly there's a lot of impacts associated with that. So, um, so it's, it's not unlike any other um, rebuilding strategy in that regard. The phase in ABC control rules that you see in the national standard one guidelines, um, you know, actually do speak to, uh, you know, getting an ABC in place that will uh, stop overfishing from occurring. The overfished uh, aspect of it is, is, is a bit different in that it's really all of the same um, metrics and whatnot that you have to consider when uh, providing that strategy. And so you really have to demonstrate that um, a ramp down is the best way to go to avoid some real significant unavoidable impacts to fishing communities in this case. So, uh, you know, there's there's no real uh, clear roadmap on that, but it was the same thing with Yellow Eye when we did that back in the day. We had to demonstrate why that was um, a better strategy than a, a constant harvest rate strategy from the beginning. So that's that's really the uh, the answer right there. All right, uh, Merrick, followed by Phil Anderson. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Mr. DeVore. Um, listening to this discussion brings back memories of, I believe, is our 2007 eight specs when we when we tackled this issue with yellow eye. Um, to add to what John um, was indicating here a, a minute ago, um, some added context and maybe some parameters in terms of how to think through a potential ramp down strategy. And so my recollection of the yellow eye issue was that um, first, if we think about the time for rebuilding, that by engaging in a ramp down that I believe was a three year period, if memory serves, um, that to get down to the trajectory um, that we were aiming for, that that ramp down strategy didn't really appreciably extend the rebuilding time um, all that much relative to what I think was, a, I don't know, it was a 70 or 80 year plan at the time. Um, it was quite a while. And what we also had was um, a, a reasonable expectation um, that there were some tools that we could develop over the course of a two or three year period that would get us there. And what those are, um, are escaping me at the moment or what those were are escaping me at the moment. But I think the question is valid here and that if we are looking to explore a, a ramp down strategy, uh, perhaps for this species, that we would be looking that for a, a reasonable set of tools that we think we could develop over the next two or three years um, to justify that ramp down strategy. So there's a question in there. Um, do we see some tools that could be developed that would justify that sort of a ramp down that would alleviate the pain and that when we get to the bottom of that ramp down that we have tools that would alleviate the, the pressure that we're all trying to avoid here. All right, uh, Phil. Um, thanks, Mr. Chair, and thanks, uh, Merrick, for helping me remember some, some of it. Um, uh, for, for me, the bottom line, I guess, right, as a, you know, given where we find ourselves today, <clears throat> is if there's another potential lifeline out there other than some sort of a ramp down strategy, uh, I don't know what it is. Uh, if there, you know, I'm sure the folks at, at National Marine Fisheries Service have been thinking about how to, how to, deal with this issue and take into the consideration the the very serious consequences our actions are are going to have on on the industry and um and if anybody i'm sure we all heard the the concern and the and the downright fear in the voices of the people who have testified on this issue this week and it's it's real uh, i um and and so I, um, 
regardless of whether I could answer answer in the affirmative right now or, or anybody else around the table necessarily, that we can think of some tools to use over during the ramp down period. Uh, it behooves us in our in my mind for us to to make the effort to do that. Uh, to look at potentials for for ramp down strategies that help the industry, our fishing industry, get through this difficult period. Uh, and we were we were asking for yellow eye rockfish stock assessment updates every year. I, I mean, the, the I think the scientists were going crazy with us continuing to ask for it because. In in some in some ways this this some this situation was similar in that what the people were seeing on the grounds didn't necessarily match up with what the assessment was telling us, um, you know. And we had we we had also gone through the whole calcod. Uh, we're in the midst of that situation where the rebuilding program at one point that they brought to us said they would never rebuild even in the absence of fishing. And uh, lo and behold, that proved to be wrong. Lo and behold, instead of rebuilding yellow, yellow eye, you know, out in, I think it was 20, 20, it's 76, I think, you know, we're, um, we're now looking at something in the 2036 or something like that. So, and the same thing, you know, similar with Canary, we went from thinking it was going to take us another 20 years. To all of a sudden being at the at the cusp of and threshold of of having canary rebuilt, and widows another example. So I just, um, given all the the information and, and public testimony that we've heard, and the observations and and uh, the uh, in the uh, comments from California Department of Fish and Wildlife throughout throughout this, I just think that we need to look for a way to help. Get through this time frame um, to when we hopefully can get some better, get improved information, improved data that's going into the stock assessments uh, to ensure that we're making making these decisions based on reality. Thank you, Phil. Brad. Um. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Chair Grillnick. Um, and really speaking with maybe what Phil had said, they're adding to that. Uh, some of those things could be, um, you know, Marcy was talking about um, maybe getting some credit, you know, for the savings potentially in 2022 that could be maybe, I believe, moved forward. Um, and certainly uh, species specific barrel trauma uh, survivability uh, for both those species uh, that needs to be done. Um, so a little things might make a big difference. And I tell you what, the, the testimony I heard was uh, damn compelling, if I may say that. And uh, my heart goes out to all those individuals. And uh, also it sounds to me like uh, this COVID potentially had uh, some pretty severe impacts to maybe some uh, stock sampling uh, the last couple of years. Um, and uh, so there's certainly much more information to be gathered here. And I think that we ought to do, as Phil indicated, everything we possibly can to uh, to help where we can, and I'll stop there. Thank you, Brad. Um, Marcy Uramko. Yeah, um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and um, thanks to everyone for their remarks around the table here and um, your uh, your attention to the seriousness of the situation. Um, I appreciate the thoughts and the suggestions and certainly agree um, that we need to do everything uh, we can. Um, and I also uh, really want to echo Phil's last remark that we need to make sure that we're making our decisions on reality. Um, and I think that's where um, many of us are struggling. Um, the questions of scale in the assessment um, are really ones that um, were problematic for us. Um, how you can, the assessments can generate um, such <clears throat> unreasonably n low numbers in light of where the current catches are uh, in terms of allowable yield. It, it's it's really um, I I just can't reconcile it. Um, 
similarly, uh, it's tough to um, explain why um, the status using these new assessment methods uh, is so different um, between one border and another. Um, many folks testified, uh, not as much this meeting, but I believe it was in June and September about the similarity of the quillback found um, <laughs> on the California side of the border and the Oregon side of the border. And that the fish um, are uh, targeted the same way, are encountered the same way, uh, exist in the same habitats, um, and it's it is difficult um, to explain away uh, such dramatically different results um, in two different areas that are um, right next to each other. I think we've we've had a lot of discussion about um, our concerns with the process. Um, I was encouraged in the discussion in the SSC um, when we got the SSC report under stock assessments, um, the exchange we had with John DeVore about the plans uh, for um, ensuring that there's um, more robust um, transparency um, with regard to establishing the boundaries um, that assessors um, decide when they embark on the modeling exercises and how they partition um, the available data between regions and on what bases. I was um, very encouraged with that discussion. Um, and yet at the end of the day, um, you know, we, I think we have a number of lessons learned um, and I certainly have a lot to say about uh, <laughs> in the next stock assessment cycle, um, what, you know, what advice I might have with regard to future data moderate assessments using length based method methods. But, um, you know, all that aside, those are lessons learned. And, you know, I think we're, we're still left with the task of focusing on here and now. Um, one thing that throughout the discussion on management measures as we've um, been building the alternatives um, that has been uh, very difficult for me to understand and get my head around is the, the tool that we have in the toolbox that we have always used in our specification to move fleets and effort around. We have managed by making adjustments to RCA lines. We have used that tool to move people off fish and into to, to move the effort into a place where we are going to avoid the stuff we're most concerned with. And that, that tool has been in application for 20, 20 years now. Um, so I am thinking that we are going to need to make some adjustments to our RCAs to minimize the effort in the near shore. Um, we don't want uh, the discard mortalities that we're seeing uh, in the CDFW report. Um, they're they're going to they're going to be too high. So what that means for me is that we need to. Um, be focused on what we can do now in the spec in the management measures action to move our fleets um, into areas where they're unlikely to encounter um, high volumes of the fish that are going to be so constraining. Um, recognizing that the you know the opportunities to target them you know are going to largely need to go away, but. My biggest worry and always has been, these are nearshore fisheries. We have lots of people utilizing the nearshore for lots of different fisheries. And we're, we're going to need to do our best to um, acknowledge that. I mean, most of our recreational fleets um, tend to fish near to shore. How do we continue to provide them some meaningful opportunity um, and yet um, 
reduce the F, the impacts of, of effort and do our best to minimize the bycatch um, and discard that, you know, is going to amount to, to quite a lot. And from all looks at it, um, probably more than we can withstand. So um, I am hoping that we can take a look at how we might use our RCA line management tool that's in our toolbox that has been a fundamental element of our uh, management measures um, for many, many <laughs> cycles um, and how we wisely um, adjust um, measures to minimize effort on these um, sensitive stocks. So um, when I think about examples of where we've done this, um, and, and folks talk about innovation and how we can think about how to minimize impacts on communities and fleets. I, I think about the action we took in the last um, biennial specs to minimize impacts on sensitive bottom habitat and coral, and yet um, provide a little relief um, and access into a little deeper water um, by establishing, um, I'm not going to say a second RCA, but um, an RCA of a different flavor <laughs> um, that uh, was different for um, non-bottom contact gear hook and line activity. Um, so that's just one example of the type of um, innovative thinking that um, our council, uh, with the support of NIMS, has used in the past to, um, to help us um, access a little more um, of our healthy stocks while still um, being protective of overfished yellow eye. Um, but I am hoping that we spend um, quite a bit of time um, over the next uh, few months here thinking about how we, how we design our management um, noting that yellow eye is still overfished, but I think we're we're going to need to look a little bit at, at how we loosen um, the belt a little. Um, we have done very well on our yellow eye catch accounting. Um, we've ensured that we've been way within um, our established uh, specs and management measures on yellow eye, but um, there are a few new unfortunately, um, overfished kids on the block, and um, they're going to need a lot of attention in this process. And um, I realize this might mean that we need to talk about adjusting our priorities um, and that we're, when we get into agenda planning, I mean, NIMS workload, council staff workload, state staff workload, is, you know, it's going to be a struggle. But I, in all of my years involved in council activities, I always recall that when you have an overfish stock, that's the trump card. That is the thing that you must do. And it's not discretionary. Um, it's painful, but it's our obligation. And um, gosh, I just, um, hope that we will be able to commit um, the energy and resources to looking for creative solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcy. Further discussion on this agenda item. I'm not seeing any hands. It, it's a few minutes to five. Uh, we can press on or we can pick up motions tomorrow uh, after appointments. And I'm not seeing any hands. Mercy. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I, support pausing here and allowing us to make some um, 
to have some discussions over the evening that I think will lead us to um, better motions tomorrow, um, along with supporting rationale. So uh, if if uh, it would be okay, I would support um, holding motions um, until tomorrow. Thank you. All right, thank you, Marcy. Let me see if there's any a contrary view to be expressed. And I'm not seeing any hands. So uh, we will pick up motions uh, tomorrow. Hopefully um, it'll go smoothly, it being day last. Um, but, but we'll do that after appointments. We'll start uh, a regular agenda tomorrow with uh, what's on our agenda for our first thing tomorrow. So with that, I will turn to uh, one or both of our executive directors for any announcements. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, well, I think you covered it. Um, if, if we're going to take up um, the management measures agenda item, we should do it after the appointments. There's a lot of people that are been counting on the timing of that. Um, so, and uh, we should do that. And then we'd want to um, have our discussion on management measures prior to our workload planning, because I'm sure there'll be some implications um, of, uh, of the management measures on our discussions under workload planning. Um, so I think that's all I've got. Looks like that's, that's the message from the ED table here. All right, well, very good. Well, thank you everyone for um, your hard work today on some really difficult things. Um, but it is Sunday, so we're gonna, <clears throat> we're gonna stop early here at 4.57 and um, we'll see everyone back here tomorrow uh, at eight o'clock for uh, the last day of our November meeting, the last day of our meetings of 2021, I hope.